Good evening. The ninth meeting of the 25th Council will come to order. All councilors are present this evening. We'll start with a moment of silence and the Pledge of Allegiance uh, by Councilor Grout and in Spanish by Councilor Pena. Thank you, Councillors Grout and Pena. We'll move on to proclamations and presentations, starting with Councillor Grout. Thank you, President Benton. Um, I'd like to, uh, I have a proclamation recognizing Older Americans Month. Director Anna Sanchez is here this evening with other guests to accept the proclamation. Okay. Whereas older Americans are vital to our community, contributing their strength, wisdom, and life experience, and whereas in 1963, President John F. Kennedy designated May as Older Americans Month, a time for the entire nation to celebrate older Americans in their communities, and whereas communities benefit when people of all ages, abilities, and backgrounds are welcomed, included, included and supported. And whereas the City of Albuquerque's Department of Senior Affairs provides services to help Albuquerque elders thrive and live independently for as long as possible, and creates avenues for older generations to share their values and wisdom with our youngsters. And whereas during the pandemic, the department's nutrition program was a lifeline for our community seniors, doubling the number of meals they normally serve each day and providing more than 920,000 meals during the peak months of the pandemic. And whereas two of the many community events planned for this month will be the Ageless Artisan Craft Fair at the North Domingo Baca Multi-Generational Center on May 21st, which will be an opportunity for older adult artists to show showcase their work, and the National Senior Health and Fitness Day on May 25th which encourages staying healthy and active as, long, as a way of living for Albuquerque's older adults. Therefore, the council, the governing body of the city of Albuquerque, hereby pro proclaims May 2022 to be Older Americans Month. We urge every resident to recognize the contributions of our older citizens, help to create an inclusive community and join efforts to support older Americans and healthy aging. Well, thank you, Councillor Crow. You give a quick round of applause. So I know I just saw you all last week, but again, my name is Anna Sanchez, and I have the pleasure and honor of being the director for the department. I am joined by some special guests. I'd like to introduce Angel Montoya. She is our manager for our multi-gen at North Domingo Baca. Chris Sanchez is our deputy. Joel Mahoney, Mahoney hiding in the back there is our sports and fitness program manager. And then we are joined by a couple special guests here that I just want to point out. Ginger and Gay, um, they are actually leading one of the first events for this month, which is our Senior I Know, a senior I know essay contest that happens on Wednesday. It's the 40th year that these two, plus some wonderful dedicated volunteers, hold this event. So we just wanted to be able to honor them and thank them for their service for doing that for us. We really appreciate it and for joining us today. Nikki Pion is one of our associate directors, and then we're also joined by our uh, chair of our council, Evan Thompson, so thank you so much for being here, because this is an important month, and we have a couple of items that we just also wanted to give you. So, we're gonna pass these out. These are for the other events that we mentioned. We have an artisan craft fair, as well as our senior fitness day, so we would give you a little bit of a 
one click if you do the honors of this. So we're giving you the flyers. We'll certainly send you the information and personal invitations to attend these events. These are from new initiatives besides our longstanding traditions of the Senior I Know Essay Contest. So one of the items that you're receiving is this beautifully crafted tinned dragonfly. And it was made by a senior at Los Bocanas Senior Center. Um, she is watching tonight, so I just want to let her know how much we appreciate that she donated these to give you this little gift. It is certainly a, a work of art in our mind and will also be an example of what we're trying to uh, showcase at this artisan fair at the end of the month at North Domingo Baca. So we hope you will join us. Um, she wanted to make sure that you knew that she does this because it's a hobby and a love, but she also donates a portion of the proceeds to charity. It's very important for her to do that because she lost a loved one. And this is also um, American uh, uh, Brain Tumor Association Awareness Month, so she wanted us to mention that it's really important to her that you guys receive this and hopefully will join us on that Saturday, the 21st. So thank you so much for this honor, and thanks to the staff for putting this all together. We appreciate it, Councilor Grout, for the honor. Thank you. Thank you, Director Sanchez. All right, next is uh, Councilor Bassan. Mr. President, <clears throat> I would like to present uh, this proclamation recognizing National Foster Appreciation Month. We have with us Ann McKinney and Marilyn Beck, with New Mexico Child First Network, here to accept this evening's proclamation. If you want to come down. Thank you for being here. Whereas safe, healthy children are the key to a safe, healthy future for our community, and whereas every child deserves to grow up in a supportive, loving home where they can grow and thrive, and whereas, where, and whereas during those unfortunate times when children cannot safely remain in their homes, the individuals and families who open their hearts and homes to foster children provide a vital service to our community. And whereas foster parents provide the love, safety, and stability that children need to, to help overcome past traumatic experiences in order to reach their full potential. And whereas there are numerous individuals, nonprofit organizations, and public servants who are dedicated to raising awareness about the needs of their children in foster care. And whereas the city of Albuquerque supports partnerships with families, child welfare staff, and public and private agencies that work to ensure that children are supported and successful. Therefore, the council, the governing body of the city of Albuquerque, hereby, hereby joins the nation in recognizing May as National Foster Family Appreciation Month and declares May 22nd Foster Family Appreciation Day in honor of the foster parents who advocate for the children in their care, helping to ensure their brightest possible futures. Thank you for being here and for all that you do for the foster community. And if you want to say a few words, that would be fabulous. Thank you, Councillor Bassan and, and Councillor Grout, who all sponsored this. On May 22nd, Sunday, from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. at Mariposa Basin Park, which I believe is in Councillor Lewis's district, um, we will be having our second annual foster family kinship guardian and just celebration event for foster families, adoptive families, kin, and guardian. We had this in 2019 at North Domingo Baca Park, and then COVID hit. In 2019, we had about 1,000 families and 1,000 attendees. Um, we're hoping for as many this year, and we're so grateful for the city of Albuquerque for lending us your park and your services. Um, currently, there are approximately 2,000 children and youth in foster care in New Mexico, and approximately half of those children are here in Bernalillo County in the Albuquerque area. Um, I wish I could tell you great news about how amazing it is, but really the work we're doing and, and taking a moment to celebrate the good families, kin and guardians who are working to, to really stand in the gap for these children and families in crisis is important. So we thank you for that. Um, we thank you for recognizing May as Foster Family Appreciation and Awareness Month. Um, and then I would just be remiss to say tomorrow is National Foster Care Day. Um, and I encourage all of you to wear blue and take a picture and just really support these children and families in crisis as they get to their next destination. So, thank you. Thank you. All right. Next, we have a presentation regarding safe outdoor spaces. Family Community Services Director Carol Pierce is presenting along with Ms. Montoya, the Director uh, of Safe Outdoor Spaces from Colorado Village Collaborative. Hello, Council President and Councilors. Thank you for having us. 
And I'm Elizabeth Olguin, the Deputy Director of Coma Solutions. Um, we have, I want to start by thanking all of you for spending your time with us today and hearing from our guests further in depth and having a really great, rich conversation surrounding this topic. Um, today you are going to hear from, from two guests because as a city we know that we are not going to be operating safe outdoor spaces. We always will be relying on our community partners and learning from experts. We have Quika Montoya from the um, Denver Village Collaborative today um, who has been directing safe outdoor spaces. And then we also have Jody Jepson from Heading Home Street Connect who many of you know here. So I will, um, if we could just move to the um, second slide with objectives, I'll just walk us through that really quickly before they start. <laughs> So for today, we're going to be discussing um, common guidelines and regulations surrounding safe outdoor spaces. Um, you'll get to see a lot of pictures of what they look like. I think everyone's curious about that. Um, we're going to help you to understand the guest selection process. This is not a walk-up model where anybody can come. And that's all. Those are the main topics. All right, thank you. I'll hand it over to Quika for the first part, and then Jody will finish the presentation for us. Yes, if we can go to the next slide, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Quika Montoya, and I am the Safe Outdoor Space Program Director for Colorado Village Collaborative. Thank you, counselors, for letting me present this to you today and to be able to share a model that has been working for uh, Safe Outdoor Spaces in Denver, Colorado. So Safe Outdoor Spaces was uh, kind of born from the pandemic, uh, knowing that we needed to help uh, extend equitable access to COVID-19 resources, care uh, during a global health pandemic. Since we've opened our first Safe Outdoor Space, we have expanded the model and our uh, currently oper operating under uh, not only just the response of the COVID-19 pandemic, but the subsequent economic recovery from the co uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So the purposes that we established early on for safe outdoor spaces is one, to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 among our unhoused neighbors, uh, two, to extend equitable access to resources such as healthcare, uh, ongoing case management, and um, be able to have those basic services and resources to take care of yourself during a global health crisis. And also to relocate people that are camping in public space into um, a safe managed uh, location. Next slide, please. So a lot of the resources that we have in, in a safe outdoor space is we want to extend uh, sanitation resources. So we have bathrooms, hand washing sinks. We also provide access to showers and laundry. We do food provision and uh, provide a direct tap into Denver water. Our, our larger tents also serve as uh, like meal delivery and service delivery, but they also double as warming and cooling shelters depending on the season. We also provide electricity to every resident and internet. Uh, some of the services that we have inside the space are uh, one around the COVID-19 mitigation efforts. So we provide daily wellness screening, which includes temperature screenings. Uh, we have vaccination access, testing access. We also have uh, hotel referrals for folks that um, either test positive for COVID-19 or found to be uh, eligible for protective action hotel rooms. We also bring in as many outreach services as possible and uh, help folks along their housing navigation journey out of homelessness, uh, potential employment referrals and or benefit navigation such as SNAP benefits and social security. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> these, these safe outdoor spaces are set up with what's under what's called a temporary unlisted use permit. So uh, our zoning administrator in the city of Denver has the authority to uh, uh, approve a permit that doesn't require rezoning changes. 
It doesn't require a chase of change of use for uh, specific pieces of property. And Denver City Council doesn't have to approve each safe outdoor space. So there's a mechanism set up for a permitting process uh, through community planning and development. Next slide. So here is one of our first safe outdoor spaces that we opened up in December of 2020. As you can see, you can barely tell what it is on the outside. We have a six foot tall fence. Usually there's privacy screening. Uh, you can see in the front here, those large white tents are where meals and services are delivered. Next slide, please. Here are a couple of the first safe outdoor spaces from the inside. So we utilize uh, ice fishing tents. So when we first established this concept, it was in the middle of the summer, we had designed it with just kind of your basic Coleman camping tent. Uh, I would love to say we opened it right away as soon as we uh, proposed this project, but that did not happen. <laughs> it took about six months of long hard work to um, really find a path forward to establishing one of these safe outdoor spaces. So we found ourselves in the middle of winter, as you see on the Picture on the left, there's snow on the ground. That was before people even moved in. So we knew we needed something to help with the elements of the Colorado winter. Uh, so we utilized uh, ice fishing shelters. And on the right, you can see there's a different brand and color of tents. So our first two safe outdoor spaces were open in December of 2020. We have expanded to three safe outdoor spaces and are working on opening a fourth. Next slide, please. Here's just another picture. Inside the tent, we provide a cot, sleeping bag, trash cans, hygiene products, storage space. And um, as you can see, there's nothing outside of each of these tents. Uh, we Part of our use agreement for the space is that folks only have what fits inside their tent. Next slide, please. Ah, yes. So uh, during our designing of this uh, program, we obviously leaned on our predecessors. And you guys have a very powerful predecessor here in New Mexico, Camp Hope in Las Cruces, New Mexico, which is what we, uh, one of the models that we based our model off of. And we also based it off of a, a couple of different places like Seattle, San Francisco, and Tampa Bay. So as you can see, they have uh, uh, little three-sided shelters that go, the tents go inside of those uh, shelters. Next slide, please. So uh, part of the design of a safe outdoor space is that we're not a walk-up shelter. So we really rely on the partners already doing the boots on the ground work. Uh, basically the folks like uh, you are gonna hear from ABQ Street Connect, uh, they're doing the boots on the ground outreach work. So they're similar to what we use here in Denver called Denver Street Outreach Collaborative. And so we really rely on those relationships that people have started to build with folks. Um, the screening process is, is really, uh, we try to keep it as low barrier as possible, but we are looking for people that are looking for something different, that are kind of tired of the grind of of can't move, can't move, you know, and not having access to sanitation or trash or any of those uh, necessary services. So we're looking for people that are currently working with an outreach worker. Uh, we're also looking for people that don't mind signing up for a few different community guidelines. Um, and then we, what we do is once we find that that person is, is an appropriate referral, then uh, street outreach will coordinate uh, transportation to the safe outdoor space and we'll then pr proceed with the intake process and the use agreement. Next slide, please. So some of our basic guidelines, um, I won't read this whole slide, but a lot of our basic tenants are, you know, no violence, no weapons, no drug trading or selling substances, no theft, no fires. We only allow the people that live there to come into the space and then we really uh, try to be a good neighbor by having quiet hours and that we don't want discriminatory or oppressive behavior. Um, and that you're willing to discuss housing plans or the next step in helping solve your housing crisis. And then there are a couple other things like 
if the public health orders were to change for any reason, that you would abide by public health orders, that um, uh, you keep your space clean, that if you were to test positive for COVID, that you would seek medical care, some things like that. So this is an agreement that everybody signs upon moving into a space. Next slide, please. So the, as I mentioned in the beginning, our, our sites are managed. They're, um, each person is required to do an intake upon entry, sign a use agreement, and we start the coordinated entry process by completing a, an assessment. But we have 24 seven onsite program staff. I really built um, this model off of utilizing the unique qualifications of people that have recovered from homelessness or have recovered from their own life challenges. So about 60% of our staff have shared experiences with the people that we serve. Uh, we provide a connection to case management. We also provide on-site medical, uh, mental health care, dental care, uh, the things that you need to uh, start to take care of yourself. Uh, we have quiet hours, you sign in a uh, use agreement. We also have an accountability process. So we also know that humans are humans uh, and sometimes moving from um, an encampment uh, out on the streets into a space that's managed, there might be an adjustment period. So we also have a, you know, a three-step accountability process to really aid folks in being su successful inside the space. And then we also have um, weekly trash removal. We also have one for every 10 residents, porta potties. We have, um, uh, you know, our staff cleans up. We have sanitation guidelines. We have site walks. And then we also have uh, uh, resident crews that help clean up around the neighborhood and the sites. Next slide, next slide please. <clears throat> so some of the services that we provide really are, we provide meals for folks. So we have um, a combination of food provision with an organization that does job training skills for uh, people that wanna enter into the culinary arts or are starting to uh, explore a job uh, training in food service. So we have meals prepared by that organization and we also have volunteer food prep uh, by different faith communities and individual people that just like to make meals. Um, you know, I kind of already went into most of the support, but we have, uh, you know, a really a meet people where they're at uh, program. Um, so it was really designed based on kind of my own experience. Uh, so prior uh, to entering into this work, I also experienced some of my own life challenges. Um, my family broke up. I lost my career in real estate. Um, my home went into foreclosure and um, I wound up through a series of unfortunate events on the streets. So I really utilized my own experience to um, bring in as much service provision as possible. So it took three organizations in Denver to help get me back on my feet. And so I bring in about uh, eight different organizations into the space. There's Colorado Coalition for the Homeless, St. Francis Center. We even have Denver Public Library bringing in technology support. We have employment partners that come in and bring employment navigation, case managers, doctors, nurses, uh, phys uh, physical therapists even come into the space, uh, really just trying to help folks uh, achieve the life that they want. Next slide, please. Okay, and then I think uh, this is where I get to hand it off to uh, the amazing Jody Jepson <laughs> about uh, her wonderful work. Thank you, Kika. And thank you, City Council, for allowing me the opportunity and family and community services just to share some of our, our local work here in Albuquerque. It really is a blessing. Um, so I am the director of uh, ABQ Street Connect, a program under Heading Home. Um, and we serve individuals, um, about 130, 160 folks this year um, with um, who are experiencing homelessness with, um, you know, acute medical and behavioral health needs. Um, also, 
with, with addictions. The majority of our resource, or excuse me, our referrals come from the Albuquerque Police Department. Um, it really is an amazing um, opportunity uh, to partner with our first responders. Um, the folks that we specifically get referred and serve are individuals that create high calls uh, for service in ge that generate high calls uh, for service who um, are experiencing uh, you know, a behavioral health issue, medical needs, um, and addiction. So once we get that referral, we respond immediately um, to that specific lo location. And one of the really great things that we can do now or that we've been able to have the flexibility around is to really support that individual immediately um, from that location to a motel room or to the Albuquerque op Opportunity Center or different types of resources that we've identified. What's great about the uh, community or excuse me, the um, the uh, safety component of the encampment is that we are really integrating them into the community with where they are familiar with um, in regards to um, the social aspect of it. And another really great great thing is that we, we really want to be able to walk with folks where they're at. And this is a critical piece and what, what we're seeing in the community is that we have a lot of um, uh, expectations of folks to go to the organizations to complete an intake or to do the paperwork. And unfortunately, um, what you'll see here in a bit is a, a study that was done specifically at uh, Coronado Park, where um, unfortunately, a lot of the folks are losing their, their housing vouchers and it's being reported that they can't be found. And so that's another, I think, critical piece of creating an in in a environment where the resources can really go to folks and, and start to engage them and, and meet their uh, needs. The reason why I felt that the collective impact model, that this framework it is really important is because it's a, it's a combination of organizations, um, from the businesses to government, that, that, that we all share a vision and, and we know that homelessness has been an issue. And um, I've been in the field for eight, 18 years here in Albuquerque and um, definitely over time have learned so much about the barriers that our folks experience day in and day out. And I think once we can align with, with, a, with a vision and we can commit to that, to really strategizing on creating a temporary environment where we can have resources go to the people, walk with the people and help support them in their pathways. That's really the, the answer um, and solution to this crisis. Um, I'm not gonna go read, re read the whole thing, but um, I really believe in this model and this type of, frame, of framework as a community, you know, we tend to work in silos. And I think if we have a mutually, excuse me, a, a mutual vision and a commitment, then we can solve this. I can just go to the next slide. It might be about the report. So we partnered with Family and Community Services in ACS, and we did a study at Corner or in analysis at Coronado Park, and we interviewed 71 folks over two days, um, as you can see the age range there. Um, we are seeing a bit of a trend in, in or excuse me, in 65 in older folks. Um, and with that, we're seeing in, uh, just a large amount of folks with medical needs, really acute as well. So, and then we serve, or we, um, had surveyed eight, eight veterans. Um, and we just used a part of the ABQ Street Connect model. It's really important for us to, we, we tend to, about every three to six months, we'll do what's called a population assessment in a specific geographical location of the city is we just re really wanna know who's out there and what brings them there, right? And so that, um, that, survey 
really was able to identify some stuff for us. So next slide, and we'll just go into some data outcomes here. So um, if you look at the first one here, um, you know, the majority of the parks, uh, excuse me, the majority of the folks slept at Coronado Park on that specific night that, that we had asked WEC, the family and friends. Um, and then it was really important too, like, are, are the folks that are that are at the specific location, are they passing through? Are they locals? You know, are they, are, are they from here? And as you can see, the majority of folks have been here for 20 plus years or more, um, which, which says a lot, you know, it says that our community that, that, you know, these, these are folks that, that are, that are from here and um, just needing our support to help them navigate some pathways and get them off, off the street. The other thing is the health issues. This was pretty significant. For ABQ Street Connect, we serve 100% across with severe behavioral health needs, schizophrenia being the top one. Um, and then the physical health um, is we're, we're definitely seeing a lot of the physical health um, when, when they're not accessing me medical care, um, then obviously we're, we're gonna see a decrease in their overall health, um, which we have folks that have cancer um, from hepatitis C to diabetes, um, heart issues. Um, we, we were, we're serving a lot of folks with a lot of different types of health issues. So again, when you're able to integrate a safe environment where we can get the medical and the behavioral health and the navigation on site and meet them where they're at, we've seen a significant um, increase in housing placements based on the individual needs. Also, we have seen a, a decrease in the utilizations within the first responders and at the hospital. So that's a pretty, pretty significant impact um, with the folks that we're serving. And I think that might be the last uh, data set. One of the things I don't know is if it's on here that I think is important to share is, okay, um, <laughs> we'll just go here. So. A lot of the traditional outreach models, methods, um, you know, there's people out in our community doing amazing work ev ev every day out in the field, um, which, which is great because we need to know where, where folks are at and, and what their needs are, but it's, it's not enough. And why, and why I say that is because we really need to be able to integrate a service delivery model that really can meet the needs of these folks and I, I feel like um, there's a, there, and I talked about this before, is there's subpopulations of individuals who are unhoused. And I think that um, by having a specific location, then we can really figure out what their individual needs are and create those, those support plans around what their needs are. Um, instead of kind of putting a Band-Aid around things or, um, or having expectations for them to come, for individuals to come into the heading home office for an example, is that we know that's not going to work for, for some of the folks that are in our community. Um, they're, they're too acute. They potentially could be in a psychosis. Um, you know, they're in it. In, in a wheelchair. I'm not sure how many of you folks have, or a uh, council or the public has seen individuals who are unhoused that are in wheelchairs in our community. Um, so we need to be going to individuals and really engaging and building these, these uh, different types of relationships and identifying what their, their needs are. Um, and then obviously, we know that, and this just goes for all, all, all of us is, you know, with, with just get, getting our basic needs met, you know, food, water, shelter, that we can get some rest and then we can really start to think a, li a little bit more clear or the teams can get in there to do assessments and triage to see, is it psych 
psychiatric uh, medications, medical? Is it just getting some more sleep and rest, right? Um, so that's how we developed the Street Connect model is really being really intensive and in, intentional and strategic about who we serve and how we serve folks. Um, and that really has shown a significant impact in our data in regards to the, the utilizations and the overall, the quality of health of folks um, pre, pre and post. Um, and then the, the other big component here is the low barrier. Um, there are a lot of compliance rules um, in regards to if folks don't show up to an, an intake appointment or to get a housing voucher, um, which th this might be surprising, but then that, that housing voucher then at that time is, is removed and they can't apply for housing again for another six, six, six months. So it's more of a punitive approach and um, we really take the framework and the look at how do we meet people where they're at and support them where they are at. Um, we need to go to them and do the intake. We need to go to them and support them in, in, in where they're at. Um, let me see. That might be the, be the last, last slide. One of the yeah. things I did want to share is we did find at the park that there were approximately 10 to 15 folks with housing, active housing vouchers. And um, when you go back and look up into HMIS, um, it shows that the individuals we weren't able, that they weren't able to locate them. And that, um, I, I really think that that's an area that as a community that we need to, to, to change because we know where, fo where folks are at. We, we just have to meet them where they're at. And, and again, instead of having an expectation of them coming to us. Um, again, I really, really appreciate the, the time. Um, I hope that was helpful just to kind of share some, some of our work. Thank you so much, Jody and Quika. Um, and we now stand for questions, counselors. Counselors, questions for the presenters? Uh, thank you so much. And thank you for the opportunity to speak with you earlier today and learn even more about this project. Uh, one of the things that I heard both in our presentation today and, and in this was the need for structure, right? This is not, as someone mentioned earlier today, it's not a free for all. Um, but these sites function, the Denver sites function most effectively, as we saw in the pictures, they're clean, they have, um, have rules and expectations. Could you tell us just a little bit more about how those rules are developed um, with the residents and with the operators and with the city um, and how Denver has adapted? I understand that they, you know, different sites may need a different set of rules depending on the services or the, the operator. How was that developed? Uh, yes, thank you for that question, Councillor. Uh, so, first and foremost, a lot of this uh, plan was really developed from our existing tiny home villages model. So, we have temporary tiny home villages in Denver already, and then when this proposal was put forward in the, uh, to the city um, during the pandemic, I actually did a, a bunch of outreach and took a bunch of surveys from folks of what is the kind of space that they would like to be at and what are the things that they would like to see or not see um, and, and really listen to uh, the, the folks that, are, that would be living in this space. So I, I took a really intentional approach into uh, kind of co-designing this with uh, the voices of the people that are living outside and on the streets. One of the biggest changes that I think that was very impactful early on was our original staffing model was program staff during the day and security at night. And one of the things that I overwhelmingly heard was uh, no badges. Uh, so our environment out on the streets in Denver is we have an urban camping van. So a lot of our people that are sleeping outside have a lot of interaction with the police department, have a lot of interaction with us, you know, other security personnel. And so what we did early on was shift that staffing model to be a program trained staff 
24 hours a day. So all of our staff are trauma-informed trained. They are, um, you know, crisis de-escalation trained, mental health first aid. And again, a lot of them bring their, their own unique qualifications into the space. So we have, um, uh, for the most part, uh, not limited uh, people's entry based on backgrounds and sex offenses, but we have altered that for, uh, so one of our locations that we moved to was co-located on the same campus as a preschool. Uh, so we heard, uh, you know, through our engage community engagement process that uh, there, there was, um, you know, to be co-located as the same campus as a free school, we took extra precautions. We also uh, did background checks and sex offender checks. Um, and then of course, you know, throughout that uh, data collection, we did find that people of color were overrepresented in the folks that were not allowed to enter into the safe outdoor space. I will also note that um, at, to date we have, um, with the folks that live in the space, we have yet to have a crime against a person or crimes against uh, property committed by a resident of our safe outdoor spaces. So what we have found is that the through the warm handoff, through street outreach, uh, the trust building between people that have shared experiences with them, we, uh, we get a community that is bought into this space and that they wanna see it succeed as much as we do. Councilor David. Did I answer your Did I answer your question, Councilor? I might have missed a part. Uh, yes, ma'am, you did, and thank you so much. I appreciate that. Other questions, Council Councilor Grout, and then Councilor Lewis. Thank you. Thank you, Council um, President. I have a couple of questions. How many shelters are in each safe outdoor space? Uh, so we usually average about 40 to 45 ice fishing shelters, which houses uh, 50 to 60 people, depending on how many shelters there are. So we're really primarily focused on uh, serving a lot of our gaps in our current sheltering system. So, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know what the population is in Albuquerque, but we have a high representation of Black, Indigenous, and Latinx people representing the unsheltered population in Denver. So uh, we really try to use an equity lens when in, uh, inviting folks in. And we also serve couples, which uh, they hardly ever get access to shelters due to having to either be split up because it's a genderized sheltering, uh, uh, congregate sheltering model. Uh, we also accept people with mobility challenges, people with uh, service animals or emotional support animals. So these are all really big gaps in our sheltering system. Um, and I, did I answer the question? I don't know. Thank you. I have a, okay. I have a couple more <laughs> I'm questions. sorry. Sometimes I just, sometimes <laughs> I just go in and then I don't even know if I answer the question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you said in an earlier presentation that when you go into a new neighborhood, you mm -hmm. um, get input from the community. Um, is that required by the city of Denver or is that just something that you do? So uh, under our mechanism of approval, which is uh, called the temporary unlisted use permit. Uh, so that is a permit that we apply, apply for through community planning and development. And that permitting process, we have to show uh, a robust community engagement plan. Uh, so what that community engagement plan looks like is we have a professional uh, community engagement firm uh, that helps us roll into a neighborhood. So what we do is we do door knocking in the immediate neighbors. So these are the neighbors that are either adjacent to or facing or behind the safe outdoor space. Then we also uh, uh, flyer up to four blocks around the potential safe outdoor space with a community information meeting flyer. So this is a Zoom meeting that we hold as a way for the community to learn more about a project that's coming into the neighborhood. And then we uh, you know, open it up for questions and answers. During this time, we try to dispel a lot of myths that come along with uh, serving the unhoused community. Um, a lot of the same myths exist in Denver that exist in Albuquerque. Um, and then we also offer uh, the, uh, the a tool we use is called a good neighbor agreement. So this is a, a 
a, agreement that we enter into with a registered neighborhood organization. It usually outlines some concessions if needed to the neighborhood. Um, uh, so like similar to the location that we had in Park Hill that was co-located on the children's campus, we included no sex offenders and no, and no violent offenders in that good neighbor agreement. But, but most importantly, what a good neighbor agreement uh, gives us is that guaranteed communication channel into the neighborhood. So by being a good neighbor, we want to be communicative. We want to be able to disseminate important information to neighbors about occupancy, um, any uh, potential unintended consequences, and to be able to problem solve in real time with the neighborhood that we exist in. And so that process, then we, uh, you know, it's a legal document entered into by uh, whichever parties. Um, you know, it's usually a Colorado Village Collaborative, a registered neighborhood organization. Most recently, we, um, we acquired land through one of our communi largest community health organizations called Denver Health. So they leased us uh, one of their uh, vacant parking lots. And so they are a party to one of our good neighbor agreements because they are the landlord. So that is a tool and kind of the process that we use to um, apply for the permit. Thank you. And one more question. Did you have to change the zoning codes in Denver to do this? No, so the temporary enlisted use permit was um, heard by our city council. Uh, it does not require rezoning of the land. It opens up all land in the city of Denver and um, it doesn't require any reclassifications. Okay, thank you. Councilor Sanchez and then Councilor Lewis. The only question I had is, um, have we done, Ms. Ogin, have we done surveys the way they did in, uh, in uh, Colorado? Well, Jody spoke about the survey done in Coronado Park. Are you speaking of neighborhood surveys or? Neighborhood surveys, also um, the surveys that were done in Coronado Park and maybe even up and down Central just throughout our community. Just about the community? Yeah. Throughout our community. In, in regards to the feelings on safe outdoor spaces? Yes. No, not, not I, as I yes. think you might, Elizabeth, I think you might be mentioning um, the surveys that I did in uh, encampments prior to opening the safe outdoor space and getting input about what people would like to see in a safe outdoor space. That's correct. And you're getting the surveys from the individuals themselves, right? Yes, from the people that would live in the space. So the, the Coronado Park one um, is our first. And I think we would um, do a more targeted survey specifically related to safe outdoor spaces and accommodations people would like to see, of course, before implementing one. Thank you. Councilor Lewis. Mr. President, just a few questions for our friends in Denver there. Um, are, are all, well, first of all, do you allow, are there children allowed, and partly because I just didn't catch all this, but is there, are there, do you allow children in some of your camp, in some of your spaces? Yeah, so no, we don't allow children. So uh, per our general liability insurance, we would not be able to be insured if we, if we house anybody under 18. Gotcha. Uh, we also have a pretty, pretty broad, uh, bank of resources for families experiencing homelessness. So we really try to get those folks into the, the dedicated uh, resource pipeline of family homelessness. And you do background checks for, you mentioned for the, the ones that are close to the, the preschool, do you do background checks for all of them? Check for sex offenders? And uh, so our first if outdoor space, we did not do background checks. Our second one, we did not this third, the third one that we opened and that was co-located, we did. We also tracked the data about uh, racial equity and the overrepresentation of people that were not being allowed in were uh, majority people of color. So we really felt it uh, pressing on our hearts to not further the discrimination of people. So we have not included that going forward. Um, but that is a concession that we use uh, per each particular neighborhood. So you, um, I, I, I heard you say that you know drugs aren't allowed in the 
in the spaces or or uh, or use of drugs in spaces. You allow people that are intoxicated in the camps in the in the spaces that are intoxicated or high or on drugs. Yeah, so, uh, you know, we really try to pride ourselves on, on being a low barrier shelter model. So we do have community guidelines that say no drug trading, no drug selling, no drug use. Um, but we also have a, an individualized model. So we don't enter into people's private spaces. So there does sometimes, um, uh, you know, there are intoxication uh, issues where we would in, initiate our accountability process. So what we're looking for really is a violation of our community agreements, like not specifically around, oh, you're drunk right now, but are you drunk and disrupting the environment? Are you not following community guidelines based on your intoxication? So uh, we, have, we use really like a harm reduction lens when it comes to substance use, just because we know that um, that is one of the biggest barriers on why people are not currently accessing shelter systems is because of sobriety requirements or maybe potentially being 86 from a shelter uh, because of it. So how we like to frame it as, uh, you know, we, we, we initiate the accountability process, we review the community guidelines, and we try to wrap them up with as many services as possible. So we also have peer support specialists uh, that, that work for our program and they utilize their unique recovery from substance use and or homelessness or mental health disorders. And uh, they provide one-on-one -on -one on site support and also connections to uh, clinical therapists and also certified addiction specialists. So while we do have community guidelines, uh, we also uh, use that kind of low barrier harm reduction approach when it comes to um, maintaining the community guidelines and the integrity of the space. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, thank you, Quika, uh, for the presentation. And Jody, uh, for those of you who haven't been around, we we started working with, with Jody and Albuquerque Street Connect um, quite a few years back, I think, during the Barry administration. And it was one team, and they now have three teams out in the street now, and also are operating uh, supportive housing as well. So great example. Very painstaking, painstaking work we have to emphasize. You know, folks who are the, the frequent flyers on the streets are, uh, are you know, hard to locate. And, and this is part of the, part of the, pro, uh, the program that we discussed with, with Quika and, uh, in Denver is that it's a little bit easier to uh, locate folks and, and deliver services to them in these sites. Thanks so much for the presentation. Do you want to wrap up anything, Elizabeth? Or? No. I, I would like, can, could I mention Wait, one please. more thing? Yes, quick. Yeah. Please. So, uh, you know, along with the, the kind of all meet people where they're at mentality, we are, you know, opening those discussions to helping folks resolve their housing crisis and try to hone in on, on the services that they need. So along with uh, just providing the dignity of a safe space and uh, you know having being able to use the restroom and take a shower and do your laundry, uh, we're also seeing folks start solving their housing crisis. So uh, last year we had 47 uh, longer term sheltering outcomes in, including permanent supportive housing Currently this year, first quarter or second quarter of 2022, we anticipate having at least 20 to 30 people housed. And we have currently about 65 people connected to permanent supportive housing vouchers. So not only does this space provide the dignity uh, that people need while sleeping outside, it also provides those lifelines back into the community so that people can achieve the life that they're uh, meant to live. And Director Pierce would like to wrap up. Thank you. Councillor Benton. Thank you, Director Pierce. <laughs> thank you, Councillor Benton, and thank you, Councillors, for all the time on this today. I just wanted to wrap up with a few key points. We're really grateful for Quika and Jody's time. I think some of the takeaways we really want to emphasize is this model is by referral. That's who would, from our outreach providers, that's who will go into our safe outdoor spaces. There are rules and there is structure. This is not permanent, it is temporary. It is another option given the lack of, of shelter space in our community. 
and this will allow people to get connected to the resource for housing. And thank you so much for the time and attention on this subject. Thank you. Thanks, Grega. Thanks, Jody. We'll move on now. Councilors, to um, next on our agenda is general public comments. Uh, member of, members of the public can provide live comment to the council meeting in person or virtually if they have signed up for public comment per the instructions published on the agenda and on our website. Friday, here are the public comment ground rules. Each participant has up to two minutes to present. Comments are to be addressed to the councilors only uh, and through the council pre president and any disruptive conduct, conduct will result in removal from the meeting. Um, and uh, again, for those uh, commenting in the chamber, two minute time limit, the light on the podium will be green for the first minute and a half. Then the light will turn yellow, indicating you have 30 seconds to wrap up your comments. At two minutes, the light will turn red and a bell will ring to indicate that your time is up. Mr. Moya, please call the name of our first speaker. Thank you, Mr. President. Our first speaker is Eli Sanchez, followed by Tom Simic. When you hear your name, uh, for, the, for the person who's on deck, you can come up and sit up front and be ready to speak. My comments have to do with uh, concerns in the lead and coal corridor as it relates to uh, crashes. 776 crashes were reported during the period 2014 to 2018. That's a four year period. Oh. I've lived um, at uh, Coal and Morningside. 26 years so you can imagine what that tally must be over a period of 26 years I witness a type of high impact crashes that occur in my neighborhood that you might expect to see on I-25 or I-40 those are Vehicles leaving the roadway and impacting homes, impacting them hard enough to knock front porches off their foundations. Numerous rollover crashes, some ending up in neighbor, neighborhood front yards. Vehicles hitting chain link fences and dragging them down Coal Avenue in sections as long as 25 feet. Vehicles flying through the uh, air across a sidewalk impact, impacting a block wall and coming to stop in a neighbor's backyard. I could go on and on. Over the past few years, there have been four separate foot. That's it. Councilor Benton, I'd just like to see if the traffic uh, lieutenant was still here um, to see if he can help uh, address Mr. Sanchez's problem over at the uh, lead and coal in the area in question. Councilor Sanchez, actually, um, I know APD was not prepared to come respond today, but DMD has uh, brought some information about our ongoing efforts there after these comments tonight. We've asked them to sort of have an opportunity to respond about the programs in place, including new APD enforcement that's been in effect. Okay, thank you. Our next speaker is Tom Simic, followed by Bob Anderson. I live at Cole and Carlisle and can, can attest to the 
safety issues regarding vehicles speeding, running the red light, and numerous accidents and loss of life. One that still remains in my mind and haunts me is when a guy on a motorcycle was hit and flew in the air and hit the light post and was killed. There is also destruction of property, landscape, street, and street lights costing the city money and replacement costs. Vehicles going south on Carlisle find it difficult to make a left-hand turn onto coal heading east because a left turn arrow was taken down during the lead coal project and never replaced afterward. As a result, drivers rush to make the turn and as the light changes and often as the light has changed, causing accidents. Sometimes a car is waiting to turn left, some, that is turning, has to wait three or four light changes before they can turn and cause, causing uh, accidents. Drivers sometimes get impatient and will move back into the right-hand lane of traffic heading south, making for a dan dangerous situation. The purpose of the Lead Coal Project was to make it safer and more pedestrian friendly with wider sidewalks. The opposite has happened. Parents, especially with children and strollers, are avoiding the area for fear of being hit due to increased traffic and vehicle noise and pollution. I can smell gasoline fumes in my house, even with the windows closed, and this certainly isn't healthy. Vehicles with modified mufflers and subwoofers blasting rattle my windows and eardrums. In addition, people seem to lack respect by throwing their trash out the window and littering the street. I shouldn't have to pick up after them. This certainly doesn't make it a neighborhood that you want to be in, especially for tourists. It doesn't promote tourism. That's the end of my... Bob Anderson, followed by Sandra Almer. Evening, evening, counselors. Um, I'm a part of the ad hoc group called Lead and Coal Safety Brigade, and I just want to pick up a little bit from, I changed my remarks around from, uh, pick up where Mr. Sanchez could not finish. Within little, probably about the past year, we've had four people killed right within our area of the Lead and Coal uh, Knob Hill and uh, University Heights section, and we're all quite concerned about it. It's getting much, much worse. I've lived on the corner where I'm at for almost 20 years now. I've almost been hit in my own yard just doing yard work from uh, car crashes. We have a structural problem. All over the city we have speeding, reckless driving. We know that. That's just a given. But in this particular area, we have a structural design thousands of houses and apartments close by on these two streets and they're crossed by north-south streets which are not designed due to lack of line of sight um, visibility in so many places uh, and there's alleys between each of the streets and each of these places are causing crashes where uh, people are speeding up letting coal and then cars are running the stop signs or coming through the alleys onto what looks like small visibility roads from ahead of them and we're having a tremendous amount of number of crashes and Joe's going to show you some of the pictures from that. It's just, it's astounding to us. Pedestrian wise, uh, we've had a, cur a car jump the curb, kill an 83 year old man. People walk in the streets because the sidewalks are not passable and people are afraid to walk up and down the streets and let in coal. Uh, the north-south streets, I just want to emphasize that, are part of the problem to this thing which have not been addressed. Thank you. Sandra Amiller, followed by Joseph Aguirre. Yes, my name is Sandra Amiller. I own a property at the northwest corner of Solano and Lead. And at the end of January, at 11 o'clock in the morning, two cars collided, one going north on Solano and of course one going west on lead. And they repelled, that crash was so devastating, they repelled up in the air, they picked up a decorative light fixture on the corner and they proceeded to put that light fixture into my home and they landed on my porch, removing and destroying the entire railing and also making structural damage to the house. So. It is a problem. You would suppose I'm pretty angry, and I am pretty angry about that. 
because we've been fighting this for so many years, I can't tell you. And now it's gotten to the point where it's just not anger. I feel great sorrow that the city has so little attention to the residents, to their property values, to the residents' health. I go out now into the yard, and I'm constantly looking over my shoulder if I'm, if I'm wondering, am I going to get killed today? So this is a problem that needs to be addressed. There's pedestrians there occasionally. There used to be a lot more, but because the serious type of crashes that have been occurring, people don't go on letting coal anymore. And as one of our participants mentioned earlier, that was the whole reason for the lead and coal redesign years ago. All of that traffic that was taken off Central has now been put onto lead and coal. And we are a residential street. I hear about these uh, cameras that you're going to have on Montgomery and Gibson because there's problems with speeders. But forget that. Those are not properties. They're not owned by properties. These are commercial aspects, and they are not killing people. Thank you. Joseph Aguida, followed by Don Schrader. These conditions on lead and coal from Washington to Yale, block after block of crashes, death and destruction next to homes. This is not just speeding. It's not just another Gibson. This is the terrifying cost when the city uses narrow residential side streets as if they were Gibsons. 60 feet of right of way, 10,000 vehicles each day, each street, homes just 15 feet from the curb, constant danger. This isn't new. Two decades ago, residents asked the city to stop the crashes into our homes. We asked for streets safe for all users. That's why the lead and coal project happened, citizen action. And yet 10 years after the end of lead coal uh, construction, here we are. In four years of this administration, hundreds more crashes, more fatalities, a seven-year-old pedestrian, an 83-year-old pedestrian, two ejection fatalities in front of living room windows. It never stops. We should all be concerned by the city's decades-long failure to make lead coal safe, by its failure to protect its citizens, and by its seeming failure of conscience. Why the indifference to the death and destruction outside our home, our home? Albuquerque is a caring city, but it seems to have lost its way on lead and coal. What do we need from council? We need you to care. We need you involved. And we need you to stay involved until cars stop crashing into our homes. We need you to ask questions and demand deep answers. Why did the lead and coal project fail in our neighborhood? Why did administrations shut down the road safety audit in 2019? We need you to hold DMD and administration accountable. Schedule a public hearing about lead coal. Take the position that these conditions are unacceptable. Ask for a serious plan of actions. Whatever it takes, keep the cars on the road. Make sure that the city's vision for lead coal is zero crashes into our homes. We've had enough. Don Schrader, followed by Karen Navarro. Well, young people 50 years from now curse us for being too lazy too blind, too selfish, too spoiled, too stubborn, if, if we refuse to make huge changes in how we live to slow the climate crisis. The American dream of big house full of expensive stuff no one needs, fancy cars driving and flying thousands of miles to vacation, and eating meat and dairy is a nightmare disaster for all life on Earth. I have ridden in no car for 21 years. I've owned no car for 42 years. I ride city buses, but I mostly walk. My home is one sunny room, nine and a half by 12 feet, with six windows, in the house of a friend. I enjoy, I enjoy living simply below the U.S. poverty level. I have no right 
to much more than I need, while many millions worldwide suffer hunger and sickness with no home on far less than they need. I am deeply indebted to many people who have taught me, who have loved me, who have inspired me. I collect wisdom to live it and to share it with anyone interested. Karen Navarro, followed by Trevor Selby. Um, good evening, counselors. I um, am actually addressing the um, IDO um, proposed changes, zoning changes. Um, I believe what the city of Albuquerque is lacking is a better continuum of options for our homeless residents. The status quo is not working. People with no access to sanitation facilities Outreach teams trying to build relationships with people whom they can't find day after day. And there are valid reasons people won't access shelters. We have shelters. We have programs offered by agencies. We have permanent housing. Here's what we don't have. First, we don't have motels converted to transitional living sites for homeless individuals. Motel rooms have been provided for many families since COVID began. But we need to put that program on steroids and provide this for a lot more adults and more families. Zoning Amendment A2 addresses this need. Second, we don't allow for set-aside spaces for a homeless person or couple to place a tent or park their vehicle with access to toilets and hand-washing stations. This could have less structure than a safe outdoor space. So please pass the Living Lots Amendment B2. And third, we do need safe outdoor spaces, but what I don't agree with is imposing unnecessary requirements that would prevent a church from being able to set up a safe outdoor space. Specifically, I think it's a mistake to require safe outdoor spaces to have 24-7 on-site supportive services, the cost of which would be prohibitive or could be. Services can be provided from off-site by collaborative teams from existing medical clinics and other providers with wraparound social services brought to the site. As Jody mentioned, um, we should bring the, the services to the people instead of requiring that they go seek them. I think the city council isn't aware of the collaborations that already exist that could provide mobile services from offsite at far less cost. Thank you. Trevor Selby, followed by Jeffrey Parks. Good evening, Councillor Benton and members of this council. My name is Trevor Selby. My pronouns right now are they and them. I'm a, district of res uh, uh, I'm a resident of District 7. My comment is on the general budget resolution, in particular, the free bus fare program. I encourage our city to continue funding free buses for all. Marginalized communities, our city and our planet all benefit from accessible public transit. The planet and city reap the benefits of reduced air pollution, vehicular traffic, and wear on our roads. Additionally, accessible transportation improves economic output and reduces the instances and impacts of poverty. Most importantly, continuing this program will improve the lives of people in marginalized communities. Marginalized identities are overly represented in the public transit dependent community, particular people of color and low income wage workers. Not only do bus fares charge our most poor and vulnerable they are projected to extract $1.6 million in three years' time from nonprofit and other organizations that serve our most vulnerable populations. One such organization is New Day. New Day serves queer youth who are, at fa who are facing or at risk of facing homelessness. New Day has supported myself, my partner, my friends, and my community through their transitional living program, life skills classes, drop-in center, mental services, and other efforts. These life-saving projects should not be disinvested from to afford bus fares. The New Day community is so vulnerable that two youth support recipients have lost their lives in the first half of this year. The New Day community is not the only at-risk community who benefit from the free fares program. I ask that you support the free fares program for the benefit of our most vulnerable communities, our city, and our legacy. Thank you. Jeffrey Parks, followed by Tad Naminsky.
My name's Jeff. My name's Jeffrey Parks. Uh, I'm an irrigation specialist, and I uh, I help me and this other woman are the ones that built this garden. And then this is the way I found this garden in 2006 when I was here. It looked like this. I came back in 2018. It looked like this, and two people, the community stepped in, and turned it into this in two years. Uh, and then the city saw it, they offered us, they offered the garden $100,000 to, to improve it. Uh, so for some reason, I don't know how, but this organization, SWAC, is what manages this garden. It's supposed to be a community garden. They say it's not that kind of community garden, it's not a consensus. So we did all this work. I put thousands of dollars of my own money into it. I, I was there every day for two and a half years. After the city offered us 100,000, uh, they, they were negotiating with SWAP for four months. At the end of four months, we heard SWAP doesn't want the money. I've never heard of anything like this. And once they did that, they banned all the people in the community from the garden and they, they wiped out the whole irrigation system, bulldozed all the, we had a, a uh, soil health project. We spent thousands of dollars, thousands of time, and then they bulldozed all the topsoil off of it. I think we need some kind of review process for the management of these community gardens. It's ridiculous that, I mean, no one in the city has any authority over these people. I can't find anybody. Uh, just a second, Councillor David. Uh, Mr. Rayal, I know we weren't prepared for this this evening, but uh, this is a project. I know this this land was originally provided on a lease to the organization um, because it was a, an airport required property, and then the the changes to that north south runway when we decommissioned it uh, allowed us to have some other uses. I wonder if you could have somebody in your uh, your shop give us an update on the status of that lease, or whether that's still airport lease, or what the status of this property is in the current deal with this project. Mr. President and, and Councillor Davis, um, ironically, we just talked about this this morning. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, Simon, uh, Dave Simon with Parks and Rec is recommending a restructuring of this particular project for the very issues that this gentleman raised today. And so we will uh, certainly put him in contact with the Parks uh, Department to ensure that we move forward in a, in a more positive and, and supportive manner than we've had in the past. Mr. Parks, uh, I know you've been in contact with my office about this for a while. We've been going back three, and forth three years. trying to figure out how to, what the, the terms of that are. So Mr. Real, if you would, just include us in that conversation, please, so we can get the right community and If you input. can include when you have discussions with community gardens, it would be really helpful if you included the community in the discussion. It, it sounds like we need to have one of those meetings down at Michael Thomas Coffee with everybody and figure this out. So thank you, sir. Tad Naminsky, followed by Z. <coughs> Thank you. My name is Ted Nemeiski. Well, what is the idiot or stupid people or board working in government, representing us? I'm talking about trying to impeach private president. Who is private person? Thanks to Republican Senate. Stick with 25th Amendment, United States Constitution. That's how liberal Democrats, leftists care about Constitution. Now, Nancy Pelosi visiting Ukraine. Well, Ukraine is neighboring with Poland. Oh, Yet now, so that was Saturday, she was visiting Ukraine. Now, he's yesterday or today visiting Poland, president. Poland bordering with Ukra Ukraine and Belarus. Belarus has five meter tall wall built by Poland, 
blocks, five meters tall. Ukraine has open border, welcomed over three million immigrants right now. <sighs> Why Biden wasn't visiting? Because his son has businesses done with Ukraine, and his businesses pay Biden personal bis uh, bills. That's answer your question why he's not there. I have a lot more to say about it, but next time. Z followed by Jean Pauls. Hello. I'm a homeless person in Albuquerque. I've been on the streets for four years and I love it, except for this. It's hard for me to be in here, but I represent 1,500 homeless people. I am a homeless advocate. I was invited because I read the newspaper about these encampments. On Wednesday, I met with Carol Pierce. And she's been listening to me for two and a half years when I started opposing the Gateway Shelter for personal reasons. I have access to the West Side Shelter, Camp Hope, Garrett House, you name it. Name it. I've been there. All of them. All of them, they don't serve me. So as a result of that, I wrote a proposal to service on one sheet of paper all the categories of homelessness and their individual needs and how to service them. I've shared this with Carol. As a result of that, we have one page, seven pages that we've written that you can read about the work we've been doing since I got to this city. April 19th. We call it Plan Z because now I found out that there's a Department of Equity and Inclusion. I want to access them. We need help today, not 30 women or 50 women in December. We need you to listen now. The problem is your terminology is different from my comprehension. That's our message. I have worked to oppose the Gateway Shelter. I am very insulted by 75% of what I saw for your FEMA camps. That's the only way I can describe it in my world. I have been nothing but a contributing citizen to this city since I was born. Thank you. Thank you. Jean Pauls, followed by Miguel Titman. I'm sorry, questions? Yeah, I had a question. So if you could just finish your comments, and then I just wanted to just ask a general question in terms of people um, who are um, suffering from homelessness. Um, do you, uh, what do you think the number one issue out there is? Perception. Perception. Let me introduce myself without my street name. My name is Annabelle Marge Taylor. My cousin is retired state senator James Taylor. My other cousin is retired chief of police, Frank Taylor. My cousin, Janelle Taylor, works for the governor of New Mexico in the Legislative Finance Committee. When I was young and married for 25 years, I not only worked for City Hall, but did contract work for the Department of Energy and the Corps of Engineers and had two Q clearances. It's a perception of me because I chose to live on a sidewalk painting paintings. It's abomination. Can I ask? Just in general, what would be your thoughts in terms of, I understand the perception um, of what you're talking about, the perception of people out on the streets, but just would you say that uh, most people on the streets are suffering from mental health issues, substance abuse issues, or do you think that many people on the streets are suffering from uh, drug-induced uh, substance abuse issues? 50% of the people that are homeless anywhere in America come out of the foster care system. People out there were not jocks and cheerleaders. They were the kids that were made fun of in high school. This is Budka, the same Denver. The homeless issue here is different. I'm a street mom. They call me an OG because I give them blankets and food for the last four years. I love my life. But the indignity that I get from your resources, I have been banned from St. Martin's. I can't get a meal for a year because when a police officer was arresting a young girl, I said, boo, APD. 
Yeah. Thank you. The services don't work. I will pass this out to you, and Carol knows how to get a hold of me if you guys want to ask any more questions. Thank you. Jean Pauls, followed by Miguel Titman. Um, I live on a corner of coal, and uh, a couple days ago I went to take a walk through my neighborhood. I walked up the street to Lead and turned left and walked about two or three blocks and came across a crushed concrete sign that said, Welcome to University Heights, um, because of some traffic collision. And I walked two more blocks, maybe three, and I came across a candle that was a little shrine, it was about this big, at the site of uh, a really grisly traffic death that happened to be in Joe Aguirre's yard. Uh, I turned around and went back home and walked along Cole, and I'll, I'll say that I don't walk along these streets um, unless I have a purpose to walk along these streets, because I'm afraid of them. I walked along Cole, and I went uh, about two or three blocks east of my home and came across a shrine where a pedestrian had been killed. And I walked about, well, I didn't walk any further. I wanted to get off the street. But uh, a few more blocks, I would have come to Carlisle where a motorcyclist had been killed. And so there's a real spirit of fear um, on the part of people who live on these corners, my husband and my son, that lovely 15-year-old up there is my son, and I live on one of those corners. Our bedroom pillows are like 10 feet from the traffic. And in the middle of the night, when nobody's supposed to be on those streets, you can hear them zoom in from a long way off, raging past the house and on up. And um, there have been so many accidents just in our front yard um, that I've got to say, I am terrified that one of these cars is going to come through the wall. And we will be asleep or not alert enough to get out of the way. Um, another thing that, um, oh, sorry. OK, I'm done. Thanks. Miguel Titman, followed by Connie V. Hill on Zoom. Councilor President Benton, City Councilors, thank you for having me. My name is Miguel Titman. I'm the president of IFF Local 244. Um, you have a lot of difficult conversations and topics to cover tonight, but I just wanted to hear, come here tonight and offer up um, some of the calls that I've been taking and offer some resources that we might have. Um, amongst all the stuff that we have going on in the city, there's also a bunch of wildfires raging in northern New Mexico and all over New Mexico. It's uh, looking like it's going to be one heck of a fire season. Um, I've been getting, feeling a whole bunch of phone calls about what are we doing, how can we help? Um, what can I do to help? So let me tell you what we're doing to help. Um, we've mobilized IFF all over New Mexico, uh, including AFF local, IFF Local 244, the New Mexico Professional Firefighters Association, uh, the Santa Fe Firefighters Local 2059, also collaborating with IBEW 611 and AFSME Council 18 um, to have drop-off locations, including our office, including the IBEW 611 office, including the IFF 2059 office in Santa Fe to drop off uh, um, non-perishables as well as animal feed and livestock uh, supplies. We're also um, driving up tomorrow morning, myself and a bunch of other firefighters here from Albuquerque with $5,000 worth of pallets of water straight to, to Las Vegas to donate. Um, just wanted to, to, to let you know, this is a public forum, uh, what we're doing and what anybody can do to help is let you know, and you can work through us. Um, we appreciate all your support, and we appreciate you being a, a, an advocate and, and letting people know what we're doing, and, and that way we can help um, mobilize even further, because this is the beginning. That's one to come here and let everybody know at the beginning of this fire season it's going to be a rough one, so um, we're mobilizing. Thank you. Mr. President, um, I was just going to say, if you can um, get in contact with Rachel, or I'll have her um, give you a call, because I know of another organization who is she just mentioned it to me, who is actually collecting items. So I'm sure they would want to um, work with you. Thank you, Council. Thank you. We'll now move to our speakers on Zoom. Our first speaker will be Connie V. Hill. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, please proceed. Thank you very much. Uh, council, uh, City Council, I'd like to address all of you. Um, and I had prepared a talk for two minutes, but after hearing the presentation, 
from the woman from Denver, ironically talking about their role model in Las Cruces, I would respectfully like to ask this council to step back from the vote tonight on the change of the IDO to allow camping all over the city. I heard heading home um, Jody talk about her vision, a vision. Our vision is not Coronado Park, everyone. The count at Coronado Park, the violence, the things that our neighborhood, the downtown north, near North Valley, have had to put up with for many, many years has never been equitable. And I would strongly urge all of you to take a step back. And if we are going to do the tents, and I appreciate Elizabeth inviting her to come and talk, let's take a hard look at how they're doing it. Let's use the West Side shelter as the campus. You already have shelter beds. We can bring resources to people, but let's not put it in any particular neighborhood because I can tell you, we are the poster child in Wells Park for the city disrespecting the citizen rights and the safety of our businesses and our residents, and it has to stop. I also want to invite you to the comprehensive planning meetings that we've been having. The state of New Mexico has now got monies to do a comprehensive plan hoping to build residential treatment through the judicial system. Not only do we need to readdress how we're basically allotting homeless encampments into one particular park, which is absolutely not fair, but let's not use the word equitable and help to destroy all the other neighborhoods. Let's sit down, take a look back at what the Denver model is talking about and really propose something meaningful. Please, please, I beg of you, Thank do you. not Your go time forward is tonight. Thank, Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Andrea Calderon. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Hi, um, good evening, Council President Benton and Council members. Um, I'm here to talk about a couple of amendments um, that were suggested for the Safe Out Outdoor Spaces Bill. Um, I highly encourage you to not rescind A12 as is proposed in Amendment B3. Um, although the city does already have established land use and in the IDO for low cost shelters, the amendment would completely ignore the current conditions of unhoused residents that are not opposed um, to, that are opposed to using shelters due to issues around stealing, safety, cleanliness, and the hygiene of other unsheltered individuals, which we have heard from other residents today. Um, B5, the Safe Outdoor Spaces Capacity Bill, would allow only one vehicle or one tent or, um, per space within the outdoor spaces um, and limit the number of individuals to 30 per outdoor space. As we heard from the Denver example, um, this is uh, falls short from um, the best practices that they exhibit and the amendment does not take into consideration or account unsheltered families that do not have children um, that would need additional tent spaces or additional car spaces. Um, amendment B6, um, you know, we have heard from Ms. Montoya also um, that just covered best practices that reflect that this amendment, which would only that which would require 24-7 security, um, falls short in providing adequate services that would provide the appropriate trauma-informed services um, that indicate greater success than providing security alone. Um, regards to Amendment B15, um, the SVI areas, um, I'm a data analyst and I've looked at the social vulnerability index map pretty extensively. Um, I, I wholeheartedly support the amendment that would prevent um, the first five um, SOSs to be placed in high social vulnerability areas. Um, these communities are already burdened with not only a greater number of unsheltered residents um, than other areas, but they're overburdened by a disproportionate number of social determinants of health. Thank you. Um, as time is up. By the Center for Disease Control. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Our next speaker is Lindsay Fox. Hi, thank you for having me at the comment period. I just wanted to um, comment. Um, you've already heard tonight from Jody Jepson, who I work closely with at ABQ Street Connect. I'm the medical director for that team. And in response to the Denver model and other discussions, I think what's important to remember is many of the folks that our team serves are chronically ill. 
um, with either mental health issues or chronic diseases. We're seeing a population that is increasingly aging. Majority of our patients range from 50 to 79 who've been on the unhoused and on the streets for years. So the complexities of their issues are extensive. I think when we look at the model and create avenues and pathways for housing, that um, treatment for both substance use disorder as well as medical issues falls right in line with that. And I hope that that also becomes an integral part of the planning um, with my capacity at the University of New Mexico. We've had incredible opportunities to connect folks who we've discovered with breast cancer at the encampments, folks who are struggling with hepatitis C and getting treatment, folks with longstanding substance use disorder that are now in remission and actively holding jobs. So it is possible through teamwork and multifactorial approach. So I hope as we go forward, partnerships between the agencies such as APD, City of Albuquerque, UNM, Heading Home can come together to work on these solutions in a concerted and intentional way because there is a, we demonstrated it is possible through our data. So thank you. Mr. President, that'll conclude general public comment. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to uh, administration question and answer period. Any questions from the administration? Councillor Davis and Councillor Sanchez. Uh, Mr. President, we heard from some folks this evening, uh, thank you, uh, about uh, uh, lead and coal, and uh, this has been an ongoing issue for some uh, in our neighborhoods for quite some time. I know we've been working with the administration uh, throughout their first administration, or their first term, and I wonder if uh, we could have Director Montoya very briefly come down to address some of the questions and concerns, and while he's coming, uh, Director, if you could help me a little bit, just help me remember, I remember as a new city councilor five, before you were in this, this office five or so years ago, um, my office started a traffic data uh, collection that demonstrated some speed issues and, and uh, <clears throat> excuse me, some crash issues. Uh, we passed that along and the administration began the, the safety brigade with the neighborhoods. Uh, there was initially a plan to do a more comprehensive study that was moved to Louisiana. Uh, right after the crash for the airman who was racing, if I recall, uh, there on Louisiana near the base. Um, but the uh, in the meantime, I know the legislature has added, our legislative partners have added funding for security upgrades. And we have the new Rest in Red pilot project uh, that the administration's getting ready. And, and I appreciate your help and cooperation in that, that our engineers have said um, could have an impact and is worth a study, uh, a pilot there. Could you tell us a little about the proactive efforts underway and what else you need from this council to address this issue? Uh, Mr. President and Councillor Davis, let me do a real quick recap. Um, so I believe in 2017, uh, Dr. Agueda approached the mayor asking about, as he was campaigning about, any improvements that could be made to lead coal. Uh, shortly after the mayor took uh, office, somewhere around the early part of May or so, a task force was formed. Uh, Dr. Aguide was the chair. There was representatives from the four um, neighborhood associations that were, would surround lead and coal. It took us a year uh, actually meeting monthly with the task force and representatives from my office, the traffic engineer, in order to come up with recommendations and solutions. Uh, shortly after that, I believe it was early 2020 or thereabouts, I know it was somewhere in the, uh, the, the cold months, uh, we went back in and adjusted um, all of the traffic signal lights, uh, the timing on those lights. The speed limit on lead coal was at 35 miles per hour. Per hour. We dropped that to 30 miles per hour. We installed an additional 24 speed limit signs for a total of 50 that are on, that, uh, on both those roadways right now. We also cleared the line of sight, so we cleared bushes back and looked at uh, what sort of curb uh, improvements could be made along that corridor. Others, um, in addition to that, we looked at the side streets that come out the Garfield and uh, Columbia and those sort of streets to see what sort of improvements, if any, could be made at those intersections. Um, with that, let me just quickly tell you what we're looking at now uh, after those recommendations. Uh, one of the things that we're working with uh, a consultant is to look at are there ways to improve the stop signs themselves that are on those side streets. Uh, in Councillor Lewis's district, we have installed three three or four stop signs that actually have blinking lights that surround the stop sign. Um, problem with those is that they're solar driven and we've had the solar boxes stolen several times, but that is one alternative to the side streets that might improve uh, or bring uh, visibility and the ability for people to know that uh, that is a busy street. Um, 
But I think the, the most important thing that we're looking at now, and thank you, Councillor Davis, is that we are looking at the stop in red. It's, uh, it's a new program. It'll be the first in Albuquerque, actually the first in New Mexico. It's been tested in other cities. Um, there's enough information to show that it has been beneficial. Very quickly, Rest in Red is a program where if a vehicle is speeding, uh, that light will stay red. So if you're coming down more than 35 miles or not, 30 miles an hour, and the light is red, it'll stay red until that car comes to a stop, and then at that point, it'll turn to green. Uh, we're at 60% design of that right now. We're working with a local engineering firm. Lee Engineering is the consultant that's working on that for us. We uh, will use the state pricing agreement to purchase the equipment that goes installed. So we're pretty close to uh, coming to finalize that project and test it on lead and coal itself. And then I think the final thing that um, I think Dr. Aguida wants to hear in the brigade is that um, while we took the road safety audit and moved it from lead coal to Louisiana, uh, the stretch of Gips, uh, Louisiana between Gibson and Zuni, uh, the Federal Highway Administration in conjunction with Mr. Cog has agreed to do a road study on lead and coal. Uh, that will take place uh, June 8th, 9th, and 10th of this year, so in about a month. And I know that the consultant working with uh, Mr. Cog, because it is their initiative, it's not ours, um, the city does not have the authority to implement a road safety audit to meet FHWA standards, so Mr. Cog is the agency that has to do that. As a result of that, um, they will reach out to the community for input. I believe there's one or two public meetings that are to take place, and we will get that information to Dr. Aguide and others from the group exactly when that will take place. But I think in a nutshell, that's where we are with, uh, with the program at this point. But the rest in red is the one that we really want to test to see how beneficial that will be to the city. And with Mr. that, any other questions? Mr. President and Director, I just want to say thank you and to Ms. Real. Uh, look, I, I realize I live on that stretch of roadway for, and pass it, use it every day. Uh, when speed cameras come back, I know I voted against them, but I'm probably going to get a ticket there a time or two uh, until I remember to do better. Um, but it is an issue, and it's one we're seeing, as, as folks demonstrated, um, we've had a speed issue, we've had a racing issue all across our city. Um, we've heard every city councilor dealt with it. The council pressed APD to do more on this, and they did last year and have done it again, and I appreciate it. Um, I don't disagree with any of our neighbors, uh, Tom and, and Joe and uh, where's Bob, and those, everybody that's been here this evening um, are right that living there is, can be dangerous, and so we want to do more. I just want folks to know that we haven't given up. Um, and in fact, we're doing more studies with Mr. Cog. We're implementing these pieces um, that we are allowed to do in the city. Uh, and I appreciate that. It's been a long slog for sure. Um, and it's scary every day. Uh, but we're taking action and, and have deadlines and dates and dollars to hold pe for folks to hold us accountable. And I appreciate them, my colleagues' time for us to address this this evening. Thank you. Councilors, other questions for the administration? Uh, from Council, Councilor Steinberg. Uh, please, don't address the, the, the council from the back of the room. Director Steinberg. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I have a question for uh, Mr. Real and also I have for uh, Chief Medina. Um, Mr. Real, um, what's gone on and what's been um, done in the Tingley and Central Corridor since we, have spoke, once, since we began speaking about this approximately eight weeks ago? Mr. Mr. President and Councillor Sanchez, uh, Mr. Montoya actually has an update for you. Uh, Mr. President and Councillor Sanchez, so the first trailer was installed today. Uh, somewhere between, I, I haven't driven out there this afternoon, or I, did, I didn't, not, did not do that, but somewhere between Rio Grande and New York, I think somewhere around the McDonald's, it's on Central. It is a, sp a trailer that basically will announce congested area or pedestrian traffic ahead, and then watch your speed. Uh, the permanent uh, flashing signs that were uh, scheduled to install, we're just pricing those now. We would hope that based on supply uh, that we have those somewhere uh, late June, mid-July, those will be the permanent flashing signals that will be installed. But for now, uh, if you drive westbound on Central, you will see the trailer that will warn you that uh, New York is a very congested pedestrian area and watch your speed on that stretch. Mr. President and, and, and Councillor um, Sanchez, and Councillor Benton, um, you had asked Councillor Benton about uh, planting uh, trees along that corridor, and we're also moving forward with uh, with having trees planted in that right of way to help um, hopefully create a better sense of of community and calm calmness to the corridor, if you will. Thank you, Mr. Rowell, Thank you. 
Mr. Director, thank you. Any other questions, Council? Yes, I have a counselor for the chief, a question for the chief of police. President Benton, Council, Mr. Sanchez, Chief Medina is currently in another city meeting and unavailable today. Thank you. Um, some of the questions that I think that uh, we need to do were brought to my attention when I actually had a conversation with uh, Ms. Watson, Ms. Leticia Watson, uh, last week. And she was unaware that uh, um, the police department does not provide a bi-weekly or every two weeks when we have council meetings a actual report card so i think it's really important to city council um, also the citizens of albuquerque that we know how many officers um, are in working at apd right now how many officers do we have with boots on the ground and how many officers we have lost between meetings um, and uh, how many Field services officers minus um, transport and court services. I think it's important that we know how many homicides a year to date that we have um, each time, how many shootings with injuries. Um, those are some of the just basic questions that we should know as city councilors and also the citizens of Albuquerque deserve to know. And just to see how we're doing and how we're progressing and hopefully we're getting better in reference to those areas. President Ben, Councilor Sanchez, I'll pass that message along. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to the journal. Vice President Lewis. Mr. President, I move approval of the journal. There's a motion and a second. All those in favor, say yes and raise your hand. Yes. yes. Opposed? That passes. Uh, we don't have any reports of committee. Uh, this evening, um, we're on now communications and introductions. Are there any changes to the letter of introduction? Vice President Lewis. Mr. President, I move uh, approval of the letter of introduction. Motion and a second. All those in favor say yes and raise your hands. Yes. Opposed? That passes. And we'll move on to deferrals and withdrawals. Councilors, any deferrals or withdrawals at this time? I have one deferral from approvals. Uh, that is EC35, appointing Esteban Aguilar, Jr. to the position of city attorney. I move deferral until June 6th. <coughs> Sorry. There's a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say yes and raise your hand. Opposed? That passes. And then we have deferrals from final actions. This is uh, item C. Uh, uh, myself and Councilor Fiebelkorn. Councilor Fiebelkorn. Mr. President. Um, this is in reference to R230, designating the Manal Met Metropolitan Redevelopment Area, making certain findings and conclusions pursuant to the Metropolitan Redevelopment Code, and authorizing and directing the city to prepare a Metropolitan Redevelopment Plan for the Met Manal Metropolitan Redevelopment Area, and move a deferral until May 16th. There's a motion and a second for a deferral of R230 until May 16th. All those in favor, say yes and raise your hand. Yes. yes. Opposed? That passes. Any other deferrals at this time? M Mr. President, I have one more. Okay. Um, this is R13, which is directing the administration to install three-way stop signs at the intersection of Cutler Avenue Northeast and Morningside Drive Northeast. I'd like to move a deferral to the June 6th City Council meeting. All right. There's a motion for deferral until June 6th on R13. All those in favor, say yes and raise your hand. Opposed? And that passes. We'll move to the uh, consent agenda. Are there any changes to the consent agenda? Councilor Bassan. Mr. President, I pull item H, OC8 off the consent agenda. OC8 is the appointment of Ms. Amanda Chino Zamora to the Civilian Police Oversight Agency. All right, thank you. Um, for the individuals on tonight's consent agenda who are being appointed to serve on boards and uh, on a board or commission, thank you for your willingness to serve. Um, we will move on to uh, Vice President Lewis. 
Uh, move approval of the consent agenda. There's a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor, say yes and raise your hands. Yes. Opposed? That passes. And then the item that was pulled off the consent agenda, Councilor Bassan. Mr. President, OC8 is Amanda, Ms. Amanda Chino Zamora to the Civilian Police Oversight Agency. I'd like to move deferral until May 16th. There's a motion and a second from Councilor Davis. All those in favor, say yes and raise your hand. Yes. Opposed? That passes unanimously. We'll move to announcements. Councilor Davis. Thank you, Mr. President. There will be a Finance and Government Operations Committee meeting on Monday, May 9th at 5 p.m. in these chambers. Councilor Sanchez. Our correction is in the committee room. In the committee room, okay. Councilor Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. President. There will be a Public Safety Committee meeting on Tuesday, May 10th at 5 p.m. in City Council Committee Room. And Councilor Jones. Thank you, Mr. President. The Land Use Planning and Zoning Committee on Wednesday, May 11th is canceled. All right, thank you, Councilors. Uh, we don't have public hearing tonight. We will move to final actions, starting with 010, count myself and Councilor Jones is uh, adopting the citywide text amendments to the integrated development ordinance and uh, adopting text amendments for a small mapped area of the Old Town Historic Protection Overlay Zone. I move it do pass. Is there a second? There's a motion and a second from Councilor Jones. Thank you. Councilors, we'll begin with public comment on this bill. We will first hear from those who signed up to speak regarding cannabis prohibitions in Old Town. This item is quasi-judicial and requires that members of the public be sworn in. If you will be speaking to this, please raise your right hand. Uh, do you affirm under penalty of perjury that your testimony will be true? Thank you. And uh, Mr. President. Uh, Councillor Davis. Mr. President, um, as many of you know, I work in the cannabis industry and I have clients involved that uh, may have a business interest in this. And although I don't personally, I think uh, I'd ask Mr. Melendres to give us some guidance on whether it's appropriate for me to recuse myself from this, uh, these public comments on this matter. Um, Mr. President, Councilor Davis, yes, I think that's been consistent with your recru uh, past recusals, so I would recommend that you continue to do that. Thank you. Mr. President, if you don't mind, I'm going to excuse myself uh, from this discussion if you'll invite me back when you're done with the cannabis piece. All right. Thank you. Um, so we will address the cannabis portion first, right? The, the speakers on that, on cannabis retail in Old Town. That's the HPO-5 historic preservation uh, overlay and cannabis with Bill in Old Town. And we have uh, several people signed up to speak. Uh, Mr. Moya. Thank you, Mr. President. Our first speaker will be Commissioner Debbie O'Malley, followed by Sylvia Ramos Cruz. Mr. President, counselors, uh, I support, I believe it's. Uh, uh, sponsored by Councillor Benton to support the prohibition of the sale of marijuana at, in Old Town. Thank you. Thank you. Sylvia Ramos Cruz, followed by Jesse Ehrenberg. Mr. President and Councillors, I am a member of the historic Old Town Property Owners Association and of the Old Town Portal Market Advisory Board. I've testified in writing and at several Zoom meetings on this issue. I hope you've had a chance to read those comments. I support amendments to the IDO that prohibit all cannabis-related businesses within the 10 square blocks that is historic Old Town. I believe these businesses will adversely affect the character of my neighborhood and the quality of life for those who live and work here. I chose to purchase my home in historic Old Town 20 years ago knowing that it is a mixed residential commercial zone where people have lived and run mom and pop micro businesses for three centuries. But I also knew that as a designated historic zone, the history, culture, and character of this tiny place would be respected and preserved. Of course, no place stands still. Changes have come to Old Town. Some good, some not so good. Some well deliberated, taking into account possible bad consequences, some not so well deliberated. I know cities require revenue to provide services to people, yet everything should not be about money. We should not lose history, which is the scaffold upon which the future is built. 
for the sake of a few more dollars today. But let's say we must have that money. Why is it necessary that the business that will provide that money in this historic zone be, sorry, that that money will be in this historic zone? Is that someone, is it that someone intent on purchasing this product would refuse to cross Mountain or Rio Grande or Central or Lomas to access any of the many such businesses sprouting like a ring around Old Town? Please explain to me and the public why it is essential to have a cannabis business in the historic portion of Old Town. Thank you. Jesse Ehrenberg, followed by Patricia Wilson on Zoom. Uh, President Benton and counselors, as a resident of historic Old Town, I have recently seen some new businesses move in with the idea of modernizing Old Town in order to compete with the sawmill district. Part of that plan is to sell cannabis in historic Old Town. Now, I understand why any business would want to increase its revenue, but doing that by selling cannabis is a decision that will have some very real consequences, and we need to look at the bigger picture. Decisions regarding Old Town should not be made just on the basis of money alone. It is the character of this historic place that brings people here. And changing the family-friendly nature of Old Town with cannabis sales and hookah rooms may just be the thing that in the long run will kill the goose that lays the golden egg. Think how selling cannabis will impact the tourists who bring their families to see historic Old Town, buy Native American jewelry and art, and often take either the bike, Breaking Bad, or ghost tours. And let's not forget the local people who come here to bring their children to school, go to church, and just have a nice meal. All told, there is really no good reason at all to bring people looking to buy cannabis into historic Old Town. There are already smoke shops they can go to selling cannabis in the surrounding neighborhood. For all these reasons, I ask you to please vote to exclude cannabis sale in Old Town. Thank you. We'll now switch to our speakers on Zoom. Our first speaker will be Patricia Wilson, followed by Renee Horvath. Uh, Mr. Moya, my comments are more germane to the citywide amendments, so should I wait to speak? Sure, if you prefer to do that, that'll be fine. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Renee Horvath, followed by Kathy Hyatt. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Renee Horvath. I live on the west side, and uh, yes, I wanted to speak to the Old Town Prohibition. I do agree with the previous speakers that uh, cannabis should be prohibited in Old Town. Uh, cannabis is available all over the city and uh, and is permissive throughout the city. So I don't think a limit, you know, keeping it out of Old Town is going to be a problem for that industry. I do agree that this type of use it conflicts with the historic character of Old Town. And uh, the community has strongly communicated this and does not want it in Old Town. And I agree with that. So thank you very much. Our next speaker is Kathy Hyatt. Yes. Um, as the founding village of Albuquerque, Old Town has been a cultural and historic treasure in Albuquerque for decades. Its shops, restaurants, museums, and events have attracted visitors and tourists of all ages. I believe cannabis retail does not fit the definition of family friendly and is not appropriate in the Old Town Historic District. The introduction of cannabis retail to the Historic District would change the character of the Old Town community. Once cannabis retail is introduced, that traditional ambiance and character that we have all known and loved would be difficult, if not impossible, to regain. I urge you to vote to prohibit cannabis retail in the Old Town HPO5 Historic District. Thank you. 
Mr. President, that concludes public comments on the Old Town specific. If you would like, I, I can move to the general city uh, public commenters. It's uh, 7 o'clock. Counselors, you want to take a dinner break now or after the, after the speakers? Okay to listen to speakers? Okay. All right, we'll go ahead. <laughs> we'll go ahead with the uh, with our speakers on the uh on the uh O ten as a whole. And I guess we should there's Councilor uh, Davis. Well, Thank you, Mr. President. Our first speaker is Commissioner Debbie O'Malley, followed by Jane Beckel. Mr. President, counselors, I'm here to speak in support of allowing for safe outdoor spaces to be created in the city. It's not surprising that this idea has been unpopular with many members of the public. It's been my experience that any services or housing for the very poor, people who are homeless, to low-income working families has always met with resistance. My concern is that the more regulations that are put on this category the less likely safe outdoor spaces will be created. I don't think that is the intent, at least I hope it is not. Requiring that these spaces be conditional instead of permissive in certain zones is one of those regulations. That just adds more time to getting one of these spaces off the ground, and time is what we don't have. Why would you as a council want that? Conditional uses can be appealed, sending it right back to you. Also, why would an agency nonprofit which would want to create a safe outdoor space want to go through the conditional use process? It's a lot of time, cost, and work just to be denied at the end. The other amendments, restricting these spaces from urban centers, main streets. I'm a kind of confused as to the reasons. These are areas where public transportation exists. Is that to make these places as invisible as possible? There's no doubt that it's embarrassing that so many people are poor in such a rich country. Well, why not show that we're doing something to safely shelter people? Another amendment is that the first five outdoor spaces could not be located in areas that are poor. It's my understanding is that what that all means. Assuming we can get the first one off the ground. I remember hearing something similar when I was involved in building low-income housing in the Sawmill neighborhood. Many of my neighbors told me, why are you building low-income housing in our neighborhood? We already have poor people living here. Why would we want more? We need to meet people who don't have housing where they are. That's been mentioned a few times. There's a reason we have encampments at Coronado Park and other areas. Jane Beckel, followed by Doreen McKnight. Um, Mr. President, if Commissioner O'Malley can finish with her comments, I would appreciate it. Thank you, I tried to keep it as short as possible. Um, they're walking, uh, dis okay, there's a reason we have camp encampments at Coronado Park and other areas. They're walking distance near services, health care, and food. I believe safe outdoor spaces is the best option we have to get people, people safely sheltered with support services as soon as possible. And we have many successful examples throughout the country. And we have the best example right here in New Mexico, Camp Hope in Las Cruces, which has been functioning successfully for 10 or more years. Right now, we have individuals walking around with housing vouchers they cannot use. Reasons, housing shortage, and as a result, the cost of rent, and it's already getting worse. But I don't need to tell you that. Finally, safe outdoor spaces are not permanent and can be built for a great deal less than a shelter, and they can be taken down fairly quickly if that location becomes problematic. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this evening. Please make it possible to create this this much needed opportunity for individuals to have safe, secure shelter as soon as possible. It's the right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you. Jane Beckel, followed by Doreen McKnight. Mr. President, counselors, I am a, a Neighborhood Association board member, but speaking as, a, as an individual. So I want to speak again to a point I've made in previous meetings, and that is the necessity of genuine public engagement in deciding land use matters. matters. The recently passed narrow uses language that seems to affirm that. Um, constructive interface between city and neighborhood groups, um, engaging through the lens of promoting strong and informed participation. Land use 
and zoning decisions, I think, are probably among the most consequential decisions this council makes um, in the way that they can affect Albuquerque residents. So I would hope that the council would make it a priority to assure informed and genuine public input at every point in the discussion and implementation of land use matters. What would that look like? Well, first, the Inter Coalition Council has proposed a detailed outline of changes to the IDO process that I think would further that objective. And secondly, I would hope to have the council assure that there is a public review process in the development of consequential land uses, um, including those which conflict in some ways with um, the IDO and ABC comp plan principles. Also, I wrote this before I heard tonight's presentation, and I'm really grateful for hearing that because I've been looking for information about safe outdoor spaces, and I really think it was wonderful. But I also thought that they affirmed the importance of public engagement. So thank you all very much. Doreen McKnight, followed by Gabriel Pally. Thank you, President, counselors. I'm here on behalf of the Wells Park Neighborhood Association. We are uh, just north of downtown, north of Mountain, between the railroad tracks, 12th Street, I-40, and Mountain Road. As a neighborhood, we support both supportive and permanent affordable housing as a primary community goal to addressing homelessness. We do not believe that the proposals as outlined in the amendments to, to the IDO for safe outdoor spaces or living lots ultimately further this goal. We do not want to see these safe outdoor spaces serve as a stopgap that allows for further delay in the city creating substantial additions to its affordable housing stock. At this time, Wells Park opposes the B2 Living Lots Amendment as proposed. This proposal has not been vetted by the review process, and the community has not had an adequate time to engage in discussions about that proposal. The, well, the Wells Park Neighborhood Association also currently opposes A12 Option 3 for safe outdoor spaces as passed by the Land Use Planning and Zoning Committee. Um, however, we would encourage the city to continue and get to engage with the community when drafting this type of legislation in order to get community buy-in on these types of services that are critical for addressing homelessness, but we do not want them to be permanent. Um, we did submit written comments to the council regarding our suggestions for uh, changes that might be made to safe outdoor spaces so that, it's, that it can further community buy-in for these proposals, um, one of which would be proposing, we would propose a distance of 1,500 feet between any size safe outdoor space um, and a separation of 1,500 feet between safe outdoor spaces and any other type of overnight shelter as that would be in line with the current definition of overnight shelters in the IDO. Um, we also would encourage a, a cap on the safe outdoor spaces that would be two per council district and no more than one per council district until each council district has one so that we as a city have equitable distribution of these services throughout um, our communities. Thank you. Gabriel Pally, followed by Ricardo Guillermo. Benton and Council, I'm um, Gabriel Pally. I am a member of the Wells Park community as well as the uh, uh, Neighborhood Association. I'm also a physician at UNM and the Quality Safety Officer for the Department of Family and Community Medicine. I want to say very clearly, I like the safe outdoor spaces. I think it needs to be implemented as part of a, as I'm speaking personally, uh, the larger comprehensive plan of services for the variety of uh, people experiencing homelessness who some want to remain in housing some don't for a huge number of reasons I deal with them when they get sick and they come into the hospital and they die and I take care of them there as people who need a variety of circumstances my concern uh, and and I was really impressed with what I saw in Denver um, uh, what was showed to me of the version in Denver I think it, it, it represents a good ideal model that being said, the, my problem is with the current uh, proposal uh, is so lacking in detail. I'm a quality safety officer. I make sure that things are represented and can be replicated and we can have assurances to the individuals who are going to seek uh, shelter 
for community partners like UNM and for service providers that we know what this will be. What is security? What is uh, adequate hygiene? Uh, there's way too, many, uh, too few details. Um, uh, and so I think it would be very concerning that uh, something of this magnitude is going to be put in as just a very quick update to the, I'm oh, sorry, to the, uh, the, uh, the, this, this process as opposed to a comprehensive plan um, that guarantees safety and resources and that this is part of an overall comprehensive plan to uh, end and prevent future homelessness. Thank you. Ricardo Guillermo, followed by Martha Hurd. I'm on the board of the Wells Park Neighborhood Association, and on behalf of the board, I'd like to make these comments. If the purpose of safe outdoor spaces is to create moderate barrier alternative accommodations for unhoused individuals who, for whatever reason, are unwilling or unable to utilize other available shelter options, it is the position of Wells Park Neighborhood Association that the city ensure that such a use not be used, misused, or co-opted to prevent comprehensive, affordable housing policy to both transition to unhoused individuals into housing, as well as keep economically challenged people from becoming unhoused. We have seen skyrocketing housing prices in many cities create huge numbers of unhoused people, and we do not want to see these safe outdoor spaces to serve as a pressure valve for lack of a comprehensive affordable housing policy. We further question the underlying premise of supporting and allowing permanent encampment land, land uses. In legally, challenging our zone, in legally changing our zoning code to permit individuals to live in tents and cars indefinitely, are we not conceding as a community the intractableness of homelessness and, affordable ha and unaffordable housing and openly acknowledging that we are okay with fellow humans living in such conditions? Our unhoused neighbors do not deserve to be permanently relegated to living in cars and tents. If the safe outdoor spaces as a concept to provide for lower barrier options for unhoused individuals is an approach that the city of Albuquerque wants to take, Wells Park believes there must be strict limitations on the allowable number of these uses so that such uses don't become the response to an inability of our community and society to create and provide affordable, ho affordable housing or address other root causes of homelessness. Uh, I'd like to also add that um, I think it would be good to see an analysis on a map by district, because I think equity requires that all districts have some of this. Uh, look at the map and see where these zones are, the MX zones, relative to the R zones, and the distances between them to see which communities are likely to be more impacted and address these issues in, in your decisions. Thank you. Martha Hurd, followed by Randy Baker. I'm Martha Hurd, and I'm also on the Wells Park board. And uh, some of the things I'm saying have been said, but I, they need to be emphasized. We are in the historic center of Albuquerque, north of Mountain Road, the oldest north-south road. Because of our central location and mixture of residential, commercial, and industrial development, Wells Park is a dynamic area with potential for further growth. We are also one of the two city council districts that contain the majority of Albuquerque services for unhoused individuals. In addition, we are also home to Coronado Park, the city's current de facto sanctioned encampment and main pickup drop-off location for the West Side Shelter. Concentrated homelessness in this area has resulted in substantial impacts to the surrounding community. On the opinion page of last Tuesday's Albuquerque Journal, business owners write about the difficulties of dealing with some of the neighbors in the nearby tent city. The administrative policies of the city have historically concentrated the homeless population in the Wells Park area. By pushing the unhoused individuals out of the downtown core, the Wells Park area has continued to be overburdened and the location of numerous service providers for homelessness 
is not a Wells Park issue. It is a city of Albuquerque issue. It should be the responsibility of all citizens of our city to share the burden of incorporating high impact services and land uses into their districts. Equitable distribution of services and land uses aimed at assisting the unhoused is vital, preventing the economy disenfranchisement of particular areas of town. Thank you. Mr. Andy Baker, followed by Rhiannon Sandler. Hello, Mr. President, members of the Council. My name is Rhiannon Samuel, and I'm the Executive Director for NAOP, the Commercial Real Estate Development Association. In my two minutes, I want to touch on NAOP's position to five amendments you're going to consider in the IDO, A2, A10, A11, B9, and B13. I'll start with the easiest two first. So for A10 and A11, we are in support. The other three require a little bit more explanation. For A2, the hotel conversions to residential uses for affordable housing, we are, we are supportive, but we would like to see it expanded. We believe that this creative option to get more res rental units on the Albuquerque market is great, but by only allowing this solution to be applied to funding received through family and community services, you are excluding a wide variety of funding sources that could participate in getting people housed. Now on B9, the pre-application review team meetings, we support returning PRT meetings to be voluntary. And we're working with the planning department to make sure that they are efficient, valuable, and timely. We know that this process is helpful for some applicants and for the city. We see the value in keeping them in the IDO while also making them optional for most projects. Then finally, B13, the replacement of the Development Review Board. So NAOP is in support of policies that make the development process more predictable, transparent, and efficient. But since this sweeping amendment was given to us just one week ago, we are still evaluating the impacts of it to see if it would accomplish these goals. 
And candidly, with my membership, it's gotten a lukewarm reception. We're really concerned about what unintended consequences they may be, there may be. So we respectfully ask to be included in conversations around this amendment. Brad Bouvet, followed by Quinn Benet. President Benton, Councilors, I uh, want to emphasize that there are two elements to dealing successfully with the people who are living in tents and sleeping on the ground. There's over 400 of them by the city's count. There are 170 encampments and they're spread out all over the city. So the first element is that we have trespassing statutes. All city parks must close at midnight and stay closed until 6 a.m. Anybody who's in a city park when it's closed is guilty of trespassing. The fine is up to $500 and up to 90 days in jail. Trespassing on public and private property that's posted um, is 300, up to $300 and up to 90 days in jail. None of the trespassing statutes are being enforced. If we don't tr uh, enforce these trespassing statutes, we do not have a prayer of making the safe outdoor spaces, the living lots, whatever alternatives we come up with, it is not going to work the way it should. We're not going to be able to get these people into a place where they can have some personal dignity, be able to take a shower, use the bathroom, have an address, be able to work with case managers and other service providers so they can get IDs. Boy, that was fast. Thank you. Quinn Benet, followed by Peter Kalitsis on Zoom. President of the Council, Council, thank you for having me today. I just wanted to speak on the support for the safe outdoor space. Uh, just a couple of things. I noticed that the safe outdoor spaces would be limited to zoning MXM and MXH, I think, forgive me. Um, and I know we're trying to mitigate impact and concern and think about how people are going to live, et cetera. But the message is, I just want you to think about the message that that sends. So we want people to be good neighbors, but then we're saying we don't want you to be our neighbors because also some of these are exempt from residential areas. So, you know, I just want you to invite you to consider opening the zoning places that, they, that safe outdoor spaces can go, because, you know, we, we want people to understand that they are people worthy of connection and support, and they don't have to be put on the outskirts of town, that they don't have to be not seen. I understand that there's fear and there's a lot of things that are wrapped up into the complexities of homelessness. And they are also people that are suffering. And that's a societal problem, not necessarily an individual problem. And people will always move towards choosing community over in building community rather than separating. So I also want to say that when thinking about safety, Safety is not the absence of a threat. It is the presence of connection. Thank you. We'll now move to our Zoom speakers. Our first speaker is Peter Kalitsis, followed by Patricia Wilson. President Benson and council members, I'm Peter Kalitsis and here on behalf of Parkland Hills Neighborhood Association, supplementing our submitted comments. We support A12, option three, and B6, as these provide for 24 seven staffing, safety and support with permissive locations at non-residential zones and conditional use near residential residences. 
Well, we do not support B3 or B2's lack of safety. We oppose B14. We support the EPC recommendation that overnight shelters be conditional use in the MXH and MXM, expanding locational opportunities while mitigating neighborhood impact. The administration proposed this IDO change when gateway opposition developed. Three, we support B8, and sub which supports the comprehensive plan helping ensure that social responsibilities are borne fairly across the Albuquerque area. We oppose B4 as it does not include RELUPA opportunities to provide opportunities for religious organizations in the surrounding neighborhoods at the same time. We oppose B7 for MXH and MXM are often in close proximity to residences and most available locations for MXH are along East Central and North San Mateo. B15, we support the vulnerability index to reduce overburdening, but we oppose the RELUPA exception. Uh, we oppose the current IDO process that does not allow residents to review information in a reasonable time frame. Thank you for your consideration of our neighborhood requests. Patricia Wilson, followed by Dan Regan. President Benton and counselors, at noon last Friday, I received the latest IDO floor amendments before you this evening. 111 pages. I spent several hours preparing the six page document emailed to Council Clerk Ortega over the weekend. Hopefully you've had an opportunity to review my comments on each amendment as I cannot go through them in 90 seconds. The IDO annual update is a three step process. First EPC, then LUPS and finally full council. And yet, after the first two stages have been completed, we are presented with brand new amendments. At last week's presentation, we were told by staff that the new amendments were just modifications and not new proposals. What about B13 replacement of the DRB? I've been reviewing amendments since October of last year. There's been nothing about replacing the design review board with a design hearing officer. Section 6-7 policy decisions clearly defines the process for amendment to IDEO text citywide. Staff reviews the application, forwards a recommendation, EPC conducts public hearings and makes a recommendation to council, council conducts public hearings and makes a decision. If there is some place in the legislation that allows new proposals to be inserted after EPC's notice of decision, I respectfully ask Mr. Melendres to point that out to me and also to explain the risks and potential liabilities of the city not following its own rules. Thank you very much. Dan Regan, followed by Renee Horvath. Can you hear me? Yes, sir, please proceed. President Benton, council members, our city at the direction of the then city council and with strong concurrence from Mayor Barry, initiated a four year plus process and paid close to $2 million, much of it to out of staters to tell us how zoning in our city should work. A new IDO was approved by the council in late 20, 2017 against the recommendations of 95% of neighborhood associations and city residents who spoke out. This IDO has been revised with new amendments each year since 2019. The amendment process is spelled out carefully in the IDO itself as Ms. Wilson just attested to. That process does not include amendments created after the EPC and LUPS work is done. <clears throat> Each year, the city council has taken it upon themselves to add council amendments to those which were made through the prescribed IDEO process. The use of council amendments within the last month of a seven to eight month process excludes any real semblance of notice to, awareness of, or participation by and with the public. Council amendments this year have reached an apogee 
of confusing iterations and gives clear evidence to anyone paying attention that the whole area of cannabis use, safe outdoor spaces, and especially the functioning of the DRB are not ready for prime time. Even NAOP agrees with that last one. And the ongoing changes to these amendments are beginning to resemble flags or fires being blown hither and yon by rapidly changing winds. All of these areas need more careful examination, information, and critical thought. I respectfully ask that the council shelve all amendments in packet B now and start working on the research needed to craft wise versions of them when they are ready. Thank you for your attention and time. Our next speaker is Renee Horvath, followed by Gillum Curley. Good evening again. Uh, my name is Renee Horvath. I'm with the Westside Coalition and the Taylor Ranch Neighborhood Association as their land use director. And I did send in my comments uh, this morning uh, to give you an idea of uh, my thoughts on things based as a land use director. I do agree with the previous speakers that these are too many amendments and they're too important because they're dealing with zoning issues and social issues and to only have two minutes to address all these amendments at city council is not a good way to uh, get a good outcome in all these amendments and so i'll just focus on a try to get three in uh, the safe outdoor space uh, i know you're we're trying to help the homeless i don't disagree with that but I do agree that with the previous speaker, there's not a lot of details to assure a good outcome. And uh, based on what I've seen and what the people from Denver, the ladies from Denver said, that they have some good uh, safe outdoor spaces, but you still have drug issues, mental health issues that are not really addressed in that. And I think we need to start talking about the types of homelessness that we're dealing with. It's not just uh, hardship cases, but it is drug addiction and mental illness. And that's why people are concerned about having these safe outdoor spaces placed too close to their businesses or their residents. So we need a more, a better discussion about community meetings to be informed because this is, this, uh, is the first time I've heard of that presentation. Real quick, I, please do not get rid of the DRB. I've been very impressed with them. I, I think we need to keep them. And all, that's all I'll say with that. And for parking reductions, I am very much concerned about reducing parking uh, okay. because I hear, well, let me just say one thing. I hear too many horror stories and Ed's has not been thoroughly. I so can't. Your time is up, Ms. Horvath, sorry. Gillum Curley, followed by Leslie Padilla. Thank you, council members. Um, I believe that, I hope you had a chance to read my written comments that I submitted earlier. Um, we've had a lot of changes that went into option three, uh, that and a lot of these provisions in the floor amendments, which add burdensome, add expense, add restrictions, make it, I think it's gonna be almost impossible to find an appropriate location where it both fits the zoning and where homeless people are willing to go. Um, I think this is setting up the safe outdoor spaces for failure. And we should revert back to option number two from LUPS. Here, on the other hand, are the restrictions on unauthorized encampments. It's a blank sheet of paper. And if someone is willing to tolerate being shuffled around every two weeks by the police, then they can simply pitch a tent. Now, when you have all these restrictions for a, a safe managed space, there's just a blank sheet of paper for an unauthorized encampment. It tells me that the council would rather have people camping in parks, on sidewalks, in business parking lots. I hope that's not the case. 
the, there definitely needs to be structure and management, but that should not be in the IDO. That needs to be left tailored by the organizers to each safe outdoor space. I'm a small business person. I just opened a used bookstore um, east of Knob Hill. I would like to have, I like to do my part and have a two tent safe outdoor space behind my store. Now, there are any number of issues here. Does it make sense to require traditional zoning, traditional use permits, and all of that time and expense? Does it make sense to require me to have 24 seven support for two people? Thank you, your time is up. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Leslie Padilla, followed by Rosemary Blanchard. Uh, thank you, council members, uh, for allowing me to speak. My name is Leslie Padilla. I live in District 6. I'm speaking uh, tonight in opposition to most of what's in uh, Amendment B14. Um, I'm familiar with the amendment um, and um, the uh, issues surrounding the definition of overnight shelter because of my work with three of the neighborhood associations that surround the proposed gateway site. And I want to make clear at the outset that those three neighborhood associations don't oppose uh, the, the gateway center operating as a shelter. What they've wanted are reasonable conditions on, on the operation of that shelter. And that's why we have been opposing the conditional use permit. Um, but it is important to keep uh, both MXH uh, as conditional use, not change it to permissive. Um, and then as to MXM, the proposal there would make that permissive as well. That should also be conditional. And that is exactly what the EPC adopted back in December. Um, they held that uh, both in MXM and MXH, it would be conditional use. Um, conditional use, I'm just going to review some of the other um, uses in the MXH uh, uh, zone that are conditional, nicotine retail, liquor retail, group home large is conditional use, outdoor storage is conditional use, campground is conditional use, self-storage is conditional use, with no limitations on the number of people who can be in an outdoor, in, excuse me, in an overnight shelter, it's reasonable that it still be conditional use and the city be required to show that there's going to be minimal adverse impacts, or if there are adverse impacts, that those impacts be mitigated. So I would oppose um, um, Amendment B14. I do think the definition of overnight shelter may need to be revisited because the current definition does not allow extended stays over 24 hours. Um, that's all I have for tonight. Thank you so much for your time. Bye-bye. Rosemary Blanchard, followed by Sarah Keeney. Thank you, members of uh, the council and President uh, the Council Benton. Can you uh, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Please proceed. Okay, thank you. I'm speaking as an Albuquerque resident living in the near North Valley of District Two, and I'm also a member of Albuquerque Friends Meeting, a faith community who have had experience through the period of the COVID pandemic in greeting and providing a few basic needs such as access to water and ability to sit down in the daytime to unhoused neighbors who seek respite outside our meeting house. I'm not going to make detailed recommendations regarding the zoning changes needed to provide safe open spaces and other temporary shelter resources to the unhoused because there will, I know, be a lot of details that will need to be carefully pieced together. However, I do ask you to move forward with the plans for outdoor and other spaces to better shelter, serve, and engage with the unhoused residents of our city. Albuquerque Friends sent a letter to the Albuquerque City Government back in 2020, urging you to provide outdoor living or camping spaces nearby for people living on the streets who often remain uneasy about accepting indoor accommodations, but do need a secure place. The safe outdoor spaces must be safe, not only for the city, but also for the unhoused residents who stay there. I hope you, you will use the proposed changes in the integrated development ordinance to create a range of options for unhoused persons, both temporary and permanent, including access to safe open spaces, to sanitation, water, without too many limiting requirements that create unnecessary barriers for people needing a safe space to, to spend the night and for community organizations who wish to provide help, engagement, and support for their unhoused neighbors. 
please work in partnership with representatives of the public and private nonprofit organizations who are working with unhoused persons and at-risk persons in our city. Let our city make constructive changes in the integrated development ordinance, and wise use of home American Rescue Plan dollars. Thank you very much. Sarah Keeney, followed by Peggy Mack. Hello, am, am I on? I can't tell. Yes, uh, you're on, please proceed. Okay, good, thank you. So um, thank you, counselors, uh, Mr. President, Mr. President, for your time tonight. And my name is Sarah Keeney, and I'm here to speak in strong support of safe outdoor spaces without too many restrictions. The same for living lots. These can be individually negotiated with neighborhood associations, just the way they are done in Denver. And I'm also part of the Friends Meeting, the Quaker group in, that is in Wells Park that Rosemary Blanchard referenced. And she referenced a letter that we sent two years ago requesting this solution be implemented in Albuquerque because it was recommended by the CDC in the time of COVID. And I want to say that we did get a positive response from Councillor Benton and also especially from Commissioner O'Malley in trying to implement um, the safe outdoor spaces. And in the two years ensuing, there has been a lot of research and preparation gone into creating safe outdoor spaces. And many of us saw a presentation on Camp Hope a year and a half ago. We know what works, we know that it can be done. And the worst hurdle is this zoning right now. And so I'm urging you to please create zoning that empowers safe outdoor spaces in a variety of areas in Albuquerque without too many restrictions. Let's have a safe, stable place for people to stay with dignity while they're waiting for permanent housing. We have talked to people on our step and asked them what they would like and this is a very informal type of survey, but they have all said they would stay in a safe outdoor space. And the vast majority have said, no, they will not stay in a shelter, even when it goes down to 10 degrees. So um, our Quaker group Thank request you. in this letter still stands. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Peggy Neff. Good evening, counselors. Thank you for the opportunity to speak again. And thank you to all the speakers who have addressed the council tonight. Thank you for coming out. <clears throat> the issues are imperative. I do not think it's good governance to move forward with 02210. I ask you to defer the decision to this amendment ordinance. And I ask you to convene a public discussion to address the issues involved in the process. I'm concerned that there's significant abuses happening within the IDEO update process as it was intended and marketed as a chance to address the need to update technical and textual oversights in the IDEO, not to make substantive changes to our city's zoning regulations. I am very glad to hear the discussions today regarding safe open spaces, encampments and conversions that change our basic dwelling definitions, et cetera. But these were not part of the comprehensive behavioral health, health gap analysis that was presented to the public just last month. Council should not be involved in planning activities. You should be doing oversight and once in a while proposing a change to our ordinances, not approving 110 land use amendments in one sweep. It is irresponsible to continue this pretense of governance. We need a better process. We, a small group of exhausted public who have been providing a facade of oversight to the process, have been asking for changes to the process for years. 
this year we got very specific and Councilor Pena, thank you for trying to bring it forward and Council da Councilor Davis, thank you for taking part of it up. But in order to do good planning and in order to do good governance, you need the following, an estimate of numbers of persons that are to be affected, a statement regarding possible unintended consequences, a comprehensive summary of public comments related to each amendment and examples of the suggested changes. Funding for the operation and site for safe open spaces and encampments might be tucked into the street outreach part of the city's action plan. But where are the experts? Where is the plan? Please listen to those who spoke today. Take time to do the right thing for our unique community. Thank you very much. Your time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. President, that'll conclude public comments on O2210. Mr. President, um, I would respectfully request that one more speaker be heard, um, Miss Denise Baker. She's been waiting for three and a half hours. Oh, she did not sign up to speak. And, and I think it was an error. Was, it, was that an error? Uh, Mr. President, uh, we have a list full of folks, and Miss Baker's name did not sign, show up on our list. Um, so it suggests that the process uh, worked for people who were attempting to sign up. I'm not sure what uh, error Miss Baker experienced, but she's not on our list. Okay, we've got a long agenda tonight, so I'm not going to allow it. Uh, we're going to take our dinner break now.
Sisters, um, we are still in phase 10. Um, here are presentations from city staff that uh, this agenda item is going to come to you for uh, confirmation. Please raise your hand. Oh, there they are. There, there's Ms. Schultz. Hello. <laughs> Up in the sky, Ms. Schultz raised her hand. Do you affirm under penalty of perjury that your testimony will be true? I do. All right. Thank you. Ms. Schultz, please proceed. Thank you, counselors, and good evening. I'm going to start uh, off this bill with a presentation that's going to cover a couple of different things. First, um, a little bit of a history on the 2021 IDO annual update, how we got to this point thus far. Uh, and then I will dive into each individual amendment um, that the council may consider this evening. So I will go ahead and share my screen and begin my presentation. Uh, when I do get to the amendment portion, I'll pause after each slide on each individual amendment. And if uh, counselors have questions or comments, we can kind of take them one at a time as I go through the presentation. Okay, can um, uh, Mr. Moya, can you confirm is my presentation showing correctly? Yes, you're good to go. Great, thank you. Uh, for uh, those who don't know me, my name is Shanna Schultz. I'm the Council Planning Manager uh, for the Albuquerque City Council, and I will begin my presentation on the IDEO Annual Update. So here's a little bit of a timeline uh, for this year's IDEO Annual Update. The Council uh, adopts amendments to the Integrated Development Ordinance once a year. That is uh, required in the IDEO, that, that once a year we crack open the book and, and make fixes and changes. Uh, and pose substantive, if desired, amendments to our zoning code. This process started in September of 2021 when the city's planning departments first compiled and then distributed uh, a list of proposed amendments to the public. Uh, in October of 2021, that same department, the planning department, held public meetings and open houses to discuss those amendments, to take feedback on them and hear from the community on uh, what they liked, what they didn't like, uh, what they wanted to see formally submitted. Uh, moving over to December of 2021, the Environmental Planning Commission, or the EPC, who is the first kind of review and approval body in this process, uh, heard the first kind of stab at the amendments. Um, they held one public hearing on the matter in December, they took public comment, they deliberated, and ultimately ended up making a recommendation up to the full city council. In February of 2022, Council received that packet of amendments and formally introduced it into their review and approval process, uh, which brought us to March and April of 2022, when the Land Use Planning and Zoning Committee, the subcommittee of the Council who is responsible for the land use and zoning items on Council agendas, uh, heard uh, 02210 at three different hearings. Uh, that was The first one was on March 16th. The second one was on March 30th, and the third one was on April 13th. And I will talk a little bit more about what happened at LUPS uh, shortly. Uh, lastly, uh, you can see the little flag that says we are here. The council is the last stop. The full council is the last stop for this packet uh, of amendments for the 2021 IDO annual update. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about the EPC process. The EPC heard two separate applications, uh, one for amendments to citywide regulations and another for amendments specific to the Old Town Historic Protection Overlay Zone or HPO5. Uh, you heard public comment in kind of two buckets tonight. Uh, that first set of public comment was specific to changes proposed to HPO5. The second uh, was the, kind of the more general citywide changes. However, all of those changes are compiled into one bill. That's the bill before you tonight, 02210. Uh, so first I'm gonna begin with a brief overview on the proposed changes to uh, the Old Town HPO5. Uh, the proposal that the Environmental Planning Commission considered and recommended was related to cannabis uses in Old Town. Uh, the proposal was that the three cannabis land uses that the IDO regulates, that's cannabis retail, cannabis cultivation, and cannabis-derived products manufacturing, uh, all be prohibited within the Old Town boundary, which you can see um, 
depicted in the map on the screen. Everything within that blue area is the Old Town HPO5. Uh, generally, the EPC re received comments of support to prohibit these cannabis uses in Old Town and did uh, vote unanimously to recommend to the council that those three uses do be prohibited. Uh, they also heard uh, proposed citywide changes. There was a spreadsheet of about 75 different topics, um, I'm sorry, different amendments that were across a variety of topics uh, that affected almost all sections of the IDO. The EPC took public comment at their hearing, um, and the public really only spoke about two issues that the EPC considered. Out of the 75, the majority of the public comment were on two issues. Uh, the first related to overnight shelters, there was an original proposal that overnight shelters move from uh, not allowed at all in the MXM zone to permissive and um, in the MXH zone to permissive from conditional, what, what they are today. The EPC um, took that public comment, weighed that public comment, and recommended a bit of a middle ground up to the council which is that uh, an overnight shelter would be conditional in the MXM zone um, and remain conditional in the MXH zone. That's what's um, before the council tonight without any further amendments um, proposed. Uh, the other kind of hot topic was related to taller walls in the front or street side yard setback. Uh, today in the IDO, you cannot have a, a wall in these locations taller than three feet. There was a proposal to raise that to four feet uh, the EPC recommended that that do not be approved, and so that is not within uh, the scope of the, the bill tonight. Other than those two kind of, kind of hot topics, the EPC unanimously re recommended approval for the rest of the amendments that they considered. Um, as I had mentioned earlier, the Land Use Planning and Zoning Committee held three meetings uh, in the months, months of March and April, and the committee ended up passing 13 total amendments. Um, so the bill that's before the council tonight is O2210 as amended by the LEPS committee. Packets of those approved amendments can be found on the planning department's webpage. That's abc-zone.com. If you'd like a full collection of the amendments that were considered, whether they were uh, passed, moved, or not moved, those are all on that website. That brings us to the amendments before the council tonight. These are amendments that the Land Use Planning and Zoning Committee did not consider. Um, these are kind of new topics or new ideas. The council, of course, has the purview to propose amendments to the IDO or really any piece of legislation at any time in the adoption process. Um, this is how it's operated for previous year's IDO annual updates, so I wouldn't say that this is out of the norm by any means. Um, we've got about 15 or 16 amendments to review. I will take them one at a one at a time, give you a brief description of what the amendment proposes to do, um, and on, then I'll pause for questions on, on each individual one. Uh, the first one is related to the proposed prohibition on cannabis uses in Old Town. Uh, amendment labeled B1 proposes to say that instead of a full prohibition on cannabis retail within that mapped boundary that I showed earlier, um, cannabis retail would be allowed, but only if that retailer has a micro business license from the state. The state has kind of two uh, levels of licenses that they can issue cannabis retailers. One is, I'll just call it, I guess, a regular license. And then the other one is the micro business license. That micro business license, um, I think, trying to target kind of smaller, maybe more local operators. Uh, so Amendment B1 would propose that retailers with a micro business license would be permitted in the Old Town HPO5. Counselors, are there any questions? Any questions, counselors? Shanna, or... <clears throat> Do we want to uh, go ahead and move and, and debate these as we go, or uh, I guess I guess it's up to the up to the council as as to what they would prefer. Mr. Who's President, nodding? that is the the purview of the council this evening. I think that, staff is ready to do it either way. Yeah, counselors, if it's okay, I think it might be orderly. If 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 the sponsor of any of these wants to move it, we'll we'll go ahead and discuss this after the after we. Re hear the uh, summary from Ms. Schultz. So, so uh, Councilor Peeblecorn. Uh, Mr. President, I would move um, what, B1. So, so this would be amendment number one. Right. There's a motion and a second. Mr. President, for this. and consistent and, uh, with my recusal earlier, I recuse myself from this matter. Okay, thank you. 
So we're on floor amendment number one. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Councillor Fiebelkorn. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I asked Ms. Schultz to um, develop this amendment. Um, I think that it is in keeping with the specialness of Old Town that you are allowed to have a microbrewery in Old Town. And so having micro businesses for cannabis should be allowed. I really don't see any justification for excluding um, this new completely legal industry from Old Town. We do not exclude them from any other historic part of Albuquerque, and there are many parts of Albuquerque that are historic. Um, they are not being excluded from any other jurisdictions. Uh, the Santa Fe Plaza is also a historic area. There is no exclusion for cannabis sales. And so to me, um, since we have said that you can't have just full liquor license, you can have microbreweries, this seems in keeping with that. So I would urge support, support for this amendment. Mr. President. Any other discussion? Councillor Jones. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, Councillor, my one question would be is we have uh, prohibited smoking of cannabis on the sidewalks in the city prop in the city. Would that extend over? Would we be sure that that extends over into Old Town also? Uh, Mr. President, Councillor, um, yes, that would definitely extend. That is a citywide ordinance. All this is saying is that there could be sales of cannabis products you cannot go out onto the sidewalk and smoke them anywhere in the city. There's a civil fine. Anywhere in the state, actually. So, Thank you. I just wanted to be sure on that one. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, I, I, uh, I do support this amendment. And uh, I know I was <laughs> the one that kind of started this discussion last year with regard to Old Town. But I think this, one, this there's a logic to this amendment. And uh, um, I think it would have zero negative impact uh, for Old Town, so I do support it. So we're on the bill and uh, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, say yes and raise your hand. Yes. Opposed? That uh, fails on a four to four vote. Okay. Um, we'll move on to B2. This would be floor amendment number two, Councilor Bassan. Mr. President, if Ms. Schultz wouldn't mind giving the, the preview of it first, okay. please. Mr. President, Councilor Bassan, I'd be happy to. Amendment B2 proposes to create a new land use called Living Lots. Uh, the idea behind this land use is that it would be for occupancy of folks in tents, light vehicles, or recreational vehicles. This amendment outlines the zone districts that you could do a living lot in. Uh, that would be permissive in all of the mixed use zones. Those are all the MX dash zones. And then also permissive in most of the non-residential zones. That's NRC, NRBP, NRLM, and NRGM. This <clears throat> amendment also creates one use specific standard uh, to say that hand washing stations and toilets would be required. Mr. President. Uh, so, Mr. President, I do want to make sure that this goes to the next meeting because I do want to have a red line draft. There's a couple things that came up today, but I wouldn't mind discussing discussing this a little bit since we're here. Um, I've had some conversations with many people regarding living lots, uh, what I used to formerly call dirt, because I think that we need a first step. Um, I made some notes listening to people talk tonight about safe outdoor spaces and what they what they think about it, whether it be one, one side or the other. So I kind of want to reflect on a little bit of that without taking too much time, but I think it's important. Right now we're living in Albuquerque where people are constantly asking for help. They're constantly saying we need to do something about homelessness, whether it's because they have empathy or sympathy for homeless and the unhoused, or whether it's they're frustrated and fed up with homelessness and the unhoused population uh, trespassing or loitering or camping overnight when we're not, we are not enforcing the laws that we have on our books. So people don't want, they want something to be done, but they don't want it in their backyard. They want us to do something and have vision, but nobody actually wants to try something. So it's this huge oxymoron that I feel like we're in this cycle in Albuquerque and we're not taking a leap. So I, I came up, well, it's not like a stroke of genius, but I decided we have to do something so let's try it. Let's not do a huge investment. This is not going to cost us a fortune. 
it's identifying people properties that the city owns. There's some county commissioners that are interested. There's some APS school board members who are willing to identify properties that are owned and vacant, whether they're parking lots, asphalt, dirts. So why not get out of our own way? Don't spend a lot of money to add infrastructure. Don't spend a lot of money to make sure that we have all the perfect solutions. Those are ideal. We all want those. But instead, we need a low cost, low barrier compromise with options to services. We can have ACS go out daily to these living lots. We can build rapport. APD can go and do the idea of community policing. The thing is, is that this is step one. And the, the hardest mm -hmm. thing for me to be able to get through to people through this entire process is that this is step one. And it's ideally very temporary. And so with it being super temporary, we can say, you can camp, you can be in your tent, you can do you, but you can't do it anywhere. You have to pick somewhere to go that we have given you the option for. We have the DOJ, we have the CASA, we have ACLU, we need options. We can't just put up 100% barriers everywhere we turn. We have to start somewhere. And people are currently camping everywhere. People are currently defecating anywhere. People need help throughout our city. We're tired of it, we're frustrated, they're tired of it, they're frustrated. We just heard tonight that we don't get them, we don't see their perspective, we don't have perspective. So let's try something, and that's living lots. And if you don't go to one of these options, or to Tiny Homes, or to the Gibson Health Hub, or to the WEC, or to any of the nonprofits, these are options we're providing. But this is the lowest barrier for the first step so that we can start minimizing the homeless population that we have in Albuquerque by getting to them, the ones that want help, the ones that need help, and then the ones that are left at the end of all of that are gonna be the ones I can't even begin to decide how to help because that's not my area of expertise. But that's the last percentage of the population that's the highest need and the most acute. So step one, living lots. You can do this, but you have to do it at one of these locations and you can't hurt people, you can't steal, you can't be doing this just anywhere so that we can gain our parks back, we can gain our sidewalks back, our, our streets, our businesses. This is what Albuquerque needs and has been asking for. And guess what? If it doesn't work, we didn't spend millions of dollars to try it. So with that, I wanted to make sure that in the next couple of weeks, um, when we come back with the red line version, um, I do want to make a couple changes to this for living lots. I want it to include... Um, instead of one toilet per five occupants, I would like it to be one toilet per five spaces. Like I'm talking spray paint, people. I'm talking spray paint on the ground to designate a space. Simple, low barrier, okay? And then I also wanna add in something that I learned today while talking to Denver, which I think was very, very important, is putting a timeline on this because I'm serious when I say I intend for this to be temporary. I don't intend for it to just be in Wells Park or just by Coronado. I don't intend for it to just be anywhere but my district. This is something temporary. So I think that we should do something and, and evaluate and I wanna work with staff and maybe all the, all the rest of you that I can to figure out maybe we say this is one year with two six month extensions. That's what Denver's doing with their zoning. So we can have a commitment to minimize this problem that we have. And then we can, in the process of that, build safe outdoor spaces. And then in the process of that, hopefully fix the tiny home problem that we've run into. And in this time of that, we can also get Gibson Health Hub going. So instead of waiting for all the perfect things to finish, let's start with something and give it a try. Thanks for listening. Councilors, any discussion about this? With Councilor Jones. Thank you, <clears throat> and great idea. However, the devil's always in the details. Will you put this type of B2 in already existing um, zoned areas? And if so, what zones would those fit in? Would they be in residential zones? Will they be in, where exactly would they go? Would they be near a school? It's those questions that we always wanna, and I was a little far with the school thing, but where exactly what do you have in mind about where they would be? Mr. President, if I may. Please. And Ms. Schultz can give you all of the proper acronyms for them to make sure that I don't mess it up. 
Uh, but no, I mean, we're, we're not talking about putting this right next to residential homes. We're talking about identifying city properties that we have. There's some that have come up that are, you know, that we have already vacated or we've sold in the meantime that used to have just vehicles on them for storage. Um, I don't think we should put them in places like what some constituents mentioned earlier that, you know, they're out of sight, out of mind, far, far away. But I also recognize that there have to be some kind of boundaries and expectations but again, this is temporary, and my answer to a lot of people when I discuss this is currently there are tents everywhere in Albuquerque. They're next to our homes. They're next to our schools. They're in our church parking lots. They are everywhere. So I don't necessarily say, yes, let's go ahead and get 100 tents and put them all right next to a house or a school. But at the same time, we have to be creative and we have to be open-minded in this, knowing that it's temporary and that we can actually start accessing people and getting them connected to services if we give this a try. Mr. President, if I may. Thank you. Good explanation. However, it's always in the details. So what if we have a vacant lot next to a school? And it's there and it's ours. Can we put one there? If he says we can put them anywhere. What if we have it in a uh, uh, um, retail area and there happens to be a vacant lot because there are a lot of those? And how do we determine who has the power to determine? Is this a vote of the city council? Is this a uh, cost, toss a coin and, coin and see what it is? What are the details in this? And will that come later? And we're just throwing out an idea now? Or, or where are we with this? Uh, Mr. President, thank you. Council Jones, uh, yes, part of me is throwing out an idea because I get asked all the time to come up with an idea to do something. So this is my idea, and if it doesn't work, we abort it. If the council doesn't want it, then I guess my idea won't work, and I sure hope somebody else comes up with another idea. But at the same time, um, these are going to be permissive in MXT, MXL, MXM, MXH, NRC, NRBP, NRLM, and NRGM zone districts, meaning mostly non-residential. This is, this is where it's already written in here. Sorry, I had to pull it up while you were talking. Thank you for buying me some time. Uh, you know, but, but again, this is also not just saying that if there's an empty lot owned by the city, we are guaranteed to put a living lot on it. That is not at all what we're saying. This is saying let's identify properties as a city to try to try this out so that we can minimize. Again, minimize this problem. Get people connected to resources because right now, from what I'm learning, from the perception that I might know and what, I'm, what I certainly don't know, there are people hiding, and there are people scared, and there are people abused, and we can't find them because they are on the run in so many terms. So if we have to start forcing some, some element of this to say, you can't camp overnight in our parks, because frankly, a lot of other people that are following those laws want to use them during the day, and they want to go there and they want to enjoy them with their family. So instead, you can camp in one of these areas. And I think if we provide options, then this is the starting point that can tip us over into change. Mr. President, thank you. And I like the ideas. I like the big picture of it. But the devil is always in the details. So let's look at it deeper and see what we can come up with. But uh, it's always, it sounds good when we talk about it. And then when we start to do it, it's, it's let's make sure we understand where we want to go, what we want to do, and what the parameters will be. Thank you. I just have a quick question, um, Councillor uh, Bassan. Um, so, is this um, <clears throat> has this been tried? You know, this kind of completely unreg, you know, fairly very lightly regulated uh, version of a, a campsite. Has that been? Has it been tried elsewhere, Mr. President? It has been tried, and it has been proven successful, particularly in Tacoma. We've been researching other cities as well, but this is one of the ones that we've been in contact with the city of Tacoma. They have been willing to give us information on how they started it, their plans of how they've implemented it, so that we not only can do this, but we can do it without reinventing the wheel. Thank you. All right, so that's not going to be moved, unless is there is another question? Or, uh, Councilor Lewis. So, Mr. President, I have just an amendment to this amendment. We have copies of that? You have copies of that, Chris? So just um, a point of order. I think there's copies of it, I, I believe, too. But it, the amendment hasn't been moved, so. Uh, but, I mean, I can, I guess, Mr. President, uh, maybe some clarification. Can I add? I, I want to put an amendment to this amendment on the record and just, just defer it along with that amendment. 
Mr. President, um, Councillor Lewis, the, the motion, the amendment hasn't been moved, so it's not technically possible today to amend the amendment, um, but the amendments are being discussed. And so uh, if you'd like to present that amendment for discussion, um, unless somebody moves the underlying amendment, you could not move your amendment to the amendment today. Okay, so we can, I can at least we can uh, introduce it and then have it on the record, and then it'll just defer along with the bill or with this amendment. So do we have, do we have copies of that? I think I gave you all copies of that. And is, uh, uh, Mr. President, is, is uh, Councilor Bassano the only sponsor of it? So, okay. Yes. All right. Okay. So I'll just read it real quick. I, I, and I, and I, I'll just read it real quick. So it said this, this amends Council 4 Amendment labeled B2 to add a new specific standard as follows and renumbered uh, other use specific standards as necessary. It just says this, this, this use is only allowed in City Council Districts 4. It, you could strike out and 7. I thought you both were, were sponsoring this. And so really the amendment is just that this use is only allowed in Council Districts 4. Councillor <coughs> Feeblecorn. I would like uh, District 7 to remain in this amendment, please. Okay. Uh, okay, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll leave it then as this use is only allowed in Council Districts 4 and 7. All right, very good. Thank you for our consideration next time. Okay. Councilor Bassan. Thank you, Mr. President. The one thing I wanted to add to the end of this is um, going back to the devils in the details, and sometimes I think that the details are exactly what is causing this problem in Albuquerque. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And uh, I might ask if our staff could help us, Ms. Schultz in particular, maybe. I think it would be very helpful. Uh, I want to support this. I want some more information. I think there are some uh, improvements that the sponsor has suggested today. Um, and I do think we need to build that, that pathway of different options. I would ask if our staff could help us in creating one of those nifty charts they're so good at to compare how living lots, safe outdoor spaces, and some of the other require or some of the other proposals um, like the expanded shelters, et cetera, how those line up against each other in terms of access barriers, rules, all those things. Um, if that's possible, I think that would be tremendously helpful for our discussion next time as we move through these different uh, options. Mr. President, Councillor Davis, um, I think that's a great idea and that would not be difficult for staff to prepare. Uh, we'll have that ready before the next hearing on this matter. All right, thank you, Ms. Schultz. Uh, Next is uh, B3. This is uh, Safe Outdoor S Spaces, uh, uh, Councillor uh, Sanchez's amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, Ms. Schultz, could you go ahead and explain it? Because I know there's some things that could actually um, nullify the rest of the amendments. So if you wouldn't mind going through this real quick, and then I have, some, uh, I have something to say in reference to it. Mr. President, Councillor Sanchez, the next several amendments, the next five or six, are all related to safe outdoor spaces. Safe outdoor spaces is a land use, a new land use that the that the land use planning and zoning committee um, did approve as a part of their review and approval process of this year's IDO annual updates. So the next several amendments that we are going to discuss aim to amend what the LUPS committee amended in to the IDO at their April 13th hearing. Uh, so the, the kind of baseline for all of these amendments um, uh, is the amendment that that A12 option three that you that you've heard referenced in public comment tonight. Uh, the very first amendment related to safe outdoor spaces uh, sponsored by Councillor Sanchez uh, proposes to rescind A12 in totality. Uh, what this would do is strike um, all the provisions related to safe outdoor spaces that the land use planning and zoning committee approved. The result of that would be uh, there would just not be a safe outdoor space land use in the IDO. Um, and if this if this amendment does successfully pass, it would nullify all of the following amendments related to safe outdoor spaces because there would be no safe outdoor space use to amend. Um, with that, I'd be happy to, to stand for questions. Councillor's questions? Councillor Councilor Sanchez, would you like? Councillor Grout has Councillor Grout. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, could could the uh, council staff um, tell me, is, is, it, is it true that if once a property is developed under a particular set of IDO rules and the IDO changes, 
that property owner does not need to change the property to conform to the new rule. Mr. President, Mr. Oh, go ahead, Shanna, if you'd like to take that. Uh, sure, thanks, Mr. Melendrez. Uh, Mr. President, Councilor Grout, um, yes, that's correct. A property owner is subject to the provisions uh, that are adopted and in place at the time of their application to develop that property. Uh, so as we, as we continue to update our land use regulations on an annual basis, um, property owners do not need to conform with the new rules until they wish to again do something to their property uh, that would trigger compliance with those new rules. Um, so the, the rules that are in place at the time of their application is what they are bound, bound to comply with. Thank you. Um, so, so that to me sounds like if we have a safe outdoor space and or two or three or four and then we do find that they're not working um, and so we do go back and update the IDO again and um, that's fine and all dandy but those four spaces are still there so we're with we get them forever. Um, as long as they're funded or, you know, whatever. And that concerns me. Um, I know that we have in a public, uh, we have an emergency, homeless emergency, and we do need to do something. But I don't think that um, putting it in an IDO is a good plan. Um, maybe we should do a pilot program or try one somewhere. But heavens, I, I don't think we should do, put it in the IDO yet. Councilor Sanchez or Councilor Bassan, did you have, do you want to go ahead? Sure. Mr. President, this is, how, if we don't put something in the IDO, what is the process for doing a pilot? Don't we have to put it in the IDO? Um, Mr. President, Councilor Bassan, at present, uh, the concept of a state outdoor space is not contemplated within the IDO. And so um, I feel like there's a couple of, of iterations of what a safe outdoor space may look like. Um, one uh, could be a, a pilot project that's sponsored by the city, um, in which case the city as the sponsor would have discretion in how long it, it continues to operate that, evaluates its success um, and otherwise. And the, the other iteration would be a safe outdoor space that is perhaps established by a community group and that type of space um, could continue once established pursuant to property rights that a person would would essentially vest in uh, developing that type of, of, of use. Neither of those doors would be open without the safe outdoor, some form of a safe outdoor space amendment within the IDO to permit it from the first place because at present the IDO cannot accommodate that. Councilor Sanchez. Well, here's a novel idea and the devil's already in the details. Um, let's think about this for a minute. Why don't we start by enforcing the existing laws that we have in place? Um, why do we refuse to fix Coronado Park and the Wells Park neighborhood? Do we close our eyes? Does the administration close our eyes as we drive by Wells Park and Coronado Park as we come to work every single day? It looks like we do, and that park is illegal right now and we allow it. It would be an easy idea or an easy plan just to get in there and clean that park up and use it as a test site. I also visited Camp Hope. I went to Camp Hope in Las Cruces and I saw what was nothing short of amazing. We were initially met at the entrance by residents who informed us that outsiders were not allowed in. So we'd have to check into the office, which we did. It was immediately evident that this place was very structured and very secure, and it also had a strict camp host. Very strict. Once inside, we were able to witness just how much structure was in place. There was a de designated camping pads with no personal items to be seen. Everything was being stored in an area. We spent hours talking to the residents and staff, trying to determine what makes this site work. There were two att attributes that were unanimously agreed upon, the very structure of the place, uh, and also, um, the camp was run with ramp, wraparound services all the way around it. This camp started 11 years ago. It took six years to end up where it is right now. Um, we are told that other similar campsites in the same region, Hobbs and another one in Las Cruces, Cruces failed repeatedly. We are told that Camp Hope took six years before it was functioning at current levels. 
One resident said he moved to Las Cruces because living homeless in Albuquerque, it was absolutely impossible to get clean. Get clean. If he was, if he was not using drugs with other homeless population, then he was a suspect and he was a cop and physically beat and told that he was going to be killed. I'm 100% behind giving a hand up for those in need. And when you talk about that, I like helping people that have a hand up and are ready to do something instead of someone that has a hand out and continue to want and want and want. We were told that um, one resident said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm 100% behind giving a hand up to those in need. There are people who, through no fault of their own, have fallen on hard times or are battling severe mental health and substance abuse afflictions. They need assistance to lift themselves back up into a productive role in society. However, in Albuquerque, we have been repeatedly giving handouts, enabling predators to extort and control those who are trying to seek help. I would love to see our city streets clean again. I would love to see our unsheltered population have a place where they can lift themselves. Camp Hope works because of the structure and the on-site services. Without those in place, we're destined to fail. I will, um, we need to find out why. Um, more importantly, we need to find out um, why. When I, walked into, when I walked into Camp Hope, the first thing I thought of is tiny homes is better than Camp Hope all the way around. They have fully air-conditioned um, shelters with heat and an actual bed. And why can't we get that one to work? So we already have these facilities in place, in my opinion. And all we need to do is enforce the laws that we have here in the city. We need to find out other things that are more important so that we can get to those individuals. We need to find out um, why, the, why we're losing so many officers. We need to find out why we're not retaining officers. We need to find so that these officers can get out on the streets and help the individuals who are being um, who are who are being predated who are being predated predated who is who they're predated. I don't, well, let's see, let me see who they are who they are victimizing, and that's what we need to do. Is we need to catch the individuals and go and enforce the laws on the individuals who need it. We are. I mean. So what I say is let's fix Coronado Park before we move on. Let's task, let's task the individuals who are working with the safe outdoor spaces to try this at Coronado Park or try it at the WEC, um, the West Side Shelter. When that's in place and those things are functioning, then I think we can move forward with this. So I move to rescind um, safe outdoor spaces at this time. Is there a second? I'll second that comment. All right. Uh, and then you had a comment? Please. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I say I do support this bill. And just to just to clarify, I want people to understand what we're what we're voting on right now. So, so Councilor Sanchez has this amendment that it rescinds the amendments that were made to the IDO uh, in committee that give direction for safe outdoor spaces, and there's another of a number of other of, of amendments here tonight that are related to that. So if this uh, amendment were to, were to pass or move forward tonight, then really it would, it would uh, you know, eliminate that discussion and take those, those, these amendments off the table and the, the idea off the table. But I, I do support this amendment, and I... Uh, I, I don't believe that safe outdoor spaces or living cities, I don't believe they're safe. I don't believe they're compassionate. And I do believe that there's a, there's a better way that we can really meet the needs of, of those that are in need in our city right now, including you know, drug treatment and, and a lot of mental health support. Uh, and I do believe that there are beds available right now, uh, tonight. Um, there are beds available, and I think we have the ability to be able to enforce our laws. Um, and, uh, and get people the kind of you know, treatment they need and the help that they need. Uh, the city and the county are pouring millions and millions of dollars into, into that kind of treatment. And there are a lot of great um, shelters that are available right now that have uh, running water and heat that are humane and compassionate. And so um, I uh, you know, certainly support this. And I also want to just point out that there, there's, and just being honest, there, there's really nobody in my district that has, has, has voiced any kind of support for this, um, for this, you know, 
I think everybody wants to, you know, find solutions, and um, but I don't think anybody wants us to do something if that something is the is the wrong thing. And so, um, you know, I don't believe this is the right thing, and I'm going to support this amendment. I don't, I don't believe that they, people they, in my district, and I really don't believe they, they do in the entire city as well. So. Councilor Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate the the sponsor's um, position here. I wanted to ask the Ms. Keith from the city attorney's office and maybe our other legal staff if they uh, have an opinion. I, we've heard this argument before that, well, we need to enforce our laws, um, but there is some case law out there, some court law out there regarding the ability of cities to enforce. I realize this is out of the Ninth Circuit. It's out of Boise, I think, is the most prominent case. Um, but there's a growing amount of case law now that starts to say that cities can't enforce trespassing laws unless, and Councilor Lewis was alluding to this, unless we have enough reasonable alternatives. Um, otherwise, criminalizing trespassing without anywhere to go is inhumane and, and it's unnecessary use for our criminal justice system. It also, by the way, happens to be the most expensive way to deal with so many of our issues. But Ms. Keefe, are you familiar a little bit with that case? I think it's a Marion and B. Boise case in, out of the Ninth Circuit. Can you tell us a little bit about um, sort of where that, where that puts us as terms of a city? Um, sure, uh, Councilor Davis, um, Mr. President, uh, that is correct. That decision came down in 2019 and it held that a city cannot uh, criminalize trespassing when there are not sufficient available beds. Uh, and so since that decision was, has come down, there have been cases filed across the country raising this issue and raising the question as to when there are sufficient beds and when a city can go ahead uh, and make these kinds of arrests. And we, so pending clarification, we do have to be concerned about the extent to which we criminalize or make arrests for things like sleeping in parks. There are also some other additional limits. There are Fourth Amendment limits, which is why we adopted a new uh, encampment protocol that requires notice and requires storage of property instead of destruction of property. There are First Amendment limits. Um, there, so there are enough, there are considerable amount of limits that we have to look at when we're talking about making these kind of arrests. Mr. President, Ms. Keefe, thank you. And uh, I see Ms. Gula done joining us, so if we want to jump in, uh, she's telling me no. Uh, no, I appreciate it. I, look, I think this is important. Um, but. It is important. We should be able to enforce our laws. Our quality of life does matter. Um, that's why we have those rules. They're there for a purpose. But the fact is, I think we've, we have uh, uh, that factors outside of our influence in this room um, have led a lot of people. Look how many people, the vast majority of folks who are homeless in Coronado Park, for example, say they lived in Albuquerque more than 20 years. Um, we saw that data this evening. That concerns me that as a city we failed, we haven't done enough to give people that option when they wanna raise their hand of where they can go in that moment. Um, and so I don't think we throw the baby out with bathwater. No, we haven't done enough, absolutely not. We've been banging on that drum here uh, for years now and adding more money every year um, and it's still not enough. But um, we can't just say that, uh, you know, having the 24 hour WEC available is a good option because the bus only runs twice a day. And, and so what do you do if you miss it? What do you do if you can't get to God's Warehouse or Coronado Park because you can't get on the bus, you can't find traffic, they won't take your pet, they won't take your other um, supplies. Uh, that to me is not adequate, sufficient housing because it doesn't meet the need. And, uh, and so I think we don't wanna belabor this point because we have a lot of other amendments. I don't think it's the best idea for us to dismiss this concept tonight uh, I'd rather see us reject this amendment, continue to have conversations about how to make maybe living spaces, maybe other things better, um, and let's do that when we uh, have better options and more information in a couple of weeks. And so I would encourage the council to reject the amendment for now, continue to have our discussions to try to make the best possible option forward, and then decide whether we want to do that. Councilor Lewis. Well, Mr. President, I'd say you know, adequate and sufficient housing is, is housing with running water and heat at the very least, and that, that's compassionate, that's safe. I think we could talk for a, a long time and debate about the safety of these kinds of, of encampments. But, uh, but here's another point that I want to make that, that I, I think that we're, um, you know, even if this is something that was a viable solution and some of these that, that uh, I think what would be critical and what's missing here is actually identifying those locations before we would change the IDO. Before we would, you know, make uh, changes to the IDO. I think, you know, any counselor that would would vote for this or even propose this should have 
whether it be, you know, we're going to talk about five locations per district, we're going to talk about two locations per district, but th those, those locations should be identified and those neighbors and those people in those areas should have the ability to be able to, to weigh in on those. I think the public, the general public's hearing this and they think, well, there's so many questions that they have about it, there's so many fears that they have about it. Many of them have very, very well thought out reasons uh, that there's a, a better way to be able to help people and be compassionate and to be able to, to give people safe places to, to live and to, and, to, and to get help. Um, but they, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about changing, you know, the, the guide of our, you know, zoning, you know, for, for things that, for something that we've not identified anywhere. And so uh, I would challenge the, the, other, the other counselors here that if we, if, if we don't vote for, for this amendment, move forward this, that, that we name, before we even talk any further about this, that we specifically name locations uh, that you would support and that you would want these places, uh, these places to be. So. Councilor Besai. Mr. President, uh, I want to do one myth buster because I think that the public, based off of the immense quantity of emails we've been getting, it's not saying we're guaranteeing that we're going to put five uh, safe outdoor spaces in every district. That is not at all what this amendment is. So I hope anybody watching hears that we're saying currently, as what's being proposed, there could be no more than five eventually. So if this even were to pass, and if it were to remain as is, it's not saying we're going out there and putting 45 encampments throughout Albuquerque tonight. Um, secondly, do we know, um, I think Director Pierce, oh, I see, oh, you're both here still, thank you. Gosh, all of you, and maybe even um, Ms. Uval. Do you know the quantity of sufficient beds that are currently estimated to be available right now and compared to how many we need in order to eliminate the possibility of a lawsuit in regards to this Boise case? Roughly, can we find out eventually? I mean, because I think that's a key thing, right? We're all trying to avoid litigation, but we also want to help, but we also don't want to do anything. That's what we're getting really good at. So to me, how many beds do we need that are considered sufficient, and are they available for the, to meet the population and the requirement necessary? Um, Council President Benton and Councilor Passan, the estimates that we've had from a study that was done is about 700 beds. I can get that study to, to you and we can look at that. And to clarify, yes, our WEC has beds every night. I would uh, venture to guess we have about 350 folks out there and get that number. We count the, that, those numbers daily and we have capacity for 450. So there are always beds there. And so as we talk about that enforcement need, beds are available now and our community does need more beds. And we can send out that shelter study to all. Mr. President. Thank you. And director, sorry, one more thing before you go. Uh, so in the youth in the youth homelessness study, isn't there something like 1,500 estimated yes. youth that are homeless right now? Do they count for the need for suspicion beds? Um, Council President Benton and Councilor Passan, I'm glad you asked that question. Yes, that recent study estimates somewhere up to 1,500, almost 2,000 youth. And the estimates when the study was done did not count youth. Why it's so historic that that recent work that Pyre completed, and I know all the council, counselors listened to that um, presentation, is we didn't know in Albuquerque how many youth we had. So that's really kind of um, great groundbreaking work to know that there's that many youth, 18 to 25, on our streets right now that are, are in safe, unsafe conditions. So our estimates before didn't include the youth, now we probably have more of a, a greater need. Thank you, Director. And Mr. President, one more comment. Um, Councilor Lewis, if these are not the right idea, do you have a good one that is? Would you please share it? Yeah, the, ga the Gateway Center that you guys passed, I mean, you, it's a, I don't know how many millions of dollars have we put in the Gateway Center? I think if we, if you're proposing this, then you have to admit that the Gateway Center is an absolute failure. And, uh, and other proposals like it. Um, but that's exactly what I'm, I'm, I'm saying, that we've made this kind of investment. This is the, this is the, the model and the investment that we made. That, these are humane uh, places for people to get treatment and help. 
Um, there's that's now we're talking about safe places, and so um, so that's that's a solution. It's dealing with drug treatment, mental health issues, and but I would like to I would like to ask one more question, Mr. President. And uh, well, first of all, to the director, the, the 700 is that the available beds that we have to? What what was the 700? Um, Council President Benton and Councilor Lewis, our estimate from a, a study done was that there were seven there was a need for 700 more emergency shelter beds. And and then we we talked the other night too about you know see so there there's beds available at the West Side shelter. Have you done any other studies on available beds uh, not only at the West Side shelter and other a number of other shelters that the city runs and manages but also the many nonprofit and and private uh, shelters. Are, are there are there specific studies that we've done recently on that? Council President Benton and Councilor Lewis we haven't done studies, but yes, we have the list of all the shelter beds available from the nonprofit. Do we know how many beds are available tonight? 950. Available beds tonight? Yes, and that's with our list of all of our nonprofits. So that's Brothers of the Good Shepherd, Barrett House, Albuquerque Opportunity Center, and I could provide that list. And okay. thank you, staff, for the 950. All right, and Mr. Melendrez, maybe you could give us some clarity on the, because we had the question about the legal issue, and I think there's this fear over. You know the um, you know the circuit court that made that decision, and then but I also know that there are other cities all over this country that are actually enforcing the laws that we already have in place. What is the ratio? I mean, is it? And, and if I heard that right, 900 beds available right now. Um, I mean, what what is the ratio? I mean, what is uh, what is the the number? This magic number where we could actually in, enforce our laws without having this fear. And by the way, um, I'm sure there's a number of cities that are also enforcing these laws without without this fear of the court, or even knowing that the court might overrule them or might make a judgment about it, but they're doing it anyways because that's their laws, and then we'll, you know, I mean, ultimately, I guess it's decided in court, but could you give us kind of a, what your thoughts are on a framework? Um, Mr. President, Councillor Lewis, um, so I think part of your question was uh, what, the, what the ratio is relative to what the Ninth Circuit required, um, and, it's our understanding that that the court in that instance required uh, essentially a bed to be available for somebody that was being displaced. Um, however, again, as Ms. Keefe mentioned, um, that, is, that is the law of the land in, in a few states that are subject to the jurisdiction of the Ninth Circuit um, and not beyond that at this point. And so to the extent that other cities are operating um, outside of essentially the West Coast where the Ninth Circuit has jurisdiction, um, they, they're not bound at this time by that rule. And so uh, they would have whatever leave uh, they'd be authorized pursuant to the law and the rules within their various jurisdictions um, to enforce uh, removal or otherwise. Just to clarify, we, that, that is not the law of the land regarding New Mexico? Uh, Mr. President and Councilor Lewis, that's correct. New Mexico uh, is part of a different uh, circuit um, we're a part of the Tenth Circuit, whereas this decision that we've been discussing came out of the Ninth Circuit. And Mr. President, I, I just think that that's a myth right there because this this is that our argument is used from time to time that we might we can't do it. The fact is we can. The fact is we can enforce our laws right now. Nobody's told us we can't. Um, and uh, and and it's very likely that uh, there are enough beds right now. Uh, that if we were to start enforcing those laws and moving people into safe shelters where there's running water and heat, uh, that the people that want to be, you know, in those places and that we, you know, we would have every, uh, that would stand up in, in, in court in that way as well. So I, do, I think that's another myth. That's certainly a myth. Did you want to clarify something? <laughs> yes. Please do, because I mean, I, no. I appreciate the numbers that you were sharing. Um, yes, Councillor Benton and Councillor Lewis. So nine, there are 950 beds in our community. And that includes the 450 beds out at the shelter, of which they're not all full right now. But we, that is still not enough beds in our full community. Mr. President, and, and again, there, we don't know the ratio of that. I mean, uh, you know, and we also might, you know, some people throw around numbers like 500 homeless. I mean, certainly if every single person that, you know, um, you know I'm not sure if there would. But I mean, we, we also don't know if there may be tonight there might be another 100 people that, that would like to have a bed, and then if we were to you know, enforce some of the laws and move them to safer places, then they'd have a bed tonight. Um, the fact is we don't know how many beds are available right now, tonight. You know, I think we have estimates, and we have estimates of how many people might 
need those beds or might, you know, if we might, uh, you know, actually enforce certain parts of, uh, um, of, our, of our laws and, you know, and how many people might actually have access to it or use them. Direct, Director Pierce, if I may uh, also kind of direct this because we're, I think we're in a circle here. My understanding is we've got 950 beds. Correct. And that still leaves us that shortage of 700, correct, or whatever that, it was? That is correct. 700. So, so that's, those are the numbers. Uh, Councillor Fiebelfeind. Thank you, Mr. President. I really appreciate the conversation around the legalities of all of this, but I really think that we need to think about the morality of these choices that we're making. Is it moral to make someone go into a shelter when they are not mentally ready to do so? We have people living on the street who have been homeless for a long time, they are traumatized, and the answer for those folks is not to ship them out to the west side and put them in the WEC. The answer for those folks is to find something that works for them that gets them away from parks, away from open space, and away from your alleyways. That is the humane answer that we keep talking about. Um, I don't really care as much about the, leg the legal requirements of all of this as much as just the fact that we need to do the right thing and give people an option that does not undermine their dignity and provides them services so that they, if they become ready, can take that next step and get into a program, get into shelter, get into housing. Councilor Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. President. It's not like these individuals are going to get arrested and go to jail right away for criminal trespass. All my career as a law enforcement officer, we would actually give warnings. We would write citations, numerous warnings. We had a criminal trespass warning. And at that point, that gives them ample time to make sure that they have any chance of, any, of being helped out by anyone um, in the system. Also, think about the DOJ and how hard it is to get rid of the DOJ. Think about how hard it is to work on getting rid of the art project. Those, in my opinion, these were disa disastrous decisions. And if we make a decision like that, and this decision can't be changed and it can't be moved, um, then mark my words, we're going to wish that we would have not done this today. Just like I wish the art project wasn't here, and I wish the DOJ wasn't here. I think it's very, very important that uh, we talk about this, discuss it a lot more than we are. We also have two different things that we're mixing. We're mixing social issues with zoning issues, which is which is where we shouldn't be. Where we shouldn't even be wandering in this in this area. Um, so with the IDO um, putting the safe outdoor spaces and together is going to be a really really hard thing to unchange. And I think that if we go forward with this, we're going to be regretting it in the future. Mr. President. Mr. President, thank you. Um, I don't, I think that we need to be putting these folks in a, in a home, in, in a space, not in a building. Uh, there's a place in, uh, in Las Vegas, Nevada. They have a great program that um, they renovated an old building as a one-stop homeless service, uh, for homeless services. The building has a covered patio that, that has room for 800 people for outdoor living or for sp sleeping. It's run by the city of Las Vegas and it has all the basic shelter services. We purchased a building, uh, the Gateway Center, and, and I'm wondering if we can be using that facility to do something similar. Um, I'm so confused why we bought, bought a building for $14 million and it's only going to house 100 um, men and women and 25 families. I'm really confused about that. And, and I just wish, um, you know, like people, they, want to, they don't want to live inside, but having a, a space that's um, safe and humane and around services, and um, I'm, I'm all for that. And 800, 800 spaces. But I'm thinking we've got 572,000 square feet in this huge property that we built or bought. Um, I'm not sure why we're not using that more. 
Councillor uh, Lewis. Hey, Mr. President. You know, the, just to comment, you know, le the legal argument was brought up, le well, the legal argument was brought up as a justification for uh, the safe outdoor spaces, and I think that, um, I, th I think that it's valid fear, you know. Um, yeah, I think that there's, there's some myths related to that, and so I think it was important that we address that, you know, the legal part of that too, but, but we can also address the moral part of it as well. I mean, you know, the, you know, morally uh, sending or making you know people uh, go to a dirt lot and uh, and live in places that are fenced in with uh, with no running water, no heat. Uh, we can make a case for the morality um, in that as well. And I want to say again that uh, you know the people of the city were sold, or at least you know tried to, or sold on the Gateway Center, you know, and those kinds of uh, uh, you know drug treatment where there where people are going to get you know help for uh, mental health issues and. Um, and drug treatment, and, um, and and I do believe that if we're going to go this direction, this is this is telling the city people, people of the city of Albuquerque, that you voted on these kinds of of measures and and these kinds of proposals that we believed were going to help, and uh, you know by doing this, we're saying uh, that that was wrong. I mean, those aren't effective. That that was a failure, and yet we're still investing millions and millions of dollars in that. But I do believe that type of a model. Um, I, I, I also believe that not just the Gateway Center, but private organizations that run uh, centers similar to that are, are a better investment of our city, but that's the direction that we should be going and not places where people are living in, in lots. And by the way, we have, again, talking about morally, we have, we have no indication that people will actually go to a dirt lot if we make them go there as opposed to go to a place where there's running water and heat. So again, Mr. President, I support this resolution, or this amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. I have one uh, one last comment, um, and that Councillor Grout brought up is we have a gateway center. Why can't we do a safe indoor space at the gateway center and at with where you have running water, bathrooms, and all the facilities and wraparound facilities right there, and add hundreds of beds, hundreds and hundreds of beds into that facility. And then we would actually uh, fulfill the obligation that we have so that we can actually enforce the laws within the city of Albuquerque and state of New Mexico. So why would we even enter entertain um, this when we already have the facility, when we already have the room to actually take care of everything and, um, and, and get it done? All right, this is amendment number two, correct? So number, amendment number two has been moved and seconded. Uh, we're going to go to a vote. All those in favor say yes and raise your hand. Yes. Opposed? No. And that fails on a, uh, I think it was a three, three to six. Thank you. All right, we'll move on now um, to B4, Ms. Schultz. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, as I had mentioned, the next couple of amendments uh, seek to change the safe outdoor space use as it was approved by the Land Use Planning and Zoning Committee. Um, this amendment does takes, takes four actions. Uh, first, uh, at the Land Use Planning and Zoning Committee meeting in April, a district cap of five safe outdoor spaces per city council district was added. Um, However, when that was added, there should have been an exception also added for religious institutions. Um, there is a federal act called the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act. Uh, we call that RELUPA for short, uh, which sets forth that municipalities have to be um, very cognizant of the land use restrictions they place on churches uh, that might limit how a church furthers their mission. Um, the the um, city council district cap associated with safe outdoor spaces could be uh, interpreted to be limiting a church's mission if they choose if a religious institution so chooses to do a safe outdoor space so the first part of this amendment would exempt religious institutions from that cap um, second and very clerical in nature the amendment erroneously uses the phrase campsite where everywhere else in the amendment it uses the phrase designated space Designated space is the appropriate terminology for a safe outdoor space, not campsite, so that word needs to be switched out. Um, it clarifies some requirements related to showers. 
Uh, also at the Land Use Planning and Zoning Committee, the requirement for showers and safe outdoor spaces was added. Um, however, it wasn't clear whether those showers could be portable in perpetuity or if they would have to be plumbed uh, at some point. And this would clarify that they could remain portable in perpetuity. And lastly, uh, it clarifies that for any kind of fencing that is required, that that fencing uh, must be secured, i.e. with some kind of lock or locking mechanism. And I'll stand for any questions. Any questions, counselors? On this, I've agreed to sponsor this since mostly it seemed to be uh, some clarity that would need to be provided. Um, and so seeing none, we'll go to a vote. This will be amendment number three. Um, all those in favor, say yes and raise your hand. Yes. Mr. President, I think uh, we need a motion and a oh, second on that. I'll move the uh, uh, amendment number three and a second from Councillor Davis. All right, all those in favor say yes and raise your hand. Yes. yes. Opposed? Okay, and that was uh, five to four, it looked like. <clears throat> all right. Then we'll move on. Uh, to Mr. President, counselors, the next amendment labeled B5, again related to safe outdoor spaces, would amend the capacity requirements that the LEPS committee approved. Uh, the LEPS committee approved a maximum of 40 designated spaces with a potential for 50 occupants. Amendment B5 would reduce that to a maximum of 30 designated spaces with a total of 40 occupants. And Ms. Schultz. For any questions. Ms. Schultz, uh, based on the, the uh, discussion and the presentation today by the uh, folks from Denver, I'm not going to move this amendment. So we'll move on to B6. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, this amendment, Amendment B6, would add a requirement that on-call security uh, be required. The amendment, as passed by the committee, does require what is called on-site support. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This would also add a requirement for on-call security as distinct from on-call support. So uh, Ms. Schultz, this could be met by basically a, a security company that's just that the uh, camp has the phone number for who'd be available to respond 24 seven, correct? Uh, Mr. President, yes, I think that could meet the, the requirement um, for this regulation. And I'll ask the administration what they think of this. Councillor Benton on security, and I think as we heard from our partners in Denver, is there is 24-7 access to support. And some of that are people on site, or there's always a phone number for the neighbors to call. So security is an important element, and some of that is provided by um, the, the Nonprofit that's providing the support to the safe outdoor space. So, uh, the security language could be um, could be interpreted as something beyond that. I'm asking myself a question about my own amendment. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, the intention was. My intention was, you know, we have operators who are providing us the support for the folks who live there. Um, but, you know, I suppose you could say that the police are always on call. Um, and so that, that having a private security or some alternative security may not be necessary. Yes, President Benton, um, as we heard from our, our partners, they have 24-7 uh, managed support uh, derived from mostly people with lived experience, and it's a very structured protocol. And I believe doing that in combination with an on-call security company would be very appropriate and safe. Okay. We I could also I'm start with the model that they did just right. to try it out, where they did managers in the day and an actual security on site in the nighttime until we see a um, number of incidents and types. All right, so for the time being, I'm not gonna move this amendment either. Um, so we'll move on to uh, Councillor England. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Just a question, not germane to this amendment that was in front of us, but um, I guess germane to the entire issue. Do we have um, resources or funding identified for um, to pay the nonprofits to be able to operate these um, campsites? Council President Benton and Council Pena, yes, in our budget request for FY23, I think it's 750000 And that would be used to contract with the nonprofits to provide that 24-7, the, the on-site services for case management and more of what we've heard today. So 700, I apologize, Mr. President, um, 700000 for what if there was nine in nine council districts? Council, <clears throat> Councilor Pena, so 750000 So if there were nine districts, I mean, we would need to look at that budget, and I think there would be more resources depending on the number of sites of safe outdoor spaces. Okay, uh, Mr. President, so how many sites do we think we may have potential to start up out the gate? Council President Benton and Councilor Pena, with, I think we've got the nonprofit interest and capacity to contract with. I think what we need to do is look at that budget, and I'm asked, wondering if staff remembers on the budget on safe outdoor spaces. We may need to get back to you on what we could do with that 750 to really have the 24 7 staffing on there. So seven. So with the 750, do you have a budget related to that for one campsite in terms of what the cost associated with that be, would be? Yeah. Council President Benton and Councilor Pena, I can get uh, one of the proposed budgets from, from Denver and look at what the costs were for one site. I don't think for 750000 you can do a site for each council district. I can get that exact budget for you. Okay. That's a little concerning. <laughs> so, okay, thank you. I, I, I'd like to point out one thing about all of this discussion about uh, safe outdoor spaces in the IDO. The question was asked and the answer was, we can't do these without amending the IDO. That doesn't mean that we as a council can't require more before one of these is actually approved administered. If we were to pass this, let's say, it, let's say we were to pass some version of this and it would be in place, then administratively there still needs to be a whole set of rules and programming, right, to, uh, to assure uh, the public and ourselves and, and the expenditure of the fund that it's going to be done well. That's not the kind of language that lends itself to writing into a zoning document. The zoning document just says you can do this in these places. It doesn't fill in all the blanks, you know, like I was trying to do with the security or not security, you know. It, so it, it, our tendency is going to be to try to answer every conceivable question about this in the zoning document. And I think, you know, I want to make that point. I think I'm right about that. Um, but, but without question, I, I mean, I had some general language that would, that would say, well, that this has to be a, a project that is supported and somehow sanctioned by the Department of Family and Community Services of the city of Albuquerque. Uh, Mr. President. That, and leaves that kind of general ability of rulemaking, which is what the administration typically does. Councilor Pena. Well, Mr. President, I wasn't done with my comments, and thank you. You're the second counselor at the head of the table to correct the two counselors and, and the end in terms of clarifying what their intention is. I understand that we're looking at a zoning document right now, but there is implications um, when we change the zoning and we haven't really identified how, because when we change the zoning, we're changing the zoning and it would allow for multiple uses, not just for encampments. You know, I asked the question earlier, if, let's say some group came from out of town and just decided that they wanted to do an encampment, um, they would be able to go to the city of Albuquerque and apply and, and, and be able to um, uh, start an encampment. So yeah, we do have to look at um, the overall picture, not just changing zoning, which is important um, in order to ensure that we can do this process, but we have to look at all, all aspects of how this is gonna benefit us. And you know, I don't wanna mislead the public into saying that you know when we've identified $750,000 to, um, to um, 
uh, work with nonprofits to do encampments, um, we should be assured that we have the resources to um, implement this citywide when we're talking about the, the magnitude and the level and amount of people that need these services when there's other counselors here who are also talking about the fact that there are other resources available like the, um, the Gateway Center, like um, other areas. So I just want to make sure that we're giving a clear picture of what we're trying to, to do here. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Any other comments? So that, that was uh, about the, the two <laughs> amendments that I did not move. So we'll go on to uh, what's next here. Uh, B7, um, and this has to do with um, uh, the zoning districts. I have a qu I'm not going to move this, but I have a question about it uh, for Ms. Schultz or for possibly Mr. Melendres. Um, what about the uh, church situation with regard to something like this? Are they exempt to something like this uh, potential amendment, which limits... Uh, it, it basically goes back from what LUPS did, which was to make it conditional everywhere. This makes it conditional in these main street corridors and centers where we're trying to get redevelopment to occur. Is the uh, Mr. Mr. President, um, yeah, I can answer that question. The because this is moving some of the zone districts from conditional to permissive, there's there's no issue with religious institutions there. At the Land Use Planning and Zoning Committee, there were already some exemptions if uh, the use was gonna be conditional in certain zones, so that's, that's not applicable here. Um, however, there is not an exception for the prohibition in downtown centers, main street areas, or urban centers. Um, I don't believe I'm taking a look at the original amendment as it was passed by the committee and those exemptions to some of the, the zoning district restrictions um, are, are specific to if it's a conditional use, if it's prohibited in pro proximity to residential areas. Um, but I, I don't think that religious institutions would be exempt from this, but I also see Ms. Morris has popped up and might, might have a clarification. Uh, All right, well, I, you know, I, I want to keep that question out there on any given amendment as we move forward with this because that's a pretty big question. Um, and and I, again, uh, I, I'm not prepared to move this because I'm still, <laughs> you know, I don't want to take us down a road that we've got to reverse at the next meeting, so I'm not going to be moving this, but I think it's worth discussion. And, and I brought it up because it is important that we redevelop our corridors and, and um, that we protect and redevelop places like downtown. So, I'm sorry, Petra is on and maybe she has some comments. Madam, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Council President um, Benson, yes, I, I just had a clarification. Um, although this amendment would say that it's prohibited in downtown centers, main street areas and urban centers, um, the underlying zoning for the churches, I believe, would, would kind of trump that, uh, sorry, religious institutions, um, because it does say that it's an allowed use um, when it's incidental to a, a church. And so because we don't prohibit churches in those areas, um, they would be kind of outside of this prohibition. All right. Thank you. That clarifies it. Um, so I'm not going to be moving this amendment, so I'd rather we not continue to debate it. Uh, Councillor Lewis, if you must. Mr. President, I, I must. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I just think these proposals are interesting. I mean, this, this specific proposal and things, and others like it, and I think there's a few others like it in this, and that is that um, they're saying that there are certain areas of the city that we're just, we don't think that... Uh, that these uh, you know safe outdoor spaces should go, and I, and I don't know why. I mean, I, well, I guess the reason why is because you want to see development along uh, in some of these areas. I want to see development in uh, in a lot of areas in District Five, um, and uh, and there's there's redevelopment areas in my district and in districts all over the city. Um, but but again, I mean, what this is what this is saying here is that there are so we want these places all over the city, but we don't want them in certain areas. Um, 
So I, I think this is another reason why we should, before we should do any of this, we should identify where we do want them, exactly where we want them, you know. Um, before we before we put this on the people of the city of Albuquerque, and so um, so I do, I do have an amendment to this amendment, but if you're not going to move it, I just want to put it on the record, or I'll amend it to another part of this uh, another amendment. Um, and I and I honestly, this I'm honest about this. This doesn't believe I don't believe this is any different than what you're proposing right here at all. And my amendment is that we would prohibit um, this would be prohibited within Council District Five. And so I, would, I just want to put that on the record that um, uh, that an amendment uh, that would prohibit uh, safe outdoor spaces in Council District Five, and for now let's just we'll just say it's an amendment to this amendment. It'll it'll just defer along with the, the bill. Yeah, and that's fine. That amendment is still out there for anyone to pick up and work with. I'd love to discuss it with you or anyone else. <laughs> so, Councillor Davis. I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Councillor Pena. Um, again, not germane, um, germane to the overall issue, not germane to this, and I, although you're not um, moving it either. Um, I just wanted to ask the question, and I think this would be for our next council meeting from the staff, just to find out how much it's costing us to, you know, operate at um, Coronado Park. That's both um, from solid waste, from the services that you're providing, any kind of, um, city services that are that are out there. I'd just like to know kind of generally what it's costing us to, to do what we're doing there, which is, yeah, thank you. Councilor Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And uh, I know you're not moving this, and so I just wanna ask if our staff can help us to inform our next conversation. Um, I think it would be helpful here, we're getting into that space where it's a permissible, not permissible, different parts of the city. Um, I know uh, Mr. Fran helped me this afternoon and, and we developed some of the maps about where it was permissive. And um, I would like to see if we could all add a map or some more guidance on not just the areas that the sponsor has mentioned, which are the downtown centers, Main Street and urban centers, but also in, to map out those other activity centers and employment centers, which are the other specialized centers identified in the comp plan and the IDO. Those were ones that at some point were considered special for some reason because they were small business targets, um, it, for what it's worth, the employment centers would include the Gibson Center, so that would eliminate the concern that this would somehow magically turn Gibson into a, a big camp uh, overnight, which we know is not the intent and the administration has said. Um, but if you could help us sort of map those out in a clearer way that we could have that discussion here um, so that we could all see what we're really talking about, um, I think that would help us uh, tremendously. Thank you. Mr. President and Councillor Davis, um, I do have a couple of maps that staff only received today. Well, um, and uh, these will be distributed to the council and posted to the website where the other um, documents for the amendments can be found. Cause I, I know it's not easy to see it in this format, uh, but the two maps that we've had made, uh, and I did take a note about your additional request, show uh, parcels in the city where a safe outdoor space could occur based on the amendment as it passed at LUPS um, so if, if you're able to squint hard enough at this map that I have here, any of these kind of red and tan parcels could be eligible if they could meet all those other use specific standards. And then the second map, which again, we will be sure to share in a larger format, um, shows the parcels that would be available for a safe outdoor space if Amendment B7 were to pass. Um, again, I've noted your additional request for, for that other map and we'll be sure to have that ready. Mr. President, thank you. Ms. Schultz, I knew you would anticipate our every need and I'm grateful that you got that started. Thank you. I might ask uh, Councilor Lewis that if he wants to put his uh, amendment prohibiting that in District 5, that perhaps he might consider an amendment that says that safe outdoor spaces will be prohibited in any district that has demonstrated it has no homelessness um, and has solved that problem for themselves. Um, otherwise, um, they would be allowed. Mr. President, so the purple area, could you explain that again? So, the, the, so these are prohibited in the purple area? Mr. President, Councillor Lewis, what this particular map shows is if Amendment B7 were to pass, um, as it was proposed by Councillor Benson, all the purple locations are where a safe outdoor space could occur. So all the, all the uh, gray areas and everywhere else, they cannot occur? Correct. The uh, Mr. President, Councilor Lewis, correct. Those parcels don't have the correct zoning uh, designation, or they can't meet the distance separation requirements set forth in the amendment um, as it's proposed. 
So I'd ask Councillor Davis, is there no homeless people that live in those areas? That we're prohibiting you know, the central corridor, the urban areas, all the other places that are listed in Amendment Number 7. Are there, are there no one that's in need of shelter in all of those areas? That's a massive part of the city that we're prohibiting them? Mr. President, I might point out that I didn't make this amendment and uh, I didn't make this map, but there's plenty of room there for those folks. And uh, I see lots of purple in my neighborhoods. Um, and we're already supporting uh, a number of these, like Tiny Home Village uh, and a number of other uh, pickup sites for like God's Warehouse for the shelters and others. And we're certainly doing our part and could uh, could use some help. But I think this is a good discussion for us in a couple of weeks because I don't think we're ready and the sponsor isn't ready to present the amendment. So uh, I hope we can move on because I want to remind my colleagues that it's been five hours and we haven't passed one bill tonight. And we yeah, have Mr. more. Mr. President, maybe we shouldn't be passing these bills at all. <laughs> you know, only worth the time. Well, these are these are amendments to a bill that's, that we do have to pass here before uh, before the uh, the July uh, recess. So um, it takes us, I believe, now to uh, Councillor Grout B eight, which would be Amendment Number Four. Um, I would like to move this one. I, I personally think that with all of these amendments to these to this ordinance, it still needs so much work. There are so many problems with it, and um, so we've all added on an amendment after an amendment. I'm very concerned. Um, I have heard from so many people in my district that are very very concerned. Right now, um, it would, this, this amendment would reduce the city council district cap from five to two, and it combines it with an, any conversions of non-residential uses to residential uses for affordable housing land use. Right now, district two, six, and nine bear a larger share of the burden of homelessness than anywhere else in the city. And I think if we're going to adopt safe outdoor spaces, they should be spread out evenly throughout the city. The purpose of this amendment is to ensure that safe outdoor spaces will not be concentrated in one area. When all nine council districts have their maximum, then we can look at expanding the program. So there's a motion. Is there a second? I'll second that for discussion purposes. Um, I personally do feel that five per council district is awful lot for it something is. that we're just getting started with and trying to figure out exactly how it's going to work. Councilor Jones. As we're sitting here accomplishing not much of anything, but taking a long time to do it, perhaps we should approach this just a little differently. Perhaps we could, not right now, please, but break off into two, or actually three study groups and come up with what we think ideally we would want and then try to find a place to put it. I think trying to fit a program into a place that we don't know where the place is, I think we're doing it backwards. It's like if you say you want a house, you, you, you want to know what you want in the house before you go look for where you're going to put the house. And I think what we're doing now is, is it's just spinning our wheels and we're not getting anywhere because we really don't know where we're going to put it. We're trying to say we need it in every district. Well, some of the districts might not be able to handle it. And maybe they, it, but maybe one district would want all of them. Who knows? Because we don't know what them is. We want them, but we don't have the specifications for the thems that we're wanting to build. We want it like Las Cruces, but we like what Denver has, and we want this and we want this. How big do we want them to be? We need to come up with sizes that are work best for the city of Albuquerque and the resources that we have. I think we're I think we need need to step back and get a grasp and a fairly good agreement from the counselors what we think we want to do to help with this issue. I don't have the answer, but I think that might be a little easier. A little make a little more sense in where we're going, if I may suggest it. Councillor Bassan. Mr. President, uh, while that makes sense, part of the first time we've made sense tonight, uh, at the same time, in the details, respectfully, 
Are we only allowed to do IDO amendments once a year anyway because the public says that we need to make sure to be transparent and they ask us to do that. So that's why I think we are chewing off these details right now. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty willing that like, I'm not a betting girl, but I'm pretty willing to bet that none of this passes because we won't agree, no matter if we do study sessions or not. But I hope some of it passes. Um, but I think that we're, we're really good at getting in our own way. And so if we have to wait till next year to do an IDO amendment for safe outdoor spaces, then, then I don't support study sessions because to me, that's a whole other year that we're not gonna even try something. Um, if we can do an amendment in two months or three months uh, to the IDO without royally angering all of the constituents, which that's also pretty inevitable at this point. Um, to me, like, how do we do our job without sitting here on a carousel of uselessness? All right. Well, uh there's a motion and a second for uh, this, which would, would be number four, correct? Councillor Lewis. So Mr. President, if we're going to vote on this amendment tonight, then I'm going to move an amendment to the amendment that this use is prohibited within City Council District 5. There's a motion that, uh, to amend, amend the amendment. Second, second, and I'll say the same thing about District 1. Is there a motion to, uh, is there a second to the motion? So, Mr. President, clarify that there's, a, there's an amendment proposed, um, uh, and I'll, it is to, that this prohibits this use within Council District 1, District 5, and then it was, I, I made the motion, and Councilor Sanchez seconded. You just add Council, you add, add the District 1 to that amendment that you see in front of you? All right, there's a motion and a second. And Mr. President, um, this, this is absolutely no different than the proposal um, that we talked about earlier, the, I believe it was B6, that, um, that recommends that these, these spaces are not in urban, urban areas or along Central Avenue. Some of these areas that we wanna see redevelopment, wanna see uh, other development, other usages. So I would just, again, I would just say there's absolutely no different um, uh, argument than than what than this amendment right here than some of these other amendments and proposals. So. Councilor Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. President. One of the things that I did learn is that everywhere um, these spaces were put, they were always regulated by the laws that were in place. They never added any extra rules. They just enforced the laws of the city that they're in and the state that they're in. And they were very strict about enforcing those laws. And that's what makes these things work. All right, there's a motion and a second on the floor. Is there further discussion? Okay, seeing none, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor, say yes and raise your hands. <laughs> this is on the, as stated by uh, Councillor Lewis. Mr. President, if there was a misunderstanding, it seems like a, some clarity that needs to be made. Oh, it's a, a, excuse me, it's an amendment to the amendment. Okay. Mr. President, yeah, this, this is an amendment to uh, Councillor Grout's Councilor amendment. Grout's amendment, excuse me. Yeah. And it uh, prohibits the use, the safe outdoor use of the, the, the entire okay. use in Council District 1 and District 5. Amendment to the amendment. So we, we, mo we moved uh, to, um, pass the amendment to this amendment. So the amendment to amendment number five is, number four, excuse me, is on uh, the table. So um, all those in favor of the amendment to the amendments, raise your hand and say yes. Yes. Opposed? That fails on a two to seven vote. We're back on the bill on the amendment. Number four, any further discussion on the, this is on the reduction from five to two per council districts. All those in favor say yes. Mr. President. Councilor Lewis. I just want to say I, I oppose this bill. Um, and, bill. Um, and you know, I, I think it should be known that uh, the rest of the council you know, voted to, 
put these safe outdoor spaces in one and five. You know, um, and, uh, and I certainly am not voting to put them in your districts. All right, so we're uh, back on the amendment. Uh, all those in favor say yes and raise your hand. Yes. One. Opposed? No. And. Mr. President, I apologize, uh, but the vote was not clear. And so if we could call for that vote again so we could record. Okay. This we're is. Voting. We're on Councillor Grout's amendment number four, which reduces the maximum number from five to two per district. All those uh, in support, say yes and raise your hand. Yes. Opposed? And that fails on a four to, four to five? Correct, four to five fail it. All right. Now we're back on other matters, pre-application review team meetings. Uh, this is Councillor Lewis and Sanchez. M Mr. President, um, if I may, there was one amendment proposed in the packet on uh, Friday afternoon that is related to safe outdoor spaces. Um, it is a little bit out of order. It's labeled B15. And if we might be able to take up that matter while we were still on the topic of safe outdoor spaces, um, that, that might be preferable to the council. All right, well, why don't you explain number 15 then? Uh, Mr. President and counselors, you should have an amendment in the back of your packet uh, labeled B15 related to um, safe outdoor spaces that proposes to prohibit the first five safe outdoor spaces that are permitted anywhere in the city um, if uh, from occurring in areas that have a high score on the city's social vul vulnerability index map. Uh, that high score is determined to be a score of between 0.8 and 0.1. I believe in the amendment itself, um, the metrics are listed for what, what uh, considers an area, a high area of vulnerability. And I can show a map to you now, again, that I can provide in a larger format um, on the website and to the counselors. All of the areas uh, depicted in red, all of these tracts, are um, the first five safe outdoor spaces would not be able to occur in these red areas. So the, um, the question about the index, the index is based upon, can you give me the uh, data again? I can, um, I will need just a moment to pull that amendment up myself. Okay, thank you for your patience. Uh, Mr. President, uh, this is a map that was created, that is created and managed by the city's Office of Equity, Equity and Inclusion. And the following variables um, are taken into account with the vulnerability index. Folks are census tracts that are below poverty, poverty, unemployed, income levels, uh, no high school diploma, uh, tracts that have populations that are aged 65 or older, aged 17 or younger, older than age five with a disability and single parent households, um, minority majority status, uh, tracks that have a high population of those who speak English, uh, what's considered less than well, and then um, some more physical characteristics that go into the vulnerability index are tracks with a high uh, number of multi-unit structures, mobile homes, uh, what the census deems as crowding, uh, tracks where folks do not own vehicles and tracks with a high population of group quarters. So it's a conglomeration of all of those data points put together that gets you to that score of zero to one and anything that's between point, any tract that is between 0.8 and one is considered high, is depicted in red on this map. And the first five safe outdoor spaces in the city would not be able to be located there. Councilor Davis, then Councilor Lewis. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I appreciate the sponsor for this. I, I totally understand where you're coming from, I, I believe, but I would like to ask the sponsor to explain if she could tell us a little bit. I, I see some of those vulnerabilities in here and not wanting to, to overburden neighborhoods, but I, does, I am concerned, and I hope the sponsor could tell me or convince me otherwise, I'm concerned that it would essentially prohibit these early projects in the neighborhoods, quite frankly, the way we're seeing the higher density of folks needing more services, um, including her district, Councilor Den Denton's and my own, um, and we, I know we, we've been champions for these services. I wonder if you could tell us about your intent. Um, the intent is really just historically, usually when things like this happen, if you just look at, um, um, you know, just systemic racism and how it's impacted. I mean, there was a story just by uh, Larry Barker not too long ago about how zoning impacted communities of color because of how they disproportionately put some of these um, uh, people out of, out of uh they zoned them out just because of their their color and and um, and poverty and and all these statistics. So I've just looked at it like I support this, but you know I just think that if we're going to do it, we should look at areas outside of areas that are already compacted, um, compounded by um, services like this. I live in Alamosa Neighborhood Association. I have probably like six, I think, um, actually affordable not affordable housing, the Section 8, these other, which I support. They, my neighbors lived with them forever, but you know, these, these types of projects end up being in neighborhoods like ours. And they, um, and I just think that we should, if we're really gonna do it, and we really want this to be a citywide project and we're really putting our, mm -hmm. our, our money where our mouth is, then we really need to um, do what we said we were gonna do and we're gonna have them in all nine council districts. All right, any discussion? C Councilor Lewis. Mr. President, so, so, so Councilor Pena has reasons that she does not want them in big parts of her district. You know, Mr. President, you have reasons for big sections of your district that you don't want these in. If we were to take that map right there, in fact, if we were to take all the maps that we've seen tonight and overlay them, in fact, I'd like to see that actually. I'd like to see an overlay map with all these amendments that shows we're all in the city that these are prohibited and they're, I, I, bet, I bet they're gonna be mostly in my district. You know? I bet they're gonna be mostly in, in these, some of these other areas. They're certainly not in, in the areas downtown and, and uh, Councilor Pena's district and others. I mean, there's some strong opinions on where you all feel like they shouldn't go. I guess uh, I definitely wanna see where, I mean, then the people of the city need to certainly see too where, where they're gonna end up if all these, uh, if all these amendments pass. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, while I totally understand the uh, intent with this amendment, and I have the sh I share the same concerns as Councilor Pena about communities of color, um, I just have the opposite concern that we have um, a high number of people of color, Native Americans that are experiencing homelessness, and if we start saying that you can only be in the safe outdoor spaces if it's in other spots, and you have to be driven there like we do with WEC, um, we are gonna be excluding people who need these services. So for that reason, I won't be supporting this amendment, but I do share the concern that we need to make sure that we're taking care of our communities of color. Thank you. Mr. President, if I could just add to that. So this isn't saying that we cannot have them in these locations. This is just saying that when we initially start out, let's not start out in the communities that are always, where they always start out at, right? So <laughs> that's all I'm saying. So. Um, this is the first five, if we're having 45, and was that the total, 45? There's gonna be plenty of opportunity to put them in other districts, <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> Especially Councilor Lewis's. <laughs> All right, there was, there was a, was there a second? Was there a motion? So. I'd like to make a motion for. All right, At, this is number five. Amendment is number five. Second? The second one, Councilor Bassan. Any further discussion? Councilor Bassan. Mr. President, I just, I, I, I have to clarify that all these barriers are gonna prevent us from doing anything, and I think Councilor Lewis pretty much just said that too. So for that reason, even though I will not work, I will, I will work to not implement the first five in any of those red zones, I will not support this bill. All right, there's a motion and a second. All those, uh, this would be for uh, floor amendment number five. 
All those in favor, say yes and raise your hand. Opposed? Yeah. And that fails on a one to nine, I believe. One to eight, excuse me. <laughs> one to eight, all right. Okay, now we'll b go back, uh, Ms. Schultz, on the other remaining IDO amendments. Uh, Mr. President, thank you. That brings us back to Amendment B-9, labeled pre-application review team meetings. Um, this amendment proposes to remove the requirement that pre-application review team, also called PRT, meetings um, be required for many applications in the IDO. The IDO today does require a PRT meeting for, for most application types. Um, that's a meeting between the applicant and the city prior to submitting an application. Um, it's kind of a, a non-binding, more casual conversation where an applicant, especially perhaps an applicant who is not familiar with the city's regulations or the review and approval process, uh, can come to the city and say, here's generally what I'm thinking about doing on my property. Please tell me the requirements that will be applicable to me and, and which body I need mm -hmm. to go before to receive approval. Um, again, those are non-binding conversations that just aim to inform an applicant prior to their submittal. Um, this amendment would remove those as a requirement. They would still be voluntary. The department will still offer them and have a mechanism to offer them, uh, but not everyone would have to do them um, if, they, if they don't want to, with the exception of five application types. So while this amendment proposes to strike the PRT requirement for most application types, there's five that would still stay in place um, because those, those application types really do need a pre-conversation prior to submittal. And those five actions are listed on the bullet point here, that bullet points here, they are also listed in the amendment itself. They are largely related to subdivision actions um, and actions on properties that are in designated historic areas. Uh, those two kind of buckets of decisions tend to be very complex and do warrant a conversation between the applicant and the city prior to application. Um, there was a little bit of misunderstanding from the public about this amendment when it was first discussed. There is a entirely separate requirement for many applications that an applicant have a meeting with uh, an applicable neighborhood association prior to submitting their application. Um, I think there was some concern from the public that that meeting was proposed to be stricken through this amendment. Uh, and for the record, I'll say that that requirement uh, will remain untouched this amendment is not addressing those meetings between the applicant and the public, only the pre-application meetings between the applicant and the city. And with that, I'll stand for questions. And Ms. Schultz, a quick question. Uh, one can still uh, request a PRT meeting. These are just the ones where it would, this would limit the ones where it's required. Uh, Mr. President, that's correct. They would still remain voluntary. So even for the decisions that they are being stricken for as required, if an applicant is coming in for one of those decisions and did want to have that, that preliminary conversation, uh, the department would still would still do that. Yeah, because I mean, I, in my own professional experience, the PRT was very helpful on many projects. I'm not sure they were only this, this uh, group of five. Councilors, uh, other? Councilor President, I'll move the amendment. Okay, so there's a motion and a second from Councilor Sanchez for the amendment. And uh, I'm supportive of this amendment. I, I think it, uh, I think what we found is we were we were requiring so many of these that it lost its, its value, that it kind of got uh, watered down in the, uh, in the flood. Any other discussion, counselors? It's been moved and seconded. And this will be number six. All right. All those in favor, say yes and raise your hand. Yes. Opposed? And that passes unanimously. All right. We'll go to what's labeled B10, Councillor Davis and Ms. Schultz. Mr. President and Councillor Davis, this amendment proposes to add some additional requirements for when text amendments to the IDO are submitted as a part of the IDO annual update process. What this would call for is when the planning department um, goes to put their list of amendments together or when council staff is working on amendments for counselors later on in the review and approval process that 
um, some, some information will be required to accompany each individual amendment. That information includes the page of the IDO that is proposed to be amended, the section number and the heading of the IDO uh, that the amendment is proposing um, to revise, and lastly, a summary uh, for each amendment to explain the intent of that amendment, the origin of that amendment, and the need for that amendment. Councillor Davis. Mr. President, I'd like to move this as floor amendment number seven. Thanks. Mr. President, if I may, I think this is a, a, a no-brainer for us. It makes our the IDO just a little more user-friendly, particularly for residents that are trying to navigate this. Uh, it actually came up through a number of neighborhood associations, uh, including Ms. Wilson at Victory Hills and the District 6 Coalition, but most important to me, it helps me understand when I'm trying to glance through all these what they actually do, which is probably what most of us just look at, and so it just ensures that the public gets some more of that. All right, any other discussion? We'll go to a vote then. This is amendment number seven. All those in favor, say yes and raise your hand. Opposed? All right. That, that passes unanimously. All right, we'll go on to what's labeled B11, which if moved would be number eight, Councillor Jones. Mr. President and Councillor Jones, um, Amendment B11 proposes some additional cannabis provisions on a citywide level. Uh, so this would be distinct from the um, cannabis amendment we discussed in Old Town earlier this evening. Uh, this would do three things. First, it would require that if a cannabis retailer is going to have an on-site consumption area, as, as the state does allow them to do, those areas would have to be conducted within a fully enclosed portion of a building. It would limit the retail size of the cannabis retail use to 10,000 square feet in the MXT, that's the Mixed Use Transition Zone District. And lastly, it would require that if an applicant is seeking approval for a cannabis cultivation use or a cannabis derived products manufacturing use that they must provide a letter of availability from the Albuquerque Bernalillo County Water Utility Authority. Uh, I'll stand for questions on this one. Questions, Councillor? Not for me. Uh, this is just kind of a cleanup, and as I understand it, the Water Authority a letter of availability is required whether we put it in this or not. Is that correct, Ms. Schultz? Uh, Mr. President and Councillor Jones, when the state is doing their permitting um, for these cannabis uses, applicants are required to provide it to the state as a part of their approval process. So uh, theoretically, that documentation should already exist. Um, and would not necessarily be a new requirement, uh, but something that the city would like to see in addition to what the applicant has provided to the state. Thank you. And councilors, I urge your support. Councilor Bassan. Mr. President, uh, we need a motion in a second uh, before a vote happens. Um, um, make a motion to approve uh, B8. Amendment 8. Amendment 8. Mm -hmm. There's a motion. Is there a second? I think Basan second. Second. And it has a comment. Okay. And then, and then I have a comment. Okay. Councilor Basan. Thank you, Mr. President. Councilor Jones, I don't know if you'd be willing to um, yeah. wait on this one and defer it until the, I, the next meeting for council. And the reason is because while I understand that we don't necessarily want to walk by an outdoor patio and have people smoking and having the aroma of cannabis. Uh, people drink on outdoor patios and people smoke cigarettes on outdoor patios, but what's to say that maybe we shouldn't look into those that are eating edibles and cookies where there's not necessarily an aroma. So the indoor factor on this, while we're also talking about the legality on a statewide issue, I think that maybe even though the city has its own ability to come up with its specific rules in regards to this, I wonder if maybe there's some fine tuning that can go to where maybe it's if it's for any kind of, I don't even know the right term other than smoking, but if it's inhalation of some sort, then you need to be indoors where there's proper ventilation. But if it's in another um, uh, consumption area that is allowed, then perhaps we should, we should make sure that that's doable too. I understand what you're saying. However, this was requested by planning 
So I guess they are going to have to uh, respond to that. Director Varela. And uh, President Benton, Councilors, uh, Councilor Bassan, you have read my mind. I have been on the phone with <laughs> regulation and licensing for the last two weeks. The Cannabis Regulation Act contemplated two types of consumption area licenses, one for smoking and vaping and the other for other forms of ingestion, which is basically eating cannabis and in whatever form or putting into, I guess, mixed drinks that they're doing now. Uh, regulation and licensing has uh, lost interest in issuing those two different types of cannabis licenses, it appears, and it could be because they're just simply overwhelmed with uh, other issues that they're having now with compliance and uh, trying to shut down some, uh, some moldy farms and some other major life-threatening situations. Uh, but I, I do agree that there should be a distinction, and we would have no objection to a deferral for a couple of weeks while we, as a city, take that on ourselves to figure that out since our LD uh, appears to not be uh, available for us to make that distinction. But I think that's an important distinction. And you're exactly right. What people care about is walking by, you know, think of the, the Kelly's site on Knob Hill, some big patio uh, in a very family area. We wouldn't want to be smelling a cigar bar there. We wouldn't want to be smelling a hookah bar, cigarettes, or uh, people smoking um, cannabis either. So we, we have no objection to that. I do also want to state that Las Cruces, which recently opened a cannabis consumption area, did state that all cannabis consumption areas must be indoors. So they went ahead and just went for what is in uh, Councillor Jones's amendment tonight. But I think if Albuquerque wants to lead the way and take some time to try to make that distinction, uh, the planning department is fine with that. Councillors, we're going to need to suspend the rules to uh, continue the meeting. I'll move that we suspend the rules until 11 p.m. Second. There's a motion and a second. All those in favor say yes and raise your hands. Yes. Opposed? <laughs> that passes unanimously. All right, so we're uh, back on the bill. Um, any other questions for the director while he's up there? Mm -hmm. Councillor Davis. Really quickly, Mr. President, thank you. Um, and I want to make a, a, a point and a distinction. I think this is a technical cleanup to, to align us with the state's rules, and so I don't see any conflict here that, that impacts any of those things. Uh, I might ask uh, Director Varela and, uh, and the sponsor if we are going to defer uh, to check on the current rules. I believe on May 1st, they no longer require water uh, for cannabis for uh, manufacturing. Um, as long as it doesn't involve the use of water in manufacturing other than like a regular edibles. And so um, I think those rules are still under the emergency process and, and coming to go. But I wonder if we ought to look at some language that just says consistent with state use or whatever, because I pretty, my experience with the water authority is that they're overwhelmed as well with these water availability letters that, that someone could satisfy with just a, a water bill in their name, for example. So I, I wonder if we couldn't work on that as well. If uh, the administration has no problem with this, I have no, I have no issue with deferring this for two weeks. Mr. President, uh, just a point of order. Um, since it's not an individual bill that you're dealing with and it's amendment, the proper method would be to just withdraw the motion for now. And then you could make another motion at the next, assuming that, assuming that the underlying bill is deferred, you'd have the opportunity to raise a different amendment next time. I just got the okay nod on that. I would make a motion to withdraw. Okay, so um, we'll, we'll, as I was saying, I, would, I was reserving the right to move some of the ones that I had, uh, but I didn't defer them because I didn't need to. So they're still out there, <laughs> as will be this one. Uh -huh. All right, so now we're on B12. Councillor Lewis is a major public, public open space definition. Mr. President and Councillor Lewis, Amendment B-12 proposes to amend the definition in the IDO for major public open space to clarify uh, that something is not considered major public open space until it has the proper zoning designation. The IDO has two zone districts that are specific to major public open space. Those are listed here. That's the NRPOB zone district and the NRPOC zone district, the distinction between those two being whether that major public open space is owned or managed by the city or by an outside entity. Um, it's important that that definition uh, clarify that something is not considered major public open space uh, until it has that 
proper zoning de designation to ensure that uh, when the city does acquire or start managing new major public open space, that proper notification is conducted to nearby property owners uh, to, to make them clear that, that their um, entitlements might be changing with the city's acquisition of major public open space. Mr. So President, I move the amendment. Is, uh, there's a motion, is there a second? Second, Councilor Grout, thank you. And this will be number nine, amendment number nine. Mr. President, it's just a, this really is just to give clarity, a definition of open space and give clarity, clarity to, um, you, know, to you know, notice and predictability in that regard. So. All right, any uh, discussion, Councilors? Seeing none, let's go to a vote. All those in favor, say yes and raise your hand. Yes. yes. Opposed? Uh, and there's, uh, that was a eight to one. Now we'll be on uh, B13. This is Councilor Pena, and this is a replacement of the Development Review Board, Ms. Schultz. Mr. President and Councilor Pena, Amendment B13 proposes to replace the Development Review Board. There is about a 65 or so page exhibit uh, that accompanies this amendment where uh, members of the public and counselors can review specifically the text in the IDO that will change as a part of this amendment. Um, the proposal here is to replace the, Deve the Development Review Board or the DRB with a new body called the Development Hearing Officer that would be um, a DHO person. This amendment goes on to kind of specify uh, what that DHO would be responsible for, uh, what type of position that would be, the qualifications that the DHO must have, um, etc. So the, the DRB today is about a five or six member board of technical city staff members. Uh, folks with expertise in transportation planning and parks and recreation and grading and drainage, etc. Uh, those folks um, make up a board where applicants bring uh, a request to each of those kind of technical folks um, reviews and analyzes that request based on their technical expertise. And then they also make the decision on that request. And that is that is very unique to any review and approval body uh, within the planning department. There is no other review and approval body where um, there is a public hearing held where city staff members uh, both analyze the request and make the final determination. Um, the city staff members in this case are wearing two hats and this amendment kind of seeks to separate those hats. So moving forward, if this amendment were to pass, the DHO person uh, would still conduct a public hearing. Um, they would receive staff support from the, those existing staff members on the development review board would, would act as staff members supporting that DHO person. Um, they would uh, provide a staff report of some type to the development hearing officer for an application, provide that person with a recommendation on whether they feel the, the application should be approved or denied based on the technical requirements um, that the application either met or didn't meet. Uh, the DHO would hold a public meeting, uh, they would take public testimony, and then issue a final determination. Um, this amendment seeks to kind of expedite some of our review and approval processes. Uh, the development review board takes, I think on average, about four hearings to uh, provide an approval to an applicant. The thought behind this is that a development hearing officer um, might be able to provide a more expedited review because city staff members will be able to meet with applicants uh, in the off weeks when, when the DHO hearing officer is not, not meeting. And a lot of those kind of technical questions um, or technical discrepancies between the applicant and the city can be worked out behind the scenes, not at the public hearing, so that by the time the application actually reaches the public hearing, um, you've got kind of a clean request before the DHO uh, and, and hopefully that um, approval can be uh, reached a little more quickly. This is a, a pretty big change in the IDO, hence the, the major exhibit um, that's be behind this amendment. Um, and I, I'd stand for any questions about this one. Uh, Councilor Pena, do you wanna move it first before we continue the discussion? Yeah, I'd move a due pass of amendment, floor amendment number 10. I'll second that for purposes of discussion. Councillor uh, Jones. 
Yes, thank you. I think this is one of those things that should help to speed up a process become far, far too lengthy. And as we all know, in the construction business or development business or business business, time is money. And we need to get this one handled a little more expertly and efficiently. So I uh, would urge your support. All right, other discussion. I see uh, Director Varela there, and want to certainly hear from him on this. Council President Benton, Councilors, sponsors, this is perhaps the biggest proposed change to the IDO in the several years that I've been with the legal department, DMD, or now as a planning director. I first heard about this uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, this was not an administration proposal by any means. This came directly from city council's planning staff. And I can tell you that I was a little surprised this evening to hear two things. One I knew, which is the community members, the neighborhood associations, all spoke against it. And we have to, of course, maintain balance between the community and neighborhood associations and the development community. The development community, uh, as represented by NAOP, said that it was uh, received uh, in a lukewarm sort of fashion. And I think that that could be because of the speed at which this appears to be happening. Not because it's the worst idea in the world by any means. I th I've always said if we can speed things up, get to either a faster yes or a faster no with options for developers and maintain the neighborhood protections, then those are always good changes. But for this perhaps the largest change, is, change in the IDO uh, history since its inception to be introduced literally the last month of about a 12-month process for amending the IDO could, uh, could result in us acting perhaps a bit too hasty. Now, if perhaps there was a six-month implementation on it, uh, that could help out. But 90-day uh, proposed implementation when we still have to work out all the kinks, we have to repurpose be the staff that I have because that development review board team, uh, that's not their only job. They're actually all experts and professionals, as was mentioned earlier, engineers and such, design experts. Uh, they will become a development coordination team. Uh, would need to make sure that they could do that in a very smooth transition fashion. We have appeals, or I should say applications that are pending now in front of the DRB. Uh, so there'd be a little bit of some confusion there. And we also have a large development community who is, even though they don't love it, very used to the current process and successful at it. So I think if we had perhaps more time here that this may be a really good idea, but to bring it in in the 11th month and say you've got 90 days to do it, I do worry about successful implementation. Thank you for that perspective, Mr. Director. Um, I, I think there's some, I, this is something I've talked about with staff as well, and, you know, one big concern of the, the, of the IDO as well, that, that the DRB being a staff, basically a party of staff experts, it, is still being tasked with things that in the past would have been considered almost quasi-judicial. You're not supposed to even say that right here. <laughs> anyway, but, but but I mean, you know, there there have been concerns about it, uh, you know, since the adoption of the idea. Yeah, and, and President uh, Benton, uh, you, you're exactly right. So the, uh, like I said, not the worst idea in the world, probably a very good idea if we take the time to implement it correctly. I think that if that 90 days were changed to six months, uh, I would be entirely comfortable knowing that we could actually uh, repurpose and retool the uh, DRB into a DRB, you know, a development coordination team. Uh, we also have to get somebody under contract uh, since it would be a quasi-judicial function. They wouldn't be just some employee that I can appoint to that position. Yeah. Would have to go out for an RFP or an RFI, uh, find somebody who has the engineering, construction, and perhaps legal background, get them under contract. When you're dealing with a professional at that level, they don't simply give two weeks notice to their prior employer and then come on board, uh, they usually have to give a few months notice. So we would need more time. I do think that, uh, I do think it's a good idea. And I do think that, uh, that both the development community and the neighborhood association community 
uh, if they can participate in the discussion of how we're going to implement this several months down the road, uh, would come to perhaps agree that it is a, a very good idea. Thank you, Mr. Director. Councilor Bassan, then Councilor Jones, then Councilor Sanchez. Mr. President, Councilor Pena, would you be willing to wait to move this amendment until two weeks from now so that there can be time to, I know we're all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed right now, but that way we can digest it. I am in support of this uh, at this point, but I also can understand some of the concerns. Um, but I am in support of it. I just wonder how, how you may want to proceed with six months, 90 days, three months, however that may end up looking tomorrow morning after um, a little more thought. But at the same time, to give us two weeks might behoove us. Mr. Mr. President, um, yeah, I mean, I, we can wait two weeks till, till the next time we have this meeting, but I definitely think this is something that we need to do, you know, when we have our city employees who are kind of, you know, reviewing cases, making the rules, and then implementing the rules. There's really some issues there. And then um, in addition to that, you know, we really need to figure out ways to streamline the development process. And this is something that has become way, way too cumbersome in terms of uh, development in our community. So. Um, expediting um, and streamlining, streamlining, I think, is, is probably paramount in terms of, of making sure that this happens. But really, you know, putting all that um, all that on just one body, I just don't think that that is a it's a disservice to to our de the development community when they're trying to make sure that they can get something um, done. Um, I would love to just pass it tonight, but if uh, the will of the council is to defer it for two weeks. I don't have a problem with that. Thank you. So let's finish the discussion at least. Uh, Councillor uh, Jones and then Councillor Sanchez. Um, thank you. Um, actually, I think I would like to defer this. Uh, I would like to defer this, make a motion to defer this for 30 days. We don't, we don't need to make a motion. Okay. Yeah. But we'll just, it's still there. Uh, okay. That, but if Councillor uh, Pena doesn't want to move it, then it'll still be there. Uh, Councillor uh, Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'm actually with uh, Councilor Bassan on this. I think we need to defer it. Also, um, there's some really good things that we need to move forward on this IDO, um, and I don't think Safe Outdoor Spaces is, is ready to rock. I think we should actually separate the IDO from safe, or safe Outdoor Spaces out of the vote because there's some good things there, and I think um, we need to balance this particular amendment out as well. Just a quick comment. All right, any other discussion on that uh, amendment? And that one will be held until uh, our next meeting. And uh, what are we Mr. Up President, left? it may be m more appropriate for when Council Pena comes back for her to withdraw her motion. That's a practice we've been using uh, when we've had a motion in the second uh, and you're declining to act on it tonight. Council Pena, are you withdrawing your motion on amendment number 10? Yes, and then we'll hear it again in two weeks. Thank you. All right, very good. Thank you for that clarity, Mr. Melendres. So that's the one with all the pages. What's left? <laughs> 14. Um, oh, overnight shelters. OK. <laughs> We're not done yet. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Feeblecorn has uh, B14. Ms. Ms. Uh, Schultz to explain it. Uh, Mr. President, Councillor Feeblecorn, this is Amendment B-14. This is the final amendment in the packet, to, to my knowledge. Um, this would propose to make some changes to uh, where overnight shelters are allowed to occur. Um, the primary proposal is that they would become permissive in the MXH zone district. As the IDO annual update sits today, they are proposed to remain conditional. So this would take it from conditional to permissive. Uh, there would be a new added requirement that overnight shelters require an operations plan to be submitted with the application to the city. And then there is some cleanup work done on the definition of an overnight shelter um, to kind of better and more accurately describe what an overnight shelter is. Um, and to be clear about the distinction of an overnight shelter to, to similar land uses of the IDO. And I'll stand, stand for questions on that. Questions on uh, what's labeled B14? Councillor Feeblecorn. Thank you, Mr. President. No questions. I just um, 
want to let folks know that we're not, I'm not planning on moving this tonight. Um, there are some legal questions that would require an um, executive session. And in the interest of time, um, we're going to put that off for the two weeks period. Thanks. All right. Thank you. So that's not being moved tonight. Councilor Lewis. Mr. President, I would just make a, or I guess just ask a question or make a suggestion. If there, if there is a way to separate uh, these amendments or even, I don't know how to separate, if we could vote on this bill separately with the different amendments related to the living spaces and safe outdoor spaces and all the other amendments that are unrelated, this, this really does seem like it's kind of log rolling. I mean, these are, these are, you know, not, I guess not to, I'm not criticizing it in that way, but I'm just saying that I'm describing it that these are such different, you know, issues that we're dealing, that we're going to ultimately vote on with one vote. Um, they're, and they're so different. I think there's some, some good, you know, cleanup bills, good changes to the IDO, cleanup amendments. Uh, and then there's the, uh, you know, the other issue that's specifically related, you know, to a major change in, in, uh, in how we operate, you know, and what we do in our, in our city regarding, you know, unsheltered and so, is there a way that we could, I mean, what would be the, is there a clean way or is there a good way that we can separate out those two issues within amendments to the IDO and still vote on those changes to the IDO, but do them separate, completely separately? Mr. President, Councilor Lewis, so the baseline where we start um, for that question is that uh, the safe outdoor spaces concept exists within the IDO now, and so that, that is within the bill. Um, to the extent that there was an amendment to this bill that uh, severed that out, um, it would be possible. Well, I guess the, the IDEO also contemplates that major amendments to it will happen through this annual update process. Um, that is not necessarily the, the only way to amend the IDEO, um, but I think it's worth noting that the public generally accepts that that's when the major amendments will come through. Um, that said, it would be possible to amend the IDO outside of the annual update process. However, that would require um, the sponsorship and initiation of a new bill, which would go back to the EPC and start the process all over again. Um, and so that would be a, a sort of long time frame before it came back to the council, and it would involve, um, again, a review and recommendation by the EPC, a transmission back to council, a trip through LUPS, um, and then before it gets back here. So, I mean, in general, the annual update is gonna begin for next year, right very soon after you vote on this bill. Um, that could probably proceed a little bit sooner if it was a, a separate proposal, um, but it is de definitely a lengthy process that you'd be looking at in order to uh, separate them out. No, thanks, Mr. President. And, and there's just a, unfortunately, now, now we're in a position where we're ultimately gonna vote on this bill and it's just such a wide range of disagreement on it, you know, with our community. And I mean, there's some things that we're absolutely together on and there what reasons why we would all vote to amend the IDO. And then there's other reasons why we would just absolutely be in polar opposites. And so is the city too. And, uh, but I think, I guess we're in that situation right now where we're gonna have to take that kind of a vote eventually. Yeah, I would agree with that, uh, Councilor Lewis. And, um, you know, this, this bill, Actually, this uh, B14 actually has language that kind of gets to what my point, well, the point I was trying to make earlier, that, that this zoning permissiveness is different from the city saying, we're going to do 45 of these. Um, the zoning permissiveness is just something that runs with the land, and it would make it, uh, it would enable the creation of one of these or more. But it's still up to the city to say whether we really want to sanction these. Um, and, and I don't know if there's a way to, to finesse that, but this, this actual language that, that uh, uh, Councilor Feeblecorn has in here, that this use requires an operations plan to be submitted that shall be provide the minimum administrative policies and procedures, security protocols, and contact information. That's where I was talking about, well, maybe that, that would be someone who would review that. That might be the Family and Community Services Department, or maybe not. Maybe it would just be the planning department, or maybe it would be someone else. But, but I mean, I think this is the, the difficulty of what we're working with, with, with this issue of the, of the unhoused and, and people who need transitional housing and, and special housing, you know, uh, supportive housing as well, that um, uh, it's a bad, it, it has to be dealt with in the zoning code. 
but it's a bad fit for the zoning code in terms of a place to debate the idea. And I think that's, that's kind of what we're struggling with. That's just my take on that. But, uh. All right, so does that end our work for tonight? So we'll, um, I'll go ahead and move a deferral on this until the, until the 14th, right? And that's, I've got a second on that. Mr. President, a two-week deferral would put you at May 16th. So there's a motion and a second for deferral till the 16th. All those in favor say yes and raise your hand. Yes. Opposed? And that passes. All right. Well. That's one bill. <laughs> that's one. Yeah. yeah. Here we we deferred it. it. We did it. And we <laughs> deferred it. <laughs> All right. So. Um, All right, um, I'll move 017. This is designated Bur uh, Burles Community Center as a city landmark. I move a due pass. There's a motion and a second from Councilor Feeblecorn. Thank you. And uh, I think, I, I hope everybody knows the Burles uh, Community Center. I don't know if we have anyone from staff who wants to speak to this, but um, uh, it's an amazing building. It was built in the during the WPA days, and I think it was a WPA project or one of those, those uh, uh, depression era work 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 uh, workforce uh, uh, type project, and it's, a, it's an Adobe building, pretty amazing building. I had the pleasure of working on it myself on little projects over the years, but uh, something that's really important to the community, and uh, I think it's worthy as a city landmark. Any other discussion or administration want to speak to this? If not, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, say yes and raise your hand. Yes. Opposed? That passes unanimously. Take us to uh, item D, Councilor Pena, R10. Thank you, Mr. President. R10 is directing the city to develop an enhanced recycling program, creating a plastic bag task force calling for a monthly Solid Waste Management Recycling Report and Expanding Litter Removal Services. I move it to pass. There's a motion and a second from Councilor Bassan. Uh, and any discussion? Is anyone signed up to speak? There is someone signed up to speak. Uh, let's Mr. go ahead then. Mr. President, we have two speakers. We have uh, Trevor Selby here in the chambers, followed by Rosemary Blanchard on Zoom. Mr. President. If the speakers each have two minutes, that'll be around six, and we have about seven minutes before the meeting ends, so you may want to consider extending. Yeah, uh, I'll move. Uh, we suspend the rules. Uh, not how far we're going to get here. Let me just look really quickly. Uh, um, yeah, let's let's uh, let's suspend the rules until the uh, quarter after eleven. So there's a motion and a second. All those in favor, say yes. Yes. Opposed. I heard it. <laughs> Is that Brad Winter I heard out there? Uh, thank you, that passes. Yes, sir. Good evening, Council, President uh, Benton, and members of this uh, Council. I'm Trevor Selby. Currently, my pronouns are they and them. I support R10 and want this Council to support R10 in order to expand the city's recycling program. Section 1C outlines an education program that will reduce the avoidable destructive practices that result in recyclable materials filling landfills. Furthermore, R10 will improve our understanding and recycle, uh, of recycle and waste management through this, the creation of a report. Using this improved data and the proposed city-owned recycling plant, we can make some of the simplest and necessary efforts to curb the developing and ongoing climate catastrophe. Lastly, R10 will expand city employment through the Clean City Project, cleaning litter, in our poorest neighborhoods, we'll send the message that marginalized, ma marginalized lives matter. There is an undue burden on our marginalized communities who are most greatly impacted by both climate catastrophe and litter. I ask this committee council to support R10 for the benefit of our planet and people. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rosemary Blanchard. Okay, I'm unmuted. 
There you, you go. Are. I had almost forgot I signed up for this one too, but it's important. Uh, I understand that the council has determined that you're not prepared to continue the plastic bag ban. And while I wish you had, I understand your your logic. But if we're going to if we're going to still have single use plastics among us, then we need to take a look at what we're doing. We need to study, make our recycling more effective than it is now. And we do need to know on an ongoing basis how plastics are impacting our environment and the quality of our lives. So I hope you will approve this or this proposed ordinance and uh, let us try to get a handle on this wretched plastic. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. President, that concludes public comment. All right, we're back on the bill, which has been moved and seconded. Any discussion? We have a director, uh, Mr. President, Director right. Whelan. Very good. Uh, director Whelan, there you are. Hi, Council. Yeah, <clears throat> sorry I couldn't be there in, in person, uh, but that's, I guess, one of the good things about Zoom. Nowadays, you can get in from whatever. I just want to say, you know, we've worked with Councilor Pena on this legislation. Um, we've put in some work with her, and I think we have. This is a good. Um, <clears throat> this is a good legislation to lay out groundwork on how we can move forward, especially with the task force uh, addressing plastic bags. So um, we stand for any questions, and a lot of the things that are in this legislation were already in the works of completing, and we look forward to just moving forward and seeing how we can better serve the, the residents of Albuquerque when it comes to recycling. We um, we constantly do education, but we've already wanted to do more education, especially when it comes to younger uh, kids and <clears throat> at the elementary level and at the middle school level. So um, we're, we're good and we want to see this go forward. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Director. Councilor Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. President. I just had a question for Director Whalen. What is going on currently with our recycled products right now? What are we doing with them? Where are they going? How many uh, and what kind of tonnage are we involved in? And um, are we actually sending it out to recycle at this point? Uh, <clears throat> Council President and Council Sanchez, yeah. Um, as I've spoken before, our contamination rate is calculated on an annual basis. It's done the same way it's done throughout the country. It's the same process for every city. Our current contamination rate is 35%, which means 35% of what we send to our processor is, is garbage, which means either people are putting garbage in their blue bin or they're contaminating what's in their blue bin, which means 65% of what we uh, take in is being recycled, which is about, um roughly 20,000 tons annually a little bit more maybe i can get you the exact number uh, i can i can email you that but um <clears throat> every year our biggest concern is getting our contamination rate down um we want less contaminants to go in those blue bins and that's why we've we've had our recycle right program we do our talking trash tuesdays we have our youtube channel but now with, uh, with this legislation, we'll move forward into another phase where we really want to start teaching people at a younger age how to do it correctly. Because we figure if we can teach, you know, elementary school kids how to recycle right, they're going to tell mom and dad that doesn't go in the blue bin. Uh, we did see a spike in our contamination rate over the last two years. Um, it went from 32 to 33, 32 to 33 to 35%. So it was only a 2% increase. But a lot of that was because people were home during the pandemic. Um, unfortunately, their black bin would get full and they would decide to put things in their blue bin. And um, we're hoping now that we're out of the pandemic and moving forward, people won't do that, but we will always continue our education efforts. One more question. Is the city actually recycling and or are we burying our uh, recyclables? We're recycling. Uh, I'm sorry, Councilor President and Councilor Sanchez. We're recycling. Like I said, we have what's called a contamination rate. So um, the way it works is we pick up everything in your blue bin and it gets taken to the processor. And then whatever's contaminated gets removed 
And then we are responsible for our contract to go pick that back up because they will only take what's recyclable and whatever is not recyclable, which would be considered refuse or trash needs to go to our landfill. So um, I always say it this way, uh, refuse or trash can never be recycled. It's just trash. Um, however, recyclables, if contaminated, become refuse. So that's why we try and get that contamination rate down just to make sure the right things go in that blue bin. Um, because when we take it to be processed, we're responsible for what is not recyclable. Thank you, Director Wheeler. Thank you, Mr. President. Councilor Bisson. Mr. President, uh, Councilor Pena, Director, how much is it going to cost to expand the program to have six full-time employees to provide the ongoing cleanup? Uh, Council President and uh, Council Basson, that would be roughly around $285,000 annually uh, to add six uh, full-time positions. And um, I know that it's currently, there's not a funding mechanism in this legislation, but I think we have uh, our upcoming council hearings when it comes to budget. And I think there are areas in the budget that we can work towards getting that funded. Mr. President. Thank you, Director. I can't wait to hear your ideas on where that money is going to come from because as budget chair, <laughs> I just needed to know that number so I could figure out how to make sure to support this. Thank you. All right. Any other discussion, Councilors? All right. This has uh, been moved and seconded. And uh, Councilor Pena to close. I your support. Thank you. All those in favor are 10. Say yes and raise your hand. Yes. yes. Opposed? And that passes unanimously. All right, we'll move on to item F. This is Councilor Feeblecorn and myself, R23, uh, adopting the 2022 Action Plan Program Investment Summary for the Expenditure Community Development Block Grant Home Investment Partnership Program and Emergency Solutions Grant Funds, providing an appropriation to the Department of Family and Community Services for 2022 U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development Entitlement Funds. I move a due pass. There's a motion and a second. Uh, this is a uh, basic uh, plan for the block grant. And uh, there's someone to speak, uh, signed up to speak. Thank you, Mr. President. Our first speaker is Tad Naminsky. Thank you. My name is Tad Naminsky. <clears throat> well, if you start, if you start uh, voting by a line, you never solve problem with homeless people. That's that, that simple as that. And uh, I don't say any, anything you can make a difference after tonight's meeting. You can pump it so many money, millions of money, for example, to this nonprofit. Are they in a profit? For example, now on the 4th Street, Remco, City Barter property for who? St. Martin. That become a big monopoly, money making for themselves, not much goes to homeless people. I've been dealing with this issue for the issue, listening, going to city council and so on for years. I know what's going on. And now I am security in the area staying on the properties. So I know what's going on from every day. <sighs> well, that's pretty, pretty much the <sighs> money. You, you just get every year, every year, you are awarding to this nonprofit, buying property, giving free property, giving money for construction. And what is support? Mo most of it, they just push it pencil. Uh, filing phony reports. Yes, couple, 
like for example, noon day, good shepherd, they doing a good job and they don't care for government money. That's time to wake up. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rosemary Blanchard. Yeah, I guess I am. I can't believe I'm still here. Uh, I am, I signed for this when I wasn't aware I would end up speaking three times, but that's okay. Because as I understand this, this resolution, it includes a plan to uh, approve the draft allocation plan that the city has developed for home investment partnership and the American Rescue Plan. And when I was clearer of eyes a day ago, I did read it over and actually a couple of days ago and made a comment at the, ten, at the tail end of the comment period. I hope we will use this as one of the many resources to deal with the people in our city, not just unhoused, but afraid every day they're going to be unhoused. We know that there were all these uh, rental, uh, there were all these, uh, these rules and ordinances, court cases that said that people could not be evicted in the heart of the pandemic. But that doesn't mean that they didn't sometimes have uh, have uh, the back rent still piling up. And there are people, as the prices are going up for rental property, for sale property, some of us who someday hope to sell a house see it and see a bonanza. People who are hanging on to living with their family, with their children in a home, see it and it scares the hell out of them. And so if we can use some of the... Uh, American Rescue Plan dollars for a whole range of home options for people. Temporary uh, home in uh, former motels, rooms in existing motels, uh, supported rent in, uh, in rental houses or apartments and other kinds of supported housing. The more families we have not only indoors, but securely indoors. So Thank their children you. don't- Your time is up, sorry. Okay. Thank you. Let's put families securely indoors. Their children need it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. That'll conclude public comment. All right. Thank you. Um, we have a, an amendment uh, from Councilor Lewis. Mr. President, floor amendment number one, it's in your, in your packets here. And it's, uh, it, just, it just strikes some language uh, related to the scope of this, related to Cibola Loop. It's a project, um, uh, it's been, been some, you know, several RFPs that have been put out, just been unsuccessful with it. Um, and and I, you know, I'd like to work with the department, talk to the department about working together, identify another, another um, um, property uh, for affordable housing project within my district or uh, utilize this, uh, this property for another usage that would apply for these funds and so, um, uh, you know, moving forward, I mean, that's ba basically what this does is just takes that takes the scope of the language of Cibola Loop out of this uh, out of this bill. So, uh, does this affect the administration's program or or anything that's going to affect uh, our standing with HUD? Uh, Mr. President uh, and members of the council, the property that uh, was purchased with HUD funds uh, several years ago, and if the project is uh, removed from the plan, uh, eventually we would have to pay or re reimburse the city back for the HUD funds that were utilized to purchase the property that were specifically desi designated for housing. So um, to take this out of the plan today um, is obviously a council policy decision. However, um, we would have to then at some point reimburse the fund the HUD fund back the, I believe it's 1.4 million uh, for, and then the property would become just generally city owned property. So there is a financial issue, but it is the council's policy to review these and and um, and that's where we are with this project right now. So this will require some budgetary action on our part. Right. And Mr. President, this, this, would, this would just go back to the HUD fund, it'd be available for another you know project that we would do within the district. Um, and, uh, you know, so 
again, and the the, the idea is to be able to you know work on a different uh, property. I'd also point out that part of the HUD requirements is that we start construction, you know, within a certain period of time for those dollars to be used specifically for this you know property, and it's been it's been far beyond the recommended uh, kind of allowable you know time because of the of, again the failed RFPs for a variety of reasons on it. So, um, anyways, just some explanation of it. Councilor Bassan. Mr. President. Uh, did, uh, did you move, it, move the amendment? I believe I did, but I'll get you. Okay. okay. Yeah. Good. Mr. President, so if we were to, if we were to approve this amendment and then you were going to work to find a different property to use the HUD funding on, is that allowable through HUD or is that something that we would not be able to utilize and have to repay um, due to whatever time frame. Does that make sense? Maybe, yeah, uh, Mr. Melinda's might be best to okay. answer that, Ms. President. So. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Abby Stiles has been doing a lot of work on this, so uh, we'll have her respond. Thank you, uh, Council President and Councilors. Um, if, if this amendment is passed, that amount of money does have to go back into the HUD funding but it is able to be used for another project, but the funding from this would have to be replaced with something that's not re related to this. Councillor Davis. Mr. President, um, before we do that, I'm conscious of that clock again, and I don't know if we have five votes to do this one more time, but I do believe we should suspend the rules to extend the meeting at least another 10 minutes until 1125 so we can get through this amendment and this bill and the one more beyond it. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to extend the, suspend the rules to extend the meeting to 1125. All those in favor say yes and raise your hands. Yes. yes. Opposed? Yes. <laughs> See, we're starting to lose votes. Seven to two, I believe. That's why I didn't do 1130. Mr. Right. Mr. President, on this matter, um, I just don't think it's quite, I, I think it's kind of late to be doing this. Um, I. Is my understanding from the write-up in the bill um, that the failure of the, the RFP was more related to um, some unsuccessful attempts to solicit proposals during the pandemic and during changes in the economy, um, but it doesn't say that no one responded. The last one was withdrawn by the city and could be reissued. Um, I just don't feel like we should be removing affordable housing projects. I think they should be spread across the city and all of our city council districts. Um, I'm not hearing anything from staff that allowing this other RFP to go forward if it were allowed to continue under the plan uh, would jeopardize us in any way, whereas this last minute amendment would do that and jeopardize some of our budget. So I would vote against it at this time and we could revise it later if that RFP fails. Councilor Lewis. Mr. President, the, um, so just to give a little more context to it, the, many of the communities all around have been, been opposing this for a variety of reasons, but I'd say the largest concentration of affordable housing in my district and subsidized housing is, is within the direct vicinity of this facility, of this, this property here. Um, the largest concentration of multi-housing in my district is right here. And so um, for a lot of reasons, uh, you know, I don't think it's the right place for it. Um, and I'm gonna, I, and I'll tell you this too, I've, I've never voted against any proposal of affordable housing in eight years previously. And I'm not, and I'm not opposing this either. I'd just like to work with the department on identifying that the department agreed that we would work together on finding a different location uh, to utilize these funds and uh, and you know for that same purpose, but uh, I definitely a, a desire to have it in a different area and an area you know maybe not far from this location, but another a location that would be more appropriate for my district there. Councillor Bassan. Mr. President, would it be possible to not move this, like n not pass this amendment and then still work with the department to find another property and then move the HUD funding over to that, that property once it's identified? Mr. President. Council. Mr. President and Councilor Bassan, the, uh, the plan is required to be approved by the council and submitted to HUD by early July. Um, so to your point, um, it would be possible to defer one time Till the next council meeting, if there is, if that's the wish of the council, but we we do have to approve the plan by the end of the month, so that it can be submitted to to HUD for approval. And Mr. President, Mr. Rael, can can that not be um, like if it if it gets approved and submitted, it's just set in stone forever, 
or it's something that can be eventually brought back to HUD and we can say, okay, well, we've actually identified a different property that suits the needs and then that changes or mm. it's just yeah. a one and done kind of thing and we move on with it. No, yeah. Mr. President and Councillor, um, this is uh, the 2022 plan, so it could stay in the plan if the project doesn't get done. Um, and I'll defer to my staff behind me. If I'm wrong, tell me. But I think that uh, it can be removed at any point in the process. We just have to amend the plan, but the plan is required to be submitted by July uh, moving forward. Mr. President, I think that would have kind of the opposite effect. I mean, I think doing this now would, would be able to, um, you know, be able to, uh, you know, you know move, move forward with being able to identify something pretty quickly and be able to um, help, help, help us to do that. So anyways, I urge your support for the amendment. All right, there's a motion and a second. Mr. Right. President, can we get a clarification as to the second? We failed to note it. Pardon me? Can we get a clarification as to who the seconder is on the amendment? We failed to note a second. Oh, is there a second? Favor say yes and raise your hand. Yes. See the hands again. Five. No. And that passes on a five to four vote. All right. We're on the last item. Uh, this is uh, Councillor Bassan, R20. Mr. President. Uh, I need to take a vote on the bill now. Sorry. Yeah, okay, so we're back on the bill as amended. All those in favor say yes and raise your hand. Yes. Opposed? And that uh, passes on a 7-2 to two vote. And uh, we'll move on to item R, item G, R26, Council Bassan. Mr. President, R26 is establishing the City of Albuquerque's Automated Speed Enforcement Fund to monitor the speed of travel and enforce the speed limit through speed enforcement systems, creating a new Automated Speed Enforcement Fund 289 in fiscal year 2023. I move it to pass. And there's a second from Councillor Grout. Um, any discussion? Councillor Davis. Ms. Mr. President, I was the only counselor to vote against the program. I appreciate our colleagues for making it better and, and offering in some things like um, alternatives like uh, volunteerism or community service, I guess, not volunteerism as alternatives. Um, but I still don't think we should be doing fines for police work um, for uh, civil enforcement. And so I'll vote against this only for that principle, uh, although I'm certain this will pass. Uh, counselor, uh, let's see, uh, we have some someone signed up to speak. Mr. President, yes, we have one speaker. Tad Naminsky. Thank you for the dirty look by President, El President. Well, let's, let me tell you what's going on in a big of my observation. When it comes to ATD, and I love it, very few on the street. How many accidents also on on the street? Well, we have a lot of people on alcohol, drugs, even to hear so much alcohol going on in the downtown area, and so on. Well, so that's his problem. But right now, oil, uh, anyway, <laughs> excuse me, uh, I'm mixing Polish language because I've been talking to my, my family in Poland. But anyway, <laughs> Well, so I really enjoy it. And I, I see a lot, like I say, you know, accident, alcohol, drug, marijuana, and so on. You have to look at it this way. <laughs> it reinforces this area. Thank you. Bill, and there's, uh, is there an amendment? Mr. President, yeah, there's an amendment that's in your iPads. It's, um, I'll just go ahead and read it. I guess amendment four, amendment number one. It says on page two, after line two, it added a new section four as follows. Section four, in addition to requirements of section three, the accounting division shall have the automated speed enforcement fund 289 audited at least twice annually as part of an agreed upon procedures audit. 
with an independent audit from approved, firm approved um, by the next Mexico State Auditor. I, I move amendment of form amendment number one, or move approval of form amendment number one. And there's a motion and a second from Councilor Jones. Uh, is there any discussion on the amendment? Councillor Beeblecorn. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm, I, I would just like some more information on why this audit would be necessary and also the costs of such an audit. Um, it, twice a year sounds expensive to me, but I would just like some more information. Mr. President, and um, yeah, I think uh, just the, the, the nature of this, uh, this specific um, program, you know, how the uh, um, you know, there's a lot of lot of promises that were made as far as the revenue that it'll bring about and how it's going to cover the costs and you know, what those costs go for and so um, I, I think some of the challenges with the you know the previous you know program was understanding that and getting ahead of it and then there were many issues with it um, but uh, before we could you know identify those issues and to be able to make some changes and be able to you know, put some accountability in there a whole year would go by uh, before that would happen. So this just adds some uh, accountability to that, really adds some extra reporting that comes back to the council so that we can, you know, give it the kind of, uh, you know, oversight that it needs. Mr. President, if I could follow up. Um, is, can anyone provide an estimate of cost? Uh, Mr. Meaney, is there a big comment on the, I guess, additional cost that this would, would be? Uh, council President, uh, Council Lewis, uh, it's been a while since I've been in the field of doing this, but the uh, last time something like this, uh, an agreed upon procedures, you're probably looking in the, a few few thousand dollars to get this because you're uh, just looking at one specific fund for a very specific set of criteria, uh, as opposed to the entire audit for the entire city, which typically costs about 500000 a year. So it would be a quote unquote a nominal fee, but um, it would be roughly around that. Thank you. That was helpful. All right, we're, uh, okay, uh, Mr. President, I would like to make an amendment to the amendment that says that this um, audit will happen twice annually as part of the, in the first year. And then we can revisit that after the fact based off of the results from the audits. All right, we're gonna have to uh, suspend the rules once more. Uh, so I'll move we suspend the rules until, oh, 11.35, the rate we're going. Uh, is there a second? Second for Councilor Bassan. All those in favor say yes and raise your hand. Yes. Opposed? And that passes unanimously, I think. All right, so uh, back on the bill. So there's a motion to amend the amendment uh, to put a, uh, to just have it for the first year, was that correct? Mr. President, yes, to say that there can be two, uh, two audits in the first year. So that's the amendment to the amendment. Is there a second? Second that. Uh, and uh, any discussion on the amendment to the amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor of the amendment to the amendment, say yes and raise your hand. Yes. Opposed? <laughs> and that passes on a, uh, I believe it was a five to three or six to four. Five to three. All right, and uh, we're back on the amendment as amended. And uh, <laughs> any further discussion uh, it, as amended? So uh, all those in favor of the amendment as amended, raise your hand, say yes, yes. Opposed? And that passes on a seven to two. All right, and then so we're back on the bill as amended. Mr. President, I just want to make sure to be clear for the public who may still be watching or who will watch later that this fund is being established because it needs to have a line item in the budget where we can identify all of the money that is coming in not to profit for police or to frankly just screw over the citizens and residents in Albuquerque. This is so that we can keep track of our pennies and dollars which should make this audit, these two audits much easier as we go forward. So I urge your support. All right, and there's uh, uh, that's your close, and those we're back on the bill as amended. All those in favor say yes and raise your hand. Yes. Opposed? And that passes unanimously. And seeing no further business, this city council meeting is adjourned.